Dogmatic Theology, Soteriology, by William G. T. Shedd. Christ's Mediatorial Offices Soteriology, Soterias Logos, treats of the work of the God-man and its application to individuals by the Holy Spirit. When we pass from the complex constitution of Christ's person to the work which he wrought for man's redemption, we find him represented in Scripture as a mediator. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2.5. In this passage the term man denotes the entire theanthropic person, Jesus Christ, not the human nature. The human nature is not the mediator. Man here designates the God-man under a human title, and is like the title Son of Man or Last Adam, 1 Corinthians 15.45, or Second Man, 1 Corinthians 15.47. Again, the God-man is described in Scripture as being appointed and consecrated to the work of human redemption by God the Father, as the representative of the Trinity. Hence the incarnate word is also denominated the Messiah, the Anointed One, Daniel 9.25, Psalm 2.2, 2, Psalm 45.7. Generally speaking, Messiah is the Old Testament term for the Redeemer, and Mediator is the New Testament term. The word Christ, which translates Messiah, is generally a proper name in the New Testament, not an official title. Sometimes, however, the God-man is denominated Jesus the Christ, or that Christ. Matthew 16.20, Luke 9.20, John 1.25, 6.29. The Christian Church prefers the New Testament designation of Mediator to the Old Testament designation of Messiah. The Westminster Larger Catechism, question 36, denominates Christ the only Mediator of the Covenant of Grace. There are several characteristics of Christ as the mediator that must be carefully noted, in order to avoid misconception. 1. The mediator between God and man cannot be God only or man only. This is taught in Galatians 3.20. A mediator is not of one, but God is one. A mediator supposes two parties between whom he intervenes, but God is only one party. Consequently, the mediator between God and man must be related to both, and the equal of either. He cannot be simply God, who is only one of the parties, and has only one nature. Therefore the eternal word must take man's nature into union with himself, if he would be a mediator between God and man. As a Trinitarian person merely, he is not qualified to mediate between them. The same truth is taught in 1 Samuel 2.25. For if one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? And in Job 9.33, there is not any day's man betwixt us to lay his hand upon us both. And in Hebrews 10.5, Therefore, when he, the mediator, cometh into the world, he saith, A body thou hast prepared for me. 2. Secondly, the office of a mediator between God and man is one of condescension and humiliation. A. Because it involves the assumption of a human nature by a divine person. This is taught in Philippians 2, 5 and 8. Let this lowly mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant. To unite the finite with the infinite is to humble the infinite. Incarnate deity is a step down from unincarnate deity. The latter is wholly unconditioned, the former is conditioned by the inferior nature which it has assumed. B. Because to be a mediator between God and man implies a condition of dependence. When the second person in the Trinity agrees to take the place of a mediator between the Trinity and rebellious man, he agrees to be commissioned and sent upon a lowly errand. He consents to take a secondary place. A king who volunteers to become an ambassador to his own subjects condescends and humbles himself. The office of a commissioner, sent to offer terms to rebels, is inferior to that of the king. This is taught in many passages of Scripture, Matthew 11.27, All things are given me of my Father, Matthew 28.18, All power is given to me in heaven and in earth, John 17.2, Thou hast given unto him power over all flesh, Colossians 1.19, It pleased the Father that in him all fullness should dwell, Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants, Philippians 2.8, He became obedient unto death, Galatians 4.4, 4, the Son of God was made under the law. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things. This class of texts is cited by Sosinus to disprove the doctrine of Christ's original deity, but it has reference to Christ in his capacity and office of mediator, which is an assumed, not an original office.
These texts do not describe the Logos prior to his incarnation, but subsequent to it. When Christ speaks of his pre-existent and eternal place in the Trinity, he does not employ such phraseology. He says, I and my Father are one, John 10.30. Glorify thou me with the glory which I had with thee before the world was, John 17.5. Before Abraham was, I am, John 8.58. My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. John 5.17 The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Luke 6.5 I am the resurrection and the life. John 11.25 I am the living bread which came down from heaven. John 6.51 Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. John 6.54 But when Christ refers to his incarnate and mediatorial position, he says, My Father is greater than I. John 14.28 Say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God, John 10.36. I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me, John 6.38. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do, John 17.4. Then shall the Son be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all, 1 Corinthians 15.28. Accordingly, the Westminster Confession, 8.3, speaking of Christ's office of mediator, says that this office he took not unto himself, but was thereunto called by his Father, who put all power and judgment into his hand, and gave him commandment to execute the same. c. Because the office of mediator is temporary. It begins to be exercised in time, and a time will come when it will cease to be exercised. This is taught in 1 Corinthians 15, 24 and 28. Then cometh the end of the economy of redemption, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that did put all things under him, that the triune God may be all in all. As there was once a time when there was no mediatorial work of salvation going on, so there will be a time when there will be none. The Logos was not actually and historically a mediator until he assumed human nature. It is true that in the Old Testament church the second Trinitarian person discharged the office of a mediator by anticipation, and men were saved by his mediatorial work, but it was in view of his future advent and future performance of that work. Types and symbols stood in the place of the incarnate word. Not, however, until the miraculous conception was there actually a God-man, and not until then was there an actual historical mediator. And although there will now always be a God-man, yet there will not always be a mediatorial work going on. The God-man will one day cease to redeem sinners. St. Paul is explicit in saying that a day will come when Christ will deliver up and return his mediatorial commission to the Father, from whom, as the representative of the Trinity, he received it. There will then remain no more available sacrifice for sin, Hebrews 10.26, and there will be no longer an access to a holy God for sinful men through Christ's blood. Hence it is said, Now is the accepted time, and now is the day of salvation. Today, if ye will hear his voice, hearten not your hearts. He limiteth a certain day, saying, Today, if ye will hear his voice, Hebrews 3.13, 15, 18, 4, 1, 7. But a function that begins in time and ends in time when discharged by a divine person is evidently one of condescension and secondary nature. The second person of the Trinity as a creator holds no position of condescension and humiliation and performs no function that is secondary and temporary in its nature. He is a creator by reason of his absolute and eternal deity, and is so from everlasting to everlasting. There never was a time when he was not a creator, and there never will be a time when he will cease to be a creator. He never was commissioned to the office of creator. He never assumed this office, and he will never lay it down. It belongs to him by virtue of his divinity. Creation is a primary, not a secondary function. But the second person as mediator assumes an office and takes a position which is not necessarily implied in his deity. He might be God the Son without being God the mediator, but he could not be God the Son without being God the creator d because the office of mediator is one of reward the condescension and humiliation of the logos in assuming a finite nature and executing a commission is to be recompensed it is a self-sacrifice that merits a return from the person who commissioned and sent the mediator upon this service this is taught in philippians two five to eleven christ jesus took upon him the form of a servant wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth, 
and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is not a reward for that which the Logos was and did as unincarnate, and as the second person of the Trinity, but of what he was and did as the incarnate Logos, and as the commissioned mediator between God and man. A divine person as such cannot be either exalted or rewarded. This phraseology of St. Paul refers not to the eternal and pre-existent state and position of Jesus Christ, but to his post-existent state and condition. It does not relate to the form of God which he had originally and from all eternity, but to the form of a servant which he assumed in time, and which he retains forever. The same truth is taught in Hebrews 2.9. We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, i.e. was made a man, verse 7, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honour. And in Revelation 3.21, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father on his throne e. because the Son of God enters into a covenant with the Father to take a mediatorial office and position, but if he were originally in a subordinate position he could not covenant or agree to become subordinate. Jesus Christ is represented in Scripture as the mediator of a covenant, Hebrews 12.24, Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, Hebrews 8.6, he is the mediator of a better covenant, Malachi 3.1, the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, Luke 22.20, this cup is the new covenant, the atheke, in my blood. Compare Matthew 14.24, 26.28. Accordingly, the symbols so represent him. The only mediator of the covenant of grace is the Lord Jesus Christ. Westminster Larger Catechism 36. A difference in the scripture representations has given rise to a distinction between the covenant of grace and the covenant of redemption. The covenant of grace is made between the Father and the elect. This is taught in those passages which speak of Christ as the mediator of the covenant. Hebrews 9.15, for this cause he is the mediator of the new covenant. Hebrews 8.6, he is the mediator of a better covenant. This implies that the promises of the covenant are made by God the Father to his people, and that Christ stands between the two parties. The same is taught in Galatians 3.16, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, as of many seeds, but as to one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. The contracting parties here are the father and the elect seed. This also has its type in the Sinaitic theocratic covenant between Jehovah and the Hebrews as a chosen nation, of which national covenant Moses was the mediator. Galatians 3.19, the law was ordained by angels in the hands of a mediator. The following passages mention the covenant of God the Father with the elect church. Isaiah 43, 1-6 Fear not, O Israel, for I have redeemed thee. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. Isaiah 59, 21 This is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and for ever. The covenant of redemption is made between the Father and the Son. The contracting parties here are the first and second persons of the Trinity, the first of whom promises a kingdom, a glory, and a reward, upon condition that the second performs a work of atonement and redemption. The following are passages in which it is spoken of. Isaiah 42, 1-6 Behold my servant whom I uphold. He shall not cry nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. I, the Lord, have called thee, and will hold thy hand, and will keep thee, and will give thee for a light of the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes. Luke 22.29 I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father hath appointed unto me. Isaiah 53.10-12 When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. Isaiah 49.6 I will give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. Psalm 89.34-36 My covenant will I not break. Once have I sworn that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure for ever. Psalm 2.8 Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Though this distinction is favoured by the scripture statements, it does not follow that there are two separate and independent covenants antithetic to the covenant of works. The covenant of grace and that of redemption are two modes or phases of the one evangelical covenant of mercy. The distinction is only a secondary or sub-distinction. For when, as in Isaiah 43, 1-6, the elect are spoken of as the party with whom God the Father makes a covenant, they are viewed as in Christ and one with him. The covenant is not made with them as alone and apart from Christ. 
this is taught in galatians three sixteen to abraham and his seed were the promises made but this seed is christ the elect are here as also in one corinthians twelve twelve called christ because of the union between christ and the elect and in like manner when christ as in isaiah forty two one to six is spoken of as the party with whom the father covenants the elect are to be viewed as in him as united and one with him his atoning suffering is looked upon as their atoning suffering galatians two twenty i am crucified with christ his resurrection involves their resurrection romans six five grown together in the likeness of his resurrection his exaltation brings their exaltation matthew nineteen twenty eight ye shall sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of israel one corinthians six three we shall judge angels the covenant of redemption is not made with christ in isolation and apart from his people it is with the head and the members ephesians one twenty two and twenty three he gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all the following statements then comprises the facts there are only two general covenants the legal and the evangelical these are the two covenants the one from mount sinai which gendereth to bondage galatians four twenty four the first in order is the legal covenant of works it is founded upon the attribute of justice its promise is do this and thou shalt live this covenant failed upon the part of man in the fall of adam the second is the evangelical covenant founded upon the attribute of mercy its promise is twofold a to the mediator make thy soul an offering for sin and i will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession isaiah fifty three ten psalm two eight b to the elect fear not for i have redeemed thee i have called thee by thy name thou art mine when thou passest through the waters i will be with thee and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee isaiah forty three one and two believe on the lord jesus christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house acts sixteen thirty one the evangelical covenant as opposite to the legal covenant may therefore be called the covenant of redemption when christ and his officers are the principal thing in view and the covenant of grace when the elect and their faith and obedience are the principal thing under consideration respecting the validity of the distinction there is some difference of opinion though the weight of authority is in favour of it turretin adopts it also witsius covenants two two one and hodge theology two three hundred and fifty eight fisher on the catechism asserts that the westminster standards make no distinction between a covenant of redemption and a covenant of grace the phrase covenant of redemption is not found in them in the larger catechism question thirty one it is said that the covenant of grace was made with christ and in him with all the elect this would be the covenant of redemption in the westminster confession seven three it is stated that the lord was pleased to make a second covenant commonly called the covenant of grace wherein he freely offereth unto sinners life and salvation by jesus christ requiring of them faith in him that they may be saved and promising to give unto all those that are ordained unto life his holy spirit to make them willing and able to believe here the covenant is made with the elect the phraseology in the twentieth question of the shorter catechism is somewhat ambiguous god having elected some to everlasting life did enter into a covenant of grace to deliver them out of the estate of sin and misery and to bring them into an estate of salvation by a redeemer whether the covenant mentioned is made with the elect or with the mediator is not to be indisputably determined from the wording of the statement the evangelical covenant as the opposite of the legal covenant is essentially one and the same under the old dispensation and the new the difference is only in the mode of administration in the old dispensation comprising the patriarchal and jewish churches it was administered through animal sacrifices and visible types and symbols in the new dispensation by the advent and sacrifice of christ the old administration was ceremonial and national the new is spiritual and universal this difference is mentioned in two corinthians three fourteen moses put a veil of types and ceremonies over his face that the children of israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished but their minds were blinded for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the old testament which veil is taken away in christ in hebrews eight six to thirteen the first covenant is the covenant of grace made with their fathers when god took them by the hand to lead them out of egypt administered by types and symbols and the second covenant is the covenant of grace under the administration of christ personally who is the mediator of a better covenant hebrews nine fifteen speaks of the new covenant in distinction from the first covenant which had ordinances of divine service and an earthly sanctuary and of the redemption of transgressions under the first covenant this shows that the first covenant was a gracious one 
Christ, the God-man, as the mediator of the evangelical covenant, discharges three offices, those of prophet, priest, and king. Our mediator was called Christ because he was anointed with the Holy Ghost above measure, and so set apart and fully furnished with all authority and ability to execute the offices of prophet, priest, and king of his church, in the estate both of his humiliation and exaltation. Westminster Larger Catechism 42. His prophetical office is taught in Deuteronomy 18.15, 18, Acts 3.22, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of these, of thy brethren, like unto me. Isaiah 16.1, Luke 4.18, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings. His priestly office is taught in Psalm 110.4, Hebrews 5.5 5 and 6, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 4:14 4, and 15, we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. His kingly office is taught in Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, he shall be called the Prince of Peace. Psalm 2, 6, I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. These offices were each and all of them executed by the mediator before as well as after his advent. Westminster Confession 7, 5, 8, 6, this is proved by Revelation 13.8, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman shall bruise the serpent's head. Romans 3.25, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. Hebrews 9.15, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Galatians 3.8.14.16-18, compared with Genesis 17, 7, 22, 18, Acts 15, 11. We believe that through the grace of Christ we shall be saved, even as they, the fathers. Acts 10, 43, To him give all the prophets witness, that through his name, whosoever believeth in him, shall receive remission of sins. Hebrews 10, 1 to 10, For the law, Jewish dispensation, having a shadow of good things to come. Colossians 2, 17, The Jewish ordinances are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Isaiah 53, Isaiah 42, 6, I, the Lord, have called thee, and will give thee for a light of the Gentiles. Hebrews 4, 2, unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. Faith in the mediator was the unmeritorious but indispensable condition of salvation, before the advent as well as after it. The just, i.e. the justified, shall live by faith. Habakkuk 2, 4. This is quoted by St. Paul in Romans 1, 17. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Psalm 2, 12. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Romans 4.3 David saith, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Romans 4.8 These all died in faith. Hebrews 11.13 Enoch pleased God by his faith. Hebrews 11.5 The Old Testament is not contrary to the New, for both in the Old and New Testament everlasting life is offered to mankind by Christ, who is the only mediator between God and man. 39 Articles, Article 7 says Calvin on Galatians 4, 1-7, we learn from this passage that the fathers under the Old Testament had the same hope of the inheritance which we have at the present day, because they were partakers of the same adoption. Notwithstanding their outward servitude, their consciences were still free. Though bearing the yoke of the ceremonial law upon their shoulders, they nevertheless with a free spirit worshipped God. More particularly, having been instructed concerning the free pardon of sin, their consciences were delivered from the tyranny of sin and death. They held the same doctrine, were joined with us in the true unity of faith, placed reliance on one mediator, called on God as their father, and were led by the same spirit. Hence it appears that the difference between us and these ancient fathers lies not in substance, but in accidents or circumstantials. The Old Testament believer had both the penitent consciousness of sin and of the remission of sin. The account of the religious experience of Abraham, Moses, David, and Isaiah discloses a contrite spirit before the absolute holiness of God. The Old Testament saint cast himself upon the divine mercy. Psalm 32, 1-11, Psalm 51, Psalm 103, 2 and 3. And this mercy he expected through the promised seed of the woman, the Messiah, and through an atonement typified by the Levitical sacrifices. The forgiveness of sin was both promised and received under the old dispensation. The prophetical office of Christ is thus described in the Westminster Larger Catechism, question 43. Christ executeth the office of a prophet in revealing to the church in all ages by his spirit and word the whole will of God in all things concerning edification and salvation. 
the prophetical function of christ is not confined to the prediction of future events the idea is wider than that of mere vaticination though it includes this christ as that prophet that should come into the world john six fourteen john one twenty one luke twenty four nineteen is the source and teacher of truth and particularly of that truth which relates to human redemption this is implied in the names that are given to him in scripture he is called the counsellor isaiah nine six the witness isaiah fifty five four the interpreter job thirty three twenty three the apostle hebrews three one the word john one one the truth john fourteen six and wisdom proverbs eight in the logos doctrine of st john all the previous statements respecting the prophetical or teaching function of the mediator are summed up and more fully unfolded he is the light of men john one four the light of the world john nine five the true light which coming into the world lighteth every man john one nine the light to lighten the gentiles luke two thirty two isaiah sixty three the word dwelling among us full of truth john one fourteen the christ in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge colossians two three hence the voice from heaven to mankind this is my beloved son hear ye him matthew seventeen five the great characteristic of christ as a prophet is his consciousness of infallibility he spake as one having authority and not as the scribes mark one twenty two but i say unto you matthew five thirty four merely human prophets like isaiah chapter six are abashed in the presence of deity when receiving communications from him christ never shows the least trace of such a feeling no man knows the father but the son and no one knows the son but the father matthew eleven twenty seven this implies co-equality with the father in the knowledge of the mystery of the trinity christ speaks out of the fullness of his own immediate intuition he never says the word of the lord came unto me from the omniscience of his own divine nature he draws all his teachings as a prophet in him dwelleth all the fullness of the godhead bodily colossians two nine he is the source to others of prophetical knowledge he opened the understanding of his disciples that they might understand the scriptures luke twenty four forty five the old testament prophets prophesied of the grace that should come searching what or what manner of time the spirit of christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of christ and the glory that should follow 1 peter 1 10 and 11 1 christ executes the office of prophet personally and directly this he did a in all the theophanies of the old testament the appearances of jehovah to individuals before the flood to the patriarchs and moses after the flood to the prophets of israel and judah were a discharge of the prophetical function of the mediator these were all harbingers and adumbrations of his incarnation b in his incarnation itself this was as direct and personal teaching as is possible the second person of the trinity when incarnate upon earth spoke as never man spake and spoke face to face to man and his teaching was not confined to his words though most of his instruction was so conveyed the works of christ as well as his words and especially his miraculous works taught man if i do not the works of my father believe me not but if i do though ye believe me not believe the works john ten thirty seven and thirty eight his disciples describe him as a prophet mighty in deed and word before the people luke twenty four nineteen this prophetical office continues to be discharged personally by the incarnate word in his state of exaltation in the description of the heavenly world the lamb is said to be the light thereof revelation twenty one twenty three two christ executes the office of a prophet mediately a through the holy spirit all the truth that was conveyed previous to the advent through the inspired prophets of the old testament and subsequent to it through the apostles of the new testament comes to man in the discharge of the prophetical function of the mediator hence it is said one peter one ten to twelve that it was the spirit of christ that was in the prophets who prophesied of the grace that should come and who testified beforehand the sufferings of christ by this same holy spirit christ preached unto those that were disobedient in the days of noah and who are now and for evermore in prison for their disobedience 1 Peter 3, 19 and 20. See Eschatology, page 609. Christ as prophet is thus the source of all revelation, unwritten and written. The truths of natural religion come to man through him. He is the light of men in the sense that what may be known of God is an unwritten and internal revelation to them. Romans 1, 19. And he is the light of the world in the sense that all that higher and more perfect knowledge respecting God and human salvation, which constitutes the written word, has him for its author the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. John 1.18 b. Through the instrumentality of the Christian ministry and church. Christ, in the first place, commissioned his apostles as inspired agents both to teach and to preach the gospel. 
Their writings are the infallible documents by which the church is to be instructed and guided. Matthew twenty eight, nineteen and twenty. Go ye and teach all nations. John sixteen, thirteen and fourteen. The Spirit of truth will guide you into all truth, for he shall receive of mine and show it unto you. Again, secondly, Christ provided for successors to the apostles considered as preachers and ministers of the word, and through this ministry he instrumentally executes his prophetical office. The supernatural gifts of inspiration and miracles which the apostles possessed were not continued to their ministerial successors because they were no longer necessary. All the doctrines of Christianity had been revealed to the apostles and had been delivered to the church in a written form. There was no further need of an infallible inspiration, and the credentials and authority given to the first preachers of Christianity in miraculous acts did not need continual repetition from age to age. One age of miracles well authenticated is sufficient to establish the divine origin of the gospel. In a human court, an indefinite series of witnesses is not required. By the mouth of two or three witnesses the facts are established. The case once decided is not reopened. With the exception, therefore, of the two supernatural gifts of inspiration and miracles, the ministry who took up the work of preaching the word had the same preparation for the work that the apostles had. They were, like them, regenerated, sanctified, and enlightened by the Holy Spirit. This is taught in Ephesians four, eleven, and 12. Having ascended far above all heavens, and being seated upon the mediatorial throne, the mediator gave some to be apostles, and some to be prophets, and some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Accordingly, the preaching of the gospel by his ministers is called Christ's preaching. Acts 13.12 then the deputy, Sergius Paulus, when he saw what was done to Elymas the sorcerer, believed, being astonished at the doctrine, teaching of the Lord through Paul. In 1 Corinthians 1, six and Revelation 1.2, the preaching of the gospel is denominated the testimony of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5.20, Paul represents himself and his co-laborers as ambassadors for Christ and beseeches men in Christ's stead to be reconciled to God. In 1 Peter 3.19 and Ephesians 2.17, the preaching of Noah and the apostles is called Christ's preaching. Again, the mass of the church, as well as the Christian ministry, are represented as an agency by which the mediator executes his prophetical office. After the death of Stephen, all the church, excepting the apostles, were scattered by persecution and went everywhere preaching the word, Acts 8.4. The church is represented as a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, to show forth the praises of him who hath called it out of darkness into his marvellous light, 1 Peter 2.9. The Holy Spirit, dwelling in the church, in all the fullness of his graces and gifts, enriches it with wisdom and knowledge, so that it is capable, both by word and example, of proclaiming Christ crucified to the sinful world of which it is said to be the light, Matthew 5.14-16. The superiority of the church to the secular world in regard to the comprehension of religious truth and of everything relating to the eternal destiny of mankind is boldly and strongly asserted by St. Paul. We speak wisdom among them that are perfect, saints enlightened, even the hidden wisdom of God, which none of the princes of the world knew. The natural man cannot know the things of the Spirit of God because they are spiritually discerned. He that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. 1 Corinthians 2, 6-15. The Christian mind is qualified to be a critic of secular knowledge, but the secular mind is not qualified to be a critic of Christianity. Christ crucified is foolishness to the Greek, yet this foolishness of God is wiser than men. 1 Corinthians 1, 23-25. The priestly office of Christ is thus defined in the Westminster Larger Catechism, question 44. Christ executeth the office of a priest in his once offering himself a sacrifice without spot to God to be a reconciliation for the sins of his people and in making continual intercession for them. The function of a priest is described in Hebrews 5.1. Every high priest is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. The priest is a mediator in religion as an ambassador is one in politics he is appointed to officiate between God and man in religious matters, and since the fact of sin is a cardinal fact in the case of man, the function of a mediating priest for man must be mainly expiatory and reconciling. Since every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, it is of necessity that Jesus Christ have somewhat to offer. Hebrews 8.3 Accordingly, we find the expiatory priest in existence long before the Mosaic Institute. Noah, at the cessation of the deluge, nearly a thousand years before the exodus of the Israelites, officiated as the priest of his household. 
noah builded an altar unto the lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar and jehovah smelled a sweet savour genesis eight twenty this implies that the system of sacrifices was then in existence there was an altar and a victim the distinction between clean and unclean beasts and birds was made a distinction which has its principal significance in reference to a piacular offering not any and everything may be offered as an atonement but only that which is specified still more than this there is evidence in the first chapters of genesis that atoning sacrifices and an officiating priest to offer them were instituted immediately after the apostasy in connection with the promise of a mediator it was a common jewish opinion that adam was the first human priest the correctness of this opinion is favored by the following considerations the permission to eat vegetable food is given to adam in genesis one twenty nine but nothing is said of animal food the permission to eat both vegetable and animal food is given to noah in genesis nine three yet animals were slain by adam for the lord god made coats of skins and clothed both adam and eve genesis three twenty one it is a natural explanation of this fact to suppose that animals had been killed and offered in sacrifice by adam for even if it be assumed that animal food was permitted to adam the narrative respecting the coats of skins implies that more animals were slain than would be required for the food of adam and eve again in genesis four three and four both cain and abel are represented as offering sacrifices the former the bloodless eucharistic offering of the fruit of the ground the latter the bloody expiatory offering of the firstlings of the flock they are described as bringing their offering genesis four three and four and to a locality which is described as the face of the lord and the presence of the lord genesis four fourteen and sixteen this looked like a sacred place appointed for the offering of sacrifice and a sacred person to officiate namely adam the head and priest of his family as noah was of his the words of god to cain genesis four seven teach that a piacular offering for sin had been appointed if thou doest not well sin a sin offering lieth at the door subsequently the lamb or goat was to be brought to the door of the tabernacle Again, the prohibition in Genesis 9, 4, and 16 to eat blood given to Noah is the same that is afterwards given to the Israelites in Leviticus 17, 10, and 12. And the reason assigned when the command is laid upon the Israelites is that the blood is the life of the flesh and is to be poured upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. From this it follows with great probability that the statute as given to Moses was only a reenactment of the statute as given to Noah, and given for the same reason, namely that the blood of animals must be used only for piacular purposes. Even under the Levitical law the use of animal food was considerably restricted. The blood and fat were interdicted in all cases. The sin offering and trespass offering were to be eaten only by the priests, and the more solemn sin offerings could not be eaten even by them. The burnt offerings, the most numerous of all, were wholly consumed. Similar proofs of the institution of an expiatory sacrifice and an officiating priest are found in the history of Abraham and the other patriarchs. On first entering Canaan, Abram built an altar and called upon the name of the Lord, Genesis 12, 7 and 8. When he returned from his victory over the kings, he is congratulated and blessed by Melchizedek, the Canaanite king of Salem, who is called the priest of the Most High God. Genesis fourteen eighteen and 19. Isaac builds an altar, Genesis twenty six twenty five. Jacob offers sacrifice, Genesis thirty one fifty four. The indications of a priest and a sacrifice are plain in the book of Job. It was the continual custom of this patriarch, who probably lived between the deluge and Abraham, as the head of his family, to offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all, Job 1, 5. The Septuagint rendering of Job twelve nineteen is, He leadeth priests authorized version princes away spoiled in job thirty three twenty three and twenty four the idea of one who furnishes a ransom is presented the rite of sacrifice under the old testament taught that god is both just and merciful just in that his law requires death for sin merciful in that he permits and provides a vicarious death for sin in this way it deepened fear and inspired hope fear of the divine holiness and hope in the divine mercy the priestly office of the mediator, unlike his prophetical, is not administered mediately but directly. The priests of the old dispensation, both patriarchal and mosaic, were types of Christ, not his agents or delegates. The human priests were many because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. 
but the divine high priest is one and alone because he continueth ever and hath an unchangeable priesthood hebrews seven twenty three and twenty four and because he constantly discharges his priestly office he does not delegate it to others this unique and solitary character of christ's priesthood is taught in the comparison of him to melchizedek in hebrews seven the king of salem was the only one of his class he was without father without mother without descent having neither beginning of days nor end of life that is he was not one of a line of priests having predecessors and successors in this respect he was like the son of god who was also alone and solitary in his priesthood the romish theory of an ecclesiastical priesthood acting since christ's ascension as the delegates and agents of the great high priest has no support in scripture had christ intended to discharge his sacerdotal office through a class of persons in his church he would have appointed and commissioned such a class and provided for its continuation he did this in regard to his prophetical office he appointed apostles prophets evangelists pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints and the work of the ministry ephesians four eleven and twelve but he did not appoint any to be priests to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins hebrews five one on the contrary he abolished the earthly priesthood when he formally assumed his own priestly office the substance having appeared the shadow disappeared the antitype makes the type useless hebrews nine twenty three to twenty six the earthly sacrifice was done away and the earthly priest with it the two parts of christ's priestly work are a atonement hebrews nine fourteen and twenty eight how much more shall the blood of christ purge your conscience christ was once offered to bear the sins of many john one twenty nine the lamb of god which taketh away the sin of the world hebrews two seventeen a merciful and faithful high priest to make reconciliation for the sins of the people matthew twenty twenty eight a ransom for many luke twenty two twenty my blood is shed for you two corinthians five twenty one he made him to be sin for us galatians three thirteen christ was made a curse for us 1 Peter 3.18, Christ suffered for our sins, the just for the unjust. 1 John 2.2, 2, he is the propitiation for our sins. Isaiah 53.10, he made his soul an offering for sin. Romans 8.32, he spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us. Romans 5.11, by him we have received the atonement. Romans 5.6 and 7, Christ died for us, scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Ephesians 5.2, Christ hath loved us, and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. b. Intercession. 1 John 2, 1. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Hebrews 7, 25. Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. John 17, 9 and 20. I pray for them which thou hast given me. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. The intercession of Christ is intimately connected with his atoning work. The Westminster Confession, after saying that Christ effectually applies and communicates redemption to those for whom he has purchased it, adds that he makes intercession for them. Compare Larger Catechism, question 44. This is in accordance with the Scriptures. The Apostle John, 1 John 2, 1 and 2, asserts that if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, and adduces as the ground of his success as an advocate two facts, that he is Jesus Christ the righteous, and is the propitiation for our sins. The Apostle Paul, in Romans eight thirty four states that Christ is at the right hand of God making intercession for us, and mentions as the reason why he is fitted for this work the fact that he died and is risen again in hebrews four fourteen to sixteen believers are encouraged to come boldly unto the throne of grace because they have a great high priest who is passed into the heavens and is touched with the feeling of their infirmities again in hebrews seven twenty four and twenty five christians are assured that because christ has an unchangeable priesthood he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto god by him seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them in hebrews nine seven to twelve the writer reminds the reader that the jewish high priest went alone once every year into the second tabernacle not without blood which he offered for himself and the errors of the people and then states that christ a high priest of good things to come by his own blood entered in once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us still further proof of the close connection of christ's intercessory work with his atoning work is found in that class of texts which represent the gracious influence of the holy spirit as being procured by christ's intercession 
these teach that the plenary effusion of the holy ghost which is the characteristic of the christian economy is owing to the return of the mediator to the father and his session upon the mediatorial throne matthew three eleven i indeed baptize with water he shall baptize you with the holy ghost john seven thirty nine jesus spake this of the spirit which they that believe on him should receive for the holy ghost was not yet given because that jesus was not yet glorified john sixteen seven it is expedient for you that i go away but if i go not away the comforter will not come unto you but if i depart i will send him unto you in john fourteen sixteen to twenty six fifteen twenty six Christ assures his disciples that after he has left them and returned to the Father, where he was before, he will pray the Father, and he will give them another comforter, that he may abide with them, even the Spirit of truth, and furthermore, that he will himself send the comforter unto them from the Father. In accordance with these statements of Christ, we find Peter referring the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost to the mediatorial agency and intercession of Christ. Acts 2.33, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the gift of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. And the whole book of Acts contains frequent allusions and references to the person and work of the Holy Spirit, in a manner and to a degree which are not seen in the four Gospels, showing that immediately after the ascension of Christ, a more powerful agency and influence of the third Trinitarian person began to be experienced in the Church this descent and gift of gracious operation and influence was directly connected with christ's presence and intercession in heaven and this intercession rested for its ground and reason of success upon that atoning work which he had performed upon earth the same connection between christ's atonement and christ's intercession is noticed in the epistles christ was made a curse for us that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith galatians three thirteen and fourteen the holy spirit is shed on us abundantly through jesus christ our saviour titus three five and six when christ ascended up on high he received gifts for men ephesians four eight the intercession of christ relates a to the application of his own atonement to the individual b to the bestowment of the holy spirit as enlightening and sanctifying the believer compare smith theology four hundred eighty one to four hundred ninety vicarious atonement part one the atonement of Christ is represented in Scripture as vicarious. The satisfaction of justice intended and accomplished by it is for others, not for himself. This is abundantly taught in Scripture. Matthew 20:28. 20, the Son of Man came to give his life a ransom for and the many. Matthew 10:45. This is my body which is given for and the you. In these two passages, the preposition and the indisputably denotes substitution passages like matthew two twenty two archelaus reigned in the room and the of his father herod matthew five thirty eight an eye for an eye luke eleven eleven will he for a fish give him a serpent prove this in the majority of the passages however which speak of christ's sufferings and death the preposition uper is employed Luke twenty two nineteen and 20. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for uper you. John six fifty one. The bread that I will give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. John fifteen thirteen. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Romans five six to eight. Christ died for the ungodly, while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Romans 8.32, he delivered him up for us all. 2 Corinthians 5.14 and 15, if one died for all, then all died. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him to be sin for us. Galatians 3.13, being made a curse for us. Ephesians 5.2 and 25, Christ gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, the man Christ Jesus gave himself a ransom for all. Hebrews 2, 9, Christ tasted death for every man. 1 Peter 3, 18, Christ suffered the just for the unjust. The preposition uper, like the English preposition for, has two significations. It may denote advantage or benefit, or it may mean substitution. The mother dies for her child, and Pythias dies for Damon. The sense of for, in these two propositions, must be determined by the context and the different circumstances in each instance. 
Christ, John 15.13, lays down the proposition, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for, uper, his friends. The preposition uper here may mean either for the benefit of, or instead of. In either case, the laying down of life would be the highest proof of affection. The idea of substitution, therefore, cannot be excluded by the mere fact that the preposition uper is employed, because it has two meanings. In 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21, uper is indisputably put for anti. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, uper Christo, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, uper emon. In Philemon 13, uper is clearly equivalent to anti. Whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead, uper su, he might have ministered unto me. In 2 Corinthians 5.14 it is said that the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, uper panton, then all died, pantes apethanon. Here the notion of substitution is plain. If Christ died in the room and place of the all, then the all are reckoned to have died. The vicarious atonement of Christ is regarded as the personal atonement of the believer. It would be nonsense to say that if one died for the benefit of all, then all died. There is also abundant proof from classical usage that uper may be used in the sense of anti. Magi quotes the following. Xenophon relates that the Thracian prince Suthus asked Apisthenes if he would be willing to die instead of the young lad who had been captured in war. E ke ethelus an o episthenes uper tutu apothanin. The same use of uper is seen in Xenophon's Hellenica and De Venatione, also in Plato's Symposium, 180 and 207, and also in the Alcestis of Euripides, 446, 540, 732, compared with 155, 156, 698, 706, 715 to 717. In the first three lines, anti is employed and in the remainder uper, in respect of the same subject, showing that classical usage allows of their being interchanged. Demosthenes says, Eroteson tutus, malo ne ego tuth uper su pueso. Vina remarks that uper is sometimes nearly equivalent to anti, instead of, loco. See especially Euripides, Alcestis, 700, Thucydides, 1, 141, Polybius 3, 67, Philemon 13. De Wetter on Romans 5, 7 says, Uper can anstatt heißen, 2 Corinthians 5, 20. Bauer says, Wenn auch in vielen Stellen das Apathanin Uper nur ein Sterben zum Bestehen anderer ist, so kann doch wohl in den Stellen Römer 4, 25, Galater 1, 4, Römer 8, 3, 1. Korinther 15, 3, 2. Korinther 5, 14, der Begriff der Stellvertretung wenigstens der Sache nach nicht zurückgewiesen werden. The meaning, therefore, of uper must be determined by the context, since both classical and New Testament usages permit of its being employed to signify either benefit or substitution, it is plain that it cannot be confined to either signification. It would be as erroneous to assert that it uniformly means for the advantage of, as to assert that it uniformly means in the place of. The remark of Magi is just. The word for, or the Greek words anti, uper, dia, peri, of which it is the translation, admitting of different senses, may of course be differently applied according to the nature of the subject, and yet the doctrine remain unchanged. Thus it might be proper to say that Christ suffered instead of us, anti emon, although it would be absurd to say that he suffered instead of our offences, anti ton amartematon emon. It is sufficient if the different applications of the word carry a consistent meaning. To die instead of us and to die on account of our offences perfectly agree. But this change of the expression necessarily arises from the change of the subject and accordingly the same difficulty will be found to attach to the exposition proposed by these writers, Sykes and H. Taylor, since the word for, interpreted on account of, i.e. for the benefit of, cannot be applied in the same sense in all the texts. For although 
dying for our benefit is perfectly intelligible dying for the benefit of our offences is no less absurd than dying instead of our offences in light of these facts it is easy to see why the new testament writers employ uper so often rather than anti to denote the relation of christ's death to man's salvation the latter preposition excludes the idea of benefit or advantage and specifies only the idea of substitution the former may include both ideas whenever therefore the sacred writer would express both together and at once he selects the preposition uper in so doing he teaches both that christ died in the sinner's place and for the sinner's benefit vicariousness implies substitution a vicar is a person deputed to perform the function of another in the case under consideration the particular function to be performed is that of atoning for sin by suffering man the transgressor is the party who owes the atonement and who ought to discharge the office of an atoner but jesus christ is the party who actually discharges the office and makes the atonement in his stead the idea of vicariousness or substitution is therefore vital to a correct theory of christ's priestly office man the transgressor would make his own atonement if he should suffer the penalty affixed to transgression so far as the penalty is concerned retributive justice would be satisfied if the whole human race were punished for ever and if god had no attribute but retributive justice this would have been the course that he would have taken a deity strictly and simply just but destitute of compassion for the guilty would have inflicted the penalty of the violated law upon the transgressor he would not have allowed of a substituted satisfaction of justice and still less would he have provided one it is important to notice this fact because it shows the senselessness of a common objection to the doctrine of vicarious atonement namely that it is incompatible with mercy if god it is asked insists upon satisfying justice by allowing his son to suffer in the place of sinners where is his mercy the ready answer is that it is mercy to the criminal to permit the substitution of penalty and still more to provide the substitute after the permission if god had no compassionate feeling towards the sinner he would compel the sinner himself to satisfy the demands of the law which he had transgressed but in permitting and still more in providing a substitute to make that satisfaction which man is under obligation to make for himself god manifests the greatest and strangest mercy that can be conceived of for the vicarious atonement of christ is the sovereign and the judge putting himself in the place of the criminal it is important at this point to mark the difference between personal and vicarious atonement a personal atonement is made by the offending party vicarious atonement is made by the offended party the former is made by the sinner the latter is made by god our great god and saviour jesus christ titus two thirteen if a citizen pays the fine appointed by the civil law he satisfies justice for his own civil transgression if the murderer is executed he atones for his own crime before the human law though not before the divine and when a sinner suffers endless punishment he personally satisfies eternal justice for his sin b personal atonement is given by the criminal not received by him but vicarious atonement is received by the criminal not given by him this is indicated in the scripture phraseology in romans five eleven it is said that the believer receives the atonement vicariously made for him by christ if he had made an atonement for himself he would have given to justice the atonement not received it c personal atonement is incompatible with mercy but vicarious atonement is the highest form of mercy when the sinner satisfies the law by his own eternal death he experiences justice without mercy but when god satisfies the law for him he experiences mercy in the wonderful form of god's self-sacrifice d personal atonement is incompatible with the eternal life of the sinner but vicarious atonement obtains eternal life for him when the sinner suffers the penalty due to his transgression he is lost for ever but when god incarnate suffers the penalty for him he is saved for ever vicarious atonement in the christian system is made by the offended party god is the party against whom sin is committed and he is the party who atones for its commission vicarious atonement consequently is the highest conceivable exhibition of the attribute of mercy herein is love that god sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins 1 john four ten, for god to remit penalty without inflicting suffering upon god incarnate would be infinitely less compassion than to remit it through such infliction in one case there is no self-sacrifice in the godhead in the other there is the pardon in one case is inexpensive and cheap in the other costly and difficult of execution
the Sicinian objection that vicarious atonement is unmerciful because it involves the full and strict satisfaction of justice has no force from a trinitarian point of view it is valid only from a unitarian point of view if the son of god who suffers in the sinner's stead is not god but a creature then of course god makes no self-sacrifice in saving man through vicarious atonement in this case it is not god the offended party who makes the atonement the trinitarian holds that the son of god is true and very god and that when he voluntarily becomes the sinner's substitute for atoning purposes it is very god himself who satisfies god's justice the penalty is not inflicted upon a mere creature whom god made from nothing and who is one of countless millions but it is inflicted upon the incarnate creator himself the following extract from channing illustrates this misconception unitarianism will not listen for a moment to the common errors by which this bright attribute of mercy is obscured it will not hear of a vindictive wrath of god which must be quenched by blood or of a justice which binds his mercy with an iron chain until its demands are satisfied to the full it will not hear that god needs any foreign influence to awaken his mercy the finger must be placed upon this word foreign the trinitarian does not concede that the influence of jesus christ upon god's justice is an influence foreign to god the propitiating and reconciling influence of jesus christ according to the trinitarian emanates from the depths of the godhead this suffering is the suffering of one of the divine persons incarnate god is not propitiated 1 john 2 2 4 10 by another being when he is propitiated by the only begotten son the term foreign in the above extract is properly applicable only upon the unitarian theory that the son of god is not god but a being like man or angel alien to the divine essence this fallacy is still more apparent in the following illustration from the same writer suppose that a creditor through compassion to certain debtors should persuade a benevolent and opulent man to pay in their stead would not the debtors see a greater mercy and feel a weightier obligation if they were to receive a free gratuitous release here the creditor and debtors substitute are entirely different parties the creditor himself makes not the slightest self-sacrifice in the transaction because he and the substitute are not one being but two consequently the sacrifice involved in the payment of the debt is confined wholly to the substitute the creditor has no share in it but if the creditor and the substitute were one and the same being then the pecuniary loss incurred by the vicarious payment of the debt would be a common loss upon the unitarian theory god the father and jesus christ are two beings as different from each other as two individual men if this be the fact then indeed vicarious atonement implies no mercy in god the father the mercy would lie wholly in jesus christ because the self-sacrifice would be wholly in him but if the trinitarian theory is the truth and god the father and jesus christ are two persons of one substance being and glory then the self-sacrifice that is made by jesus christ is not confined to him alone but is a real self-sacrifice both on the part of god the father and also of the entire trinity this is taught in scripture god the father so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son john three sixteen he spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all romans eight thirty two the triune god commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners christ died for us romans 5 8 though it was god the son and not god the father who became incarnate and suffered and died it by no means follows that the first person of the trinity made no self-sacrifice in this humiliation and crucifixion of the incarnate second person he gave up the agony and death his dear and beloved son he passed the sword as zechariah thirteen seven says through the man who was his fellow such scriptures imply that the redemption of sinful man caused god the father a species of sorrow the sorrow of bruising and putting to grief isaiah fifty three ten the son of his love the son who is in the bosom of the father john one eighteen the self-sacrifice therefore that is made by the son in giving him to die for sinners involves a self-sacrifice made by the father in surrendering the son for this purpose no person of the godhead even when he works officially works exclusively of the others the unity of being and nature between father and son makes the act of self-sacrifice in the salvation of man common to both he that hath seen me hath seen the father i and my father are one john fourteen nine ten thirty the mediator says augustine was both the offerer and the offering and he was also one with him to whom the offering was made see south sermon thirty and this does not conflict with the doctrine that the divine essence is incapable of suffering 
The divine impassibility means that the divine nature cannot be caused to suffer from any external cause. Nothing in the created universe can make God feel pain or misery. But it does not follow that God cannot himself do an act which he feels to be a sacrifice of feeling and affection, and insofar an inward suffering. When God gave up to humiliation and death his only begotten Son, he was not utterly indifferent and unaffected by the act. It was as truly a sacrifice for the Father to surrender the beloved Son as it was for the Son to surrender himself. The Scriptures so represent the matter. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. God spared not his own Son, but freely gave him up. When the Father, in the phrase of the prophet, awoke the sword against the man who was his fellow, he likewise pierced himself. Vicarious atonement, unlike personal atonement, cannot be made by a creature. Psalm 49.7 None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. Micah 6.7 Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? Matthew 16.26 What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? This is acknowledged in the province of human law. No provision is made in human legislation for the substitution of penalty. In the case of capital punishment, one citizen may not be substituted for another. In the case of civil penalty, such a fine or imprisonment, the state cannot seize upon an innocent person and compel him to suffer for the guilty. And even if there should be a willingness upon the part of the innocent to suffer for the guilty, legislation makes no provision for the substitution. The state would refuse to hang an innocent man, however willing and urgent he might be, to take the place of the murderer. The state will not fine or imprison any but the real culprit. The reason for this is twofold. First, each citizen owes duties towards man that could not be performed if he should assume the obligations of another citizen. There are debts to the family, to society, and to the commonwealth, of which these would be defrauded, if the life or property of one person should be substituted for that of another. Secondly, each individual owes duties towards God, which would be interfered with by the substitution of one man for another within the sphere of human relations. And the state has no right to legislate in a manner that interferes with God's claims upon his creatures. The instances in pagan or Christian communities in which there seems to be substitution of penalty are exceptional and irregular. They are not recognized as legitimate by pagan authorities, still less by Christian jurists. When, as in the early Roman history, an individual citizen was allowed to devote himself to death for the welfare of the state, this was an impulse of the popular feeling. It was not regularly provided for and legitimated by the national legislature. It was no part of the legal code, and human sacrifices among savage nations cannot be regarded as parts of the common law of nations. That vicarious atonement cannot be made by a created being within the province of divine law will be made evident when we come to consider the nature of Christ's substituted work. At this point it is sufficient to observe that, if within the lower sphere of human crimes and penalties one man cannot suffer for another, it would be still more impossible in the higher sphere of man's relations to God. No crime against man is of so deep a guilt as is sin against God, and if the former cannot be expiated by a human substitute, still less can the latter be. It should be remembered, however, that the reason why a creature cannot be substituted for a creature for purposes of atonement is not that substitution of penalty is inadmissible, but that the creature is not a proper subject to be substituted for the reasons above mentioned. Substitution is sometimes allowed within the province of commercial law. One man may pay the pecuniary debt of another, if this can be done without infraction of any rights of other parties. If, however, it cannot be, then vicarious payment is inadmissible. A man would not be permitted to take money due to one person to pay the debt of another. A man is not allowed in the state of New York to leave all his property to benevolent purposes if he has a family dependent upon him. The priestly office of Christ cannot be understood without a clear and accurate conception of the nature of atonement. The idea and meaning of atonement is conveyed in the following statements in Leviticus 6, 2-7 and 4, 13-20. Footnote. It was in China that a Baptist missionary found his converts slow to appreciate the value of Christ's atoning blood until the book of Leviticus threw light upon the sacrificial offering and showed the relation between shedding of blood and remission. Bible Society's Record, November 21, 1878. End of footnote. If a soul sin and commit a trespass against the Lord... He shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord, a ram without blemish, and the priest shall make an atonement for him before the Lord, and it shall be forgiven him. This is individual atonement for individual transgression. 
if the whole congregation of israel sin and are guilty then the congregation shall offer a young bullock for the sin and the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands upon the head of the bullock and the bullock shall be killed and the priest shall make an atonement for them and it shall be forgiven them this is national atonement for national transgression two particulars are to be noticed in this account a the essence of the atonement is in the suffering the atoning bullock or ram must bleed agonize and die and he who offers it must not get any enjoyment out of it it must be a loss to him and so far forth a suffering for him he must not eat any of the trespass offering the sin offering must be wholly burnt skin flesh and dung leviticus sixteen twenty seven in harmony with this our lord lays stress upon his own suffering as the essential element in his atonement the son of man must suffer many things luke nine twenty two matthew sixteen twenty one at alia it behoved christ to suffer acts three eighteen luke twenty four twenty six christ refused the anodyne of wine mingled with gall that would have deadened his pain matthew twenty seven thirty four footnote bear in his symbolic des mosaichen cultus denies that there is anything piacular in the levitical sin offering the slain victim is emblematic of self-consecration and self-sacrifice not of penal satisfaction the death of the lamb or goat teaches not that the offerer deserves to die for his past transgression but that he ought to live for future consecration to obedience this interpretation lies under all the moral theories of the atonement its inconsistency is apparent in making the shedding of blood or death the symbol of life End of footnote. b the forgiveness is the non-infliction of suffering upon the transgressor if the substituted victim suffers then the criminal shall be released from suffering in these and similar passages the hebrew word kfar which in the pl is translated to make an atonement literally signifies to cover over so as not to be seen and the hebrew word salach translated to forgive has for its primary idea that of lightness lifting up perhaps to be at rest or peace genesius in voce the connection of ideas in the hebrew text appears then to be this the suffering of the substituted bullock or ram has the effect to cover over the guilt of the real criminal and make it invisible to the eye of god the holy this same thought is conveyed in psalm fifty one nineteen blot out my transgressions hide thy face from my sins in isaiah thirty eight seventeen thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back in micah seven nineteen thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea when this covering over is done the conscience of the transgressor is at rest these hebrew words however are translated in the septuagint by greek words which introduce different ideas from covering and resting the word kfar is rendered by exilaskome which means to propitiate or appease and the word salach is translated by afiemi to release or let go the connection of ideas in the greek translation appears therefore to be this by the suffering of the sinner's atoning substitute the divine wrath at sin is propitiated and as a consequence of this propitiation the punishment due to sin is released or not inflicted upon the transgressor this release or non-infliction of penalty is forgiveness in the biblical representation this is conceded by the opponents of the evangelical system says wegscheider venia sive condonatio peccatorum ex vulgari et biblica descendi consuetudin est abolitio buene peccatis contracte et restitutio benevolentiae divine erga peccatorem in the lord's prayer the petition to forgiveness is afes emin ta ophilemata emon matthew six twelve christ assures the paralytic that his sins are forgiven in the words afeonte su e amartie su matthew nine two the preaching of the gospel is the preaching of the release of sins aphesis amartion acts thirteen thirty eight it is highly important to notice that in the biblical representation the forgiveness is inseparably connected with the atonement and the remission with the propitiation the former stands to the latter in the relation of effect to cause the scriptures know nothing of forgiveness or remission of penalty in isolation it always has a foregoing cause or reason it is because the priest has offered the ram that the individual transgression is forgiven that is not punished in the person of the individual it is because the priest has offered the bullock upon whose head the elders have laid their hands that the national sin is forgiven that is not visited upon the nation 
without this vicarious shedding of blood there would be no remission or release of penalty hebrews nine twenty two not until the transgression has been covered over by a sacrifice can there be peace in the conscience of the transgressor not until the holy one has been propitiated by an atonement can the penalty be released neither of these effects can exist without the antecedent cause the bible knows nothing of the remission of punishment arbitrarily that is without a ground or reason penal suffering in scripture is released or not inflicted upon the guilty because it has been endured by a substitute if penalty were remitted by sovereignty merely without any judicial ground or reason whatever if it were inflicted neither upon the sinner nor his substitute this would be the abolition of penalty not the remission of it according to the biblical view the divine mercy is seen more in the cause than in the effect more in the atonement for sin than in the remission of sin more in expiation than in forgiveness more in the vicarious infliction than in the personal non-infliction after the foundation has been laid for the release of penalty it is easy to release it when a sufficient reason has been established why sin should be pardoned it is easy to pardon it is the first step that costs this is taught by st paul in romans five ten if when we were enemies we were reconciled to god by the death of his son much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life the greater includes the less if god's mercy is great enough to move him to make a vicarious atonement for man's sin it is certainly great enough to move him to secure the consequences of such an act if god's compassion is great enough to induce him to lay man's punishment upon his own son it is surely great enough to induce him not to lay it upon the believer if god so loves the world as to atone vicariously for its sin he certainly so loves it as to remit its sin in looking therefore for the inmost seat and centre of the divine compassion we should seek it rather in the work of atonement than in the act of forgiveness rather in the cause than in the effect that covenant transaction in the depths of the trinity in which god the father commissioned and gave up the only begotten as a piacular oblation for man's sin and in which the only begotten voluntarily accepted the commission is a greater proof and manifestation of the divine pity than that other and subsequent transaction in the depths of a believer's soul in which god says son be of good cheer thy sin is forgiven thee the latter transaction is easy enough after the former has occurred but the former transaction cost the infinite and adorable trinity an effort and a sacrifice that is inconceivable and unutterable this is the mystery which the angels desire to look into that a just god should release from penalty after an ample atonement has been made is easy to understand and believe but that he should himself make the atonement is the wonder and the mystery hereby perceive we the love of god because he laid down his life for us one john three sixteen it follows from this discussion that atonement is objective in its essential nature an atonement makes its primary impression upon the party to whom it is made not upon the party by whom it is made when a man does a wrong to a fellow man and renders satisfaction for the wrong this satisfaction is intended to influence the object not the subject to produce an effect upon the man who has suffered the wrong not the man who did the wrong subjective atonement is a contradiction atoning to oneself is like lifting oneself footnote if it be objected that in the statement of the doctrine of vicarious atonement it is maintained that god atones to god the reply is that jesus christ does not make satisfaction to himself as jesus christ but to the trinity the incarnate word satisfies the justice of the godhead the relation of his death is therefore objective it has reference to the divine nature not to his own theanthropic personality End footnote the objective nature of atonement is wrought into the very phraseology of scripture as the analysis of the biblical terms just made clearly shows to cover sin is to cover it from the sight of god not of the sinner to propitiate is to propitiate god not man the septuagint idea of propitiation rather than the hebrew idea of covering over is prominent in the new testament and consequently passed into the soteriology of the primitive church and from this into both the romish and the protestant soteriology the difference between the two is not essential since both terms are objective but there is a difference the hebrew term kfar denotes that the sacrificial victim produces an effect upon sin it covers it up but the corresponding septuagint term elaskome denotes that the sacrificial victim produces an effect upon god it propitiates his holy displeasure when st john one john two two and four ten asserts that 
Jesus Christ the righteous is the propitiation, ilasmos, for our sins, and that God sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins, the implication is that the divine nature is capable of being conciliated by some propitiating act. This propitiating act under the old dispensation was, typically and provisionally, the offering of a lamb or goat, as emblematic of the future offering of the Lamb of God, and under the new dispensation it is the actual offering of the body of Jesus Christ, who takes the sinner's place and performs for him the propitiating and reconciling act. The objective nature of atonement appears, again, in the New Testament term katalare and the verb katalasin. These two words occur nine times in the New Testament with reference to Christ's atoning work. Romans 5, 10, 11, and 15. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 20. In the authorized version, katalare is translated atonement in Romans 5, 11, but in the other instances, reconciliation or reconcile are the terms employed. The verb katalasin primarily signifies to pay the exchange or difference, and secondarily to conciliate or appease. The following, from Athenaeus, brings to view both meanings of the word. Why do we say that a tetradrachma katalatete, when we never speak of its getting into a passion? A coin is exchanged in the primary signification, and a man is reconciled in the secondary. Two parties in a bargain settle their difference or are reconciled by one paying the exchange or balance to the other. In like manner, two parties at enmity settle their difference, or are reconciled by one making a satisfaction to the other. In each instance, the transaction is called in Greek, katalare. The same usage is found in the Anglo-Saxon language. The Saxon bot, from which comes the modern boot, denotes first a compensation paid to the offended party by the offender, then secondly, the reconciling effect produced by such compensation, and lastly, it signifies the state of mind which prompted the boot or compensation, namely repentance itself. Bosworth, Anglo-Saxon Dictionary, Subvoce. The term reconciliation is objective in its signification. Reconciliation terminates upon the object, not upon the subject. The offender reconciles not himself, but the person whom he has offended, by undergoing some loss and thereby making amends. This is clearly taught in Matthew 5.24. First be reconciled to thy brother. Here, the brother who has done the injury is the one who is to make up the difference. He is to propitiate or reconcile his brother to himself by a compensation of some kind. Reconciliation here does not denote a process in the mind of the offender, but of the offended. The meaning is not first conciliate thine own displeasure towards thy brother, but first conciliate thy brother's displeasure towards thee. In the Episcopalian order for the Holy Communion, it is said, If ye shall perceive your offences to be such as are not only against God, but also against your neighbours, then ye shall reconcile yourselves unto them, being ready to make restitution and satisfaction according to the uttermost of your powers for all injuries and wrongs done by you to any other. The biblical phraseology, be reconciled to thy brother, agrees with that of common life in describing reconciliation from the side of the offending party rather than of the offended. We say of the settlement of a rebellion that the subjects are reconciled to their sovereign, rather than that the sovereign is reconciled to the subjects, though the latter is more strictly accurate, because it is the sovereign who is reconciled by a satisfaction made to him by the subjects who have rebelled. In Romans 5.10, believers are said to be reconciled to God by the death of his Son. Here the reconciliation is described from the side of the offending party. Man is said to be reconciled. Yet this does not mean the subjective reconciliation of the sinner toward God, but the objective reconciliation of God towards the sinner. For the preceding verse speaks of God as being from whose wrath the believer is saved by the death of Christ. This shows that the reconciliation effected by Christ's atoning death is that of the divine anger against sin. Upon this text, Maya remarks that the death of Christ does not remove the wrath of man towards God, but it removes God's displeasure towards man. Similarly, De Vetta remarks that the reconciliation must mean the removal of the wrath of God. It is that reconciliation of God to man, which not only here, but in Romans 3.25, 2 Corinthians 5.18 and 19, Colossians 1.21, Ephesians 2.16, is referred to the atoning death of Christ. The priestly work of Christ is also represented in Scripture under the figure of a price or ransom. This also is an objective term. The price is paid by the subject to the object. Matthew 20:28. 20, the Son of Man is come to give his life a ransom, lutron, for 
and the many acts twenty twenty eight the church of god which he hath purchased beri epuseta with his own blood romans three twenty four the redemption apolutrosis that is in jesus christ one corinthians six twenty ye are bought ego rastete with a price galatians three thirteen christ hath redeemed ex ego rasen us from the curse ephesians one seven colossians one fourteen redemption through his blood one timothy two six who gave himself a ransom antilutron for all the allusion in the figure is sometimes to the payment of a debt and sometimes to the liberation of a captive in either case it is not satan but god who holds the claim man has not transgressed against satan but against god the debt that requires cancelling is due to a divine attribute not to the rebel archangel the ransom that must be paid is for the purpose of delivering that sinner from the demands of justice not of the devil satan cannot acquire or establish legal claims upon any being whatever some of the early fathers misinterpreted this doctrine of a ransom and introduced a vitiating element into the patristic soteriology which however was soon eliminated and has never reappeared they explain certain texts which refer to sanctification as referring to justification in two timothy two twenty six sinful men are said to be taken captive by the devil at his will in one timothy one twenty hymenaeus and alexander are delivered unto satan in one corinthians five five st paul commands the church to deliver over the incestuous member to satan for the destruction of the flesh in these passages reference is had to the power which satan has over the creature who has voluntarily subjected himself to him the sinner is satan's captive upon the principle mentioned by christ in john eight thirty four whosoever committeth sin is the servant thulos of sin and by st paul in romans six sixteen know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants thulus to obey his servants ye are to whom ye obey whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness there is in these passages no reference to any legal or rightful claim which the devil has over the transgressor but only to the strong and tyrannical grasp which he has upon him this captivity to satan is related to the work of the holy spirit more than to the atoning efficacy of christ's blood and deliverance from it makes a part of the work of sanctification rather than of justification this deliverance is preceded by another in the order of nature it is not until man has been first redeemed by the atoning blood from the claims of justice that he is redeemed by the indwelling spirit from the captivity and bondage of sin and satan when therefore the efficacy of christ's death is represented as the payment of a ransom price the same objective reference to christ's work is intended as in the previous instances of propitiation and reconciliation by christ's death man is ransomed from the righteous claims of another being than himself that being is not satan but god the holy and just these claims are vicariously met god satisfies god's claims in man's place god's mercy ransoms man from god's justice we have thus seen from this examination of the scripture representations that christ's priestly work has an objective reference namely that it affects and influences the divine being christ's atonement covers sin from god's sight it propitiates god's wrath against sin it reconciles god's justice towards the sinner it pays a ransom to god for the sinner none of these acts terminate upon man the subject but all terminate upon god the object christ does not cover sin from the sinner's sight he does not propitiate the sinner's wrath he does not reconcile the sinner to the sinner he does not pay a ransom to the sinner these acts are each and all of them outward and transitive in their aim and reference they are directed toward the infinite not the finite toward the creator not the creature whatever be the effect wrought by the vicarious death of the son of god it is wrought upon the divine nature if it appeases it appeases that nature if it propitiates it propitiates that nature if it satisfies it satisfies that nature if it reconciles it reconciles that nature it is impossible to put any other interpretation upon the scripture ideas and representations a merely subjective reference which would find all the meaning of them within the soul of man requires a forced and violent exegesis of scripture and a self-contradictory use of the word atonement at the same time revelation plainly teaches that the author of this atoning influence and effect upon the divine being is the divine being itself god propitiates appeases satisfies and reconciles god none of these are the acts of the creature in all this work of propitiation reconciliation and redemption god himself is the originating and active agent he is therefore both active and passive both agent and patient 
God is the being who is angry at sin, and God is the being who propitiates this anger. God is the offended party, and he is the one who reconciles the offended party. It is divine justice that demands satisfaction, and it is the divine compassion that makes the satisfaction. God is the one who holds man in a righteous captivity, and he is the one who pays the ransom that frees him from it god is the holy judge of man who requires satisfaction for sin and god is the merciful father of man who provides it for him this fact relieves the doctrine of vicarious atonement of all appearance of severity and evinces it to be the height of mercy and compassion if it were man and not god who provided the atonement the case would be otherwise this peculiarity of the case is taught in scripture in two corinthians five eighteen and nineteen it is said that god hath reconciled us to himself his own self, by Jesus Christ, and that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. The statement is repeated in Colossians 1.20. It pleased the Father, through the blood of Christ's cross, to reconcile all things unto himself. According to this, in the work of vicarious atonement, God is both subject and object, active and passive. He exerts a propitiating influence when he makes this atonement, and he receives a propitiating influence when he accepts it. He performs an atoning work, and his own attribute of justice feels the effect of it. Says Augustine, the same one and true mediator reconciles us to God by the atoning sacrifice, remains one with God to whom he offers it, makes those one in himself for whom he offers it, and is himself both the offerer and the offering. Similarly, Frank remarks that freedom from guilt is possible for man because it has been provided for by God, and this provision rests upon a transaction of God with himself, whereby, as other, i.e. the son, he has made satisfaction to the claims of his own justice upon the sinner. This doctrine of scripture has passed into the creeds and litanies of the church. In the English litany there is the petition, From thy wrath and from everlasting damnation, good Lord, deliver us. Here the very same being who is displeased is asked to save from the displeasure. The very same holy God who is angry at sin is implored by the sinner to deliver him from the effects of this anger. And this is justified by the example of David who cries, Psalm 38, 1, O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. And by the words of God himself addressed to his people through the prophet Isaiah, 60, verse 10, In my wrath I smote thee, but in my favour have I had mercy upon thee. The prophet Hosea 6, 1, says to the unfaithful church, Come, and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us, he hath smitten, and he will bind us up. In Zechariah 1, 2-4, Jehovah is described as sore displeased, and yet at the same time as exhibiting clemency towards those with whom he is displeased. The Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers, therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Also, Job 42, 7 and 8, The Lord said to Eliphaz, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends. Therefore take unto you seven bullocks and seven rams, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, lest I deal with you after your folly. Here the very same God who is displeased with Job's friends devises for them a method whereby they may avert the displeasure. Upon a larger scale, God is displeased with every sinful man, yet he himself provides a method whereby sinful man may avert this displeasure. This is eminently the case with the believer. When, says Calvin, the saints seem to themselves to feel most the anger of God, they still confide their complaints to him, and when there is no appearance of his hearing them, they still continue to call upon him. Says Anselm, Respira, o pecator, respira, ne desperes, Spera in eo quem times, a fuge ad eum a quo au fugisti, invoca importune quem superpe provocasti. The doctrine of vicarious atonement consequently implies that in God there exists simultaneously both wrath and compassion. In this fact is seen the infinite difference between divine and human anger. When God is displeased with the sinner, he compassionately desires that the sinner may escape the displeasure and invents a way of escaping it. But when man is displeased with his fellow man, he does not desire that his fellow man may escape the displeasure and devises no way of escape. The divine wrath issues from the constitutional and necessary antagonism between the divine holiness and moral evil. The divine compassion springs from the benevolent interest which God feels in the work of his hands. The compassion is founded in God's paternal relation to man, the wrath is founded in his judicial relation to him. 
God, as a creator and father, pities the sinner. As a judge, he is displeased with him. Wrath against sin must be both felt and manifested by God. Compassion towards the sinner must be felt, but may or may not be manifested by him. Justice is necessary in its exercise, but mercy is optional. The righteous feeling of wrath towards sin is immutable and eternal in God, but it may be propitiated by the gracious feeling of compassion towards the sinner, which is also immutable and eternal in God. God the Father of men may reconcile God the Judge of men. Whether this shall be done depends upon the sovereign pleasure of God. He is not obliged and necessitated to propitiate his own wrath for the sinner, as he is to punish sin, but he has mercifully determined to do this, and has done it by the atonement of Jesus Christ. By the method of vicarious substitution of penalty, God satisfies his own justice and reconciles his own displeasure towards the transgressor. That moral emotion in the divine essence, which, from the nature and necessity of the case, is incensed against sin, God himself placates by a self-sacrifice that inures to the benefit of the guilty creature. Here the compassion and benevolent love of God propitiates the wrath and holy justice of God. The two feelings exist together in one and the same being. The propitiation is no oblation of extra, no device of a third party or even of sinful man himself, to render God placable towards man. It is wholly ab intra, a self-oblation upon the part of the deity himself, in the exercise of his benevolence towards the guilty, by which to satisfy those constitutional imperatives of the divine nature, which without it must find their satisfaction in the personal punishment of the transgressor, or else be outraged by arbitrary omnipotence. Upon this point Augustine remarks, it is written, God commendeth his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us. He loved us, therefore, even when in the exercise of enmity towards him we were working iniquity. And yet it is said with perfect truth, Thou hatest, O Lord, all workers of iniquity. Wherefore, in a wonderful and divine manner, he both hated and loved us at the same time. He hated us as being different from what he had made us, but as our iniquity had not entirely destroyed his work in us, he could at the same time, in every one of us, hate what we had done and love what he had created. In every instance it is truly said of God, Thou hatest nothing which thou hast made, for never wouldst thou have made anything if thou hadst hated it. Calvin, after quoting the above from Augustine, remarks that God, who is the perfection of righteousness, cannot love iniquity, which he beholds in us all. We all, therefore, have in us that which deserves God's hatred. Wherefore, in respect to our corrupt nature and the consequent depravity of our lives, we are all really offensive to God, guilty in his sight and born to the damnation of hell. But because God is unwilling to lose that in us which is his own, he still finds something in us which his benevolence can love. For notwithstanding that we are sinners by our own fault, we are yet his creatures, though we have brought death upon ourselves, yet he had created us for life. Turretin distinguishes between compassion and reconciliation. Because God is compassionate on his own excellent and perfect nature, he can become reconciled towards a transgressor of his law. If he were inherently destitute of compassion, he would be incapable of reconciliation. Compassion is a feeling, reconciliation is an act resulting from it. The former is inherent and necessary, the latter is optional and sovereign. If God were not compassionate and placable, he could not be propitiated by the sacrifice of Christ. An implacable and merciless being could not be conciliated, and would do nothing to effect a reconciliation. God is moved by a feeling of compassion and a benevolent affection towards sinners, prior to and irrespective of the death of Christ. When we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. The death of Christ did not make God compassionate and merciful. He is always and eternally so. But God's justice is not reconciled to sinners unless Christ die for their sin. The compassion is prior in the order of nature to the death of Christ. The reconciliation of justice is subsequent to it. Before the death of Christ, God was actually compassionate and placable. This moved him to provide salvation and redemption for man. But he was actually reconciled and propitiated only upon the condition and supposition of that death of Christ, which was required by eternal justice. In this manner, compassion and wrath coexist in God. To us, indeed, says Turretin, it seems difficult to conceive that the same person who is offended with us should also love us, because when any feeling takes possession of us we are apt to be wholly engrossed with it. Thus, if our anger is inflamed against any one, there is usually no room in us for favour towards him, and on the other hand, if we regard him with favour, there is often connected with it the most unrighteous indulgence. 
but if we could cast off the disorders of passion and clothe ourselves with the garments of righteousness we might easily harmonize these writings with one another a father offended with the viciousness of his son loves him as a son yet is angry with him as being vicious a judge in like manner may be angry and moved to punish yet not the less on this account inclined by compassion to pardon the offender if only some one would stand forth and satisfy the claims of justice for him why then should not god who is most righteous and benevolent at once by reason of his justice demand penalty and by reason of his compassion provide satisfaction for us turretin quotes in proof of this view the following from aquinas non dicimur reconciliati quasi teos de novo amare insiperet nam eterno amore dilexit sed quia per hanc reconciliationem sublata est omnis odi causa dum per ablutionem peccati dum per recompensationem acceptabilioris boni he also remarks that scholastici locuntor dilexit deus humanem genus quantum ad naturam quam ipse fecit odit quantum ad culpam quam hominis contraxerunt in all that is said consequently respecting the wrath of god in christian theology it is of the utmost importance to keep in view the fact that this wrath is compatible with benevolence and compassion this is the infinite difference in kind between divine and human anger at the very moment when god is displeased he is capable of devising kind things for the object of his displeasure while we were yet sinners christ died for us romans five eight and at the very instant when guilty man is conscious that the divine wrath is resting upon him he may address his supplication for a blessing to the very being who is angry with his sin and may pray from thy wrath good lord deliver me and the great and ample warrant and encouragement for men to do this is found in the sacrifice of the son of god for in and by this atoning oblation the divine compassion conciliates the divine wrath against sin in the death of the god man righteousness and peace justice and mercy kiss each other psalm eighty five ten the mercy vicariously satisfies the justice the divine compassion in the sinner's stead receives upon itself the stroke of the divine wrath god the father smites god the son in the transgressor's place awake o sword against the man that is my fellow saith the lord of hosts zechariah thirteen seven footnote the same principle applies to the afflictions of life the strength and comfort must come from the very same being who afflicts god is the source of affliction and he is the god of all comfort god wounds and god heals the wound see pascal's letter to his brother-in-law on the death of his own father the same truth is expressed in the lines of george herbert ah my dear angry lord since thou dost love yet strike cast down yet help afford sure i will do the like i will complain yet praise i will bewail approve and all my sour sweet days i will lament and love in footnote this subject is elucidated still further by noticing the difference between the holy wrath of god and the wicked wrath of man the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of god james one twenty when man is angry at man this feeling is absolutely incompatible with the feeling of compassion and benevolent love selfish human anger and benevolence cannot be simultaneous they cannot possibly coexist when a man under the impulse of sinful displeasure says to his brother man raka or thou fool matthew five twenty two when he feels passionate and selfish wrath he cannot devise good things for his brother man on the contrary he devises only evil things he plots his neighbour's destruction the wrath of the human heart is not only incompatible with benevolence but is often intensely malignant it is even increased by the moral excellence that is in the object of it holiness in a fellow creature sometimes makes wicked human anger hotter and more deadly the jews gnashed their teeth in rage at the meekness and innocence of christ the hatred of the wicked says rousseau is only roused the more from the impossibility of finding any just grounds on which it can rest and the very consciousness of their own injustice is only a grievance the more against him who is the object of it oderint quem laeserint says tacitus this kind of wrath requires complete eradication before compassion can exist better it were says luther that god should be angry with us than that we be angry with god for he can soon be at an union with us again because he is merciful but when we are angry with him then the case is not to be helped still further elucidation of the subject is found in the resemblance there is between the holy wrath of god and the righteous anger of the human conscience 
the sinful feeling of passionate anger to which we have just alluded is an emotion of the heart but the righteous feeling of dispassionate anger to which we now allude is in the conscience this is a different faculty from the heart its temper towards sin is unselfish and impartial like the wrath of god and this feeling can exist simultaneously with that of benevolence when a man's own conscience is displacent and remorseful over his own sin there is no malice towards the man himself for no man ever yet hated his own flesh ephesians five twenty nine at the very moment when a just and righteous man's conscience is offended and incensed at the wickedness of a fellow-man he can and often does devise good things towards him the most self-sacrificing philanthropists are those whose conscience is the most sensitive towards the moral evil which they endeavour to remove and whose moral displeasure against sin is the most vivid and emphatic it is not the sentimental rousseau but the righteous calvin who would willingly lay down his life if thereby he could save men from eternal retribution the conscience of rousseau was dull and torpid compared with the keen and energetic conscience of calvin but the desire of the latter for the spiritual and eternal welfare of sinful men was a thousand times greater than that of the former supposing that there was in rousseau any desire at all for the spiritual and eternal welfare of man when st paul says respecting alexander the coppersmith the lord reward him according to his works two timothy four fourteen he gives expression to the righteous displeasure of a pure conscience towards one who was opposing the gospel of christ and the progress of god's kingdom in the earth it was not any personal injury to the apostle that awakened the desire for the divine retribution in the case but a zeal for the glory of god and the welfare of man could st paul by any self-sacrifice on his part have produced repentance and reformation in alexander he would gladly have made it as in the instance of his unbelieving jewish kindred he would have been willing to be accursed from christ for this purpose romans nine three but when a profane man angrily says to his fellow-man god damn you this is the malignant utterance of the selfish passion of the human heart and is incompatible with any benevolent feeling vicarious atonement part two we find then that in the exercise of christ's priestly office the agency is wholly within the divine nature itself the justice and the mercy the wrath and the compassion are qualities of one and the same eternal being it follows consequently that the explanation of the great subject of the divine reconciliation lies in the doctrine of the trinity the doctrine of vicarious atonement stands or falls with that of the triune god if god the father son and holy ghost are three distinct persons each one of them really objective to the others then one of them can do a personal work not done by the others that shall have an effect upon the godhead and if god the father son and holy ghost are also one undivided being in nature and essence then this effect whatever it be is not limited and confined to any one of the persons exclusive to the others but is experienced by the one whole undivided nature and essence itself the godhead and not merely god the father or god the son or god the spirit is reconciled to guilty man by the judicial suffering of one of the persons of the godhead incarnate the son of god is a person distinct from and objective to the father and the spirit hence he can do a work which neither of them does he becomes incarnate not they he suffers and dies for man not they and yet the efficacy of this work which is his work as a trinitarian person can terminate upon that entire divine nature which is all in god the father and all in god the spirit as it is all in god the son christ says frank experienced as a vicarious sinner both subjection to god and rejection by god but yet as one who can call the god who has rejected him his god and who while the wrath of god goes forth upon him and delivers him up to the punitive infliction nevertheless can pray not my will but thine be done before leaving the subject of vicarious atonement it is in place here to notice its relation to the soul of man for while christ's atonement has primarily this objective relation to the divine nature it has also a secondary subjective relation to the nature of the guilty creature for whom it is made the object of atonement is intended to be subjectively appropriated by the act of faith in it one in the first place the priestly work of christ has an influence upon the human conscience similar to that which it has upon the divine justice man's moral sense is pacified by christ's atonement peace is everywhere in scripture represented as the particular effect produced by faith in christ's blood therefore being justified by faith we have peace with god romans five one 
we are made nigh to god by the blood of christ for he is our peace ephesians two thirteen and fourteen having made peace through the blood of his cross colossians one twenty peace i leave with you my peace i give unto you john fourteen twenty seven the peace of god passeth all understanding philippians four seven the human conscience is the mirror and index of the divine attribute of justice the two are correlated what therefore god's justice demands man's conscience demands nothing says matthew henry can pacify an offended conscience but that which satisfied an offended god the peace which the believer in christ's atonement enjoys and which is promised by the redeemer to the believer is the subject of experience in man that corresponds to the object of reconciliation in god the pacification of the human conscience is the consequence of the satisfaction of the divine justice god's justice is completely satisfied for the sin of man by the death of christ this is an accomplished fact jesus christ the righteous is the propitiation for the sins of the whole world john two two the instant any individual man of this world of mankind believes that divine justice is thus satisfied his conscience is at rest the belief of a fact is always needed in order to a personal benefit from it belief is not needed in order to establish the fact whether a sinner believes that christ died for sin or not will make no difference with the fact though it will make a vast difference with him if we believe not yet he abideth faithful he cannot deny himself two timothy two thirteen unbelief cannot destroy a fact should not a soul henceforth believe on the son of god it would nevertheless be a fact that he died an atoning death on calvary and that this death is an ample oblation for the sin of the world but it must be remembered that the kind of belief by which a man obtains a personal benefit from the fact of christ's death is experimental not historical or hearsay a man may believe for common rumour that the death of christ satisfies divine justice for the sin of the world and yet experience no benefit and no peace from his belief even as a blind man may believe from common rumour that there is a mountain in front of him and yet have none of the pleasing sensations and personal benefits that accompany the vision of it the blind man may have no doubt of the fact that there is a mountain before him he may even argue to prove its existence and still have all the wretched sensations of blindness and obtain no personal advantage from his hearsay belief and a sinful man may have no sceptical doubt that the death of christ on mount calvary has completely expiated human guilt and may even construct a strong argument in proof of the fact and still have all the miserable experience of an unforgiven sinner may still have remorse and the fear of death and the damnation of hell the belief by which men obtain personal benefit namely mental peace and blessedness from the fact of christ's atonement involves trust and reliance upon christ a man may believe christ and yet not believe on him christ himself marks the difference between historical or hearsay belief and experimental faith in matthew thirteen thirteen to fifteen seeing they see not and hearing they hear not neither do they understand in them is fulfilled the prophecy of isaiah which saith by hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand and seeing ye shall see and shall not perceive whenever there is an experimental belief of the actual and accomplished fact of christ's atonement there is a subjective pacification of the conscience corresponding to the objective reconciliation of the divine justice but this subjective effect of christ's death is neither the primary nor the whole effect of it it presupposes the objective satisfaction or propitiation in this instance as in all others the object is prior to the subject and determines its consciousness two secondly the subjective appropriation of christ's atonement is the evidence and test of genuine repentance an unselfish godly sorrow for sin is shown by a willingness to suffer personally for sin in leviticus twenty six forty one and forty three the truly penitent are described as accepting the punishment of their iniquity the criminal who complains of punishment or resists it or endeavours to escape from it evinces by this fact that he cares more for his own happiness than he does for the evil and wickedness of his act if he were certain of not being punished he would repeat his transgression there is of course no genuine sorrow for sin in such a temper if on the contrary a wrongdoer approves of and accepts the punishment denounced against his crime and voluntarily gives himself up to suffer for his transgression he furnishes the highest proof of true sorrow he does not make his own happiness the first thing but the maintenance of justice with angelo he says so deep sticks it in my penitent heart that i crave death more willingly than mercy tis my deserving and i do entreat it with the penitent thief he says 
we are in this condemnation justly for we receive the due reward of our deeds luke twenty three forty one no one can deny says dorner that true penitence includes the candid acknowledgment of actual desert of punishment and that the denial of this desert and the unwillingness to suffer punishment and to surrender to the disgrace of justice is the most certain proof of a mere semblance of penitence and it is not essentially different when repentance and the resolution to live a better life are put in the place of that suffering which constitutes satisfying atonement and gives a title to remission of sin such views are a poisoning of penitence which in order to be genuine must stand the test of being ready to suffer punishment and approve of the retribution of justice the first impulse consequently of true penitence is to make a personal atonement this distinguishes penitence from remorse a godly sorrow from the sorrow of the world two corinthians seven ten mere remorse has no desire or impulse to suffer and make amends for what has been done its impulse and desire is wholly selfish namely to escape suffering remorse leads to suicide penitence never the suicide's motive is to put an end to his misery he supposes that he will be happier by dying than by continuing to live this was the motive of the impenitent judas footnote suicide if the act of sanity is ipso facto proof of insubmission and rebellion towards god and impenitence in sin socrates contends that to take one's own life is to defraud and dishonour the creator the gods he says are our guardians and we are a possession of theirs if one of your own possessions an ox or an ass for example took the liberty of putting himself out of the way when you had given no intimation of your wish that he should die would you not be displeased with him and would you not punish him if you could it was upon this view of suicide that the self-murderer was denied burial by the church in consecrated ground End footnote. but the broken and contrite heart is willing to do and to suffer anything that would really satisfy god's holy law this is taught in psalm fifty one sixteen david in his genuine sorrow for his great transgression says thou desirest not sacrifice else i would give it he perceives that any expiation which he could make for his sin would be unequal to what justice requires, but this does not render him any the less ready to make it if he could. And when the true penitent perceives that another competent person, divinely appointed, has performed that atoning work for him, which he is unable to perform for himself, he welcomes the substitution with joy and gratitude any aversion therefore to christ's vicarious atonement evinces that there is a defect in the supposed sorrow for sin the lust of self is in the experience the individual's happiness is in the foreground and the divine holiness is in the background and the positive and deliberate rejection of christ's atonement upon the same principle is absolute and utter impenitence a hostile and polemic attitude towards the blood of christ as atoning for human guilt is fatal hardness of heart christ refers to it in his awful words to the pharisees if ye believe not that i am he ye shall die in your sins john eight twenty four impenitence shows itself both in unwillingness to make a personal atonement for sin and to trust in a vicarious atonement for it it becomes necessary now to consider the question how does the suffering of christ meet the requisitions involved in the case of substitution of penalty or vicarious atonement we have seen that suffering is the inmost essence of an atonement the sacrificial victim must agonize and die without shedding of blood there is no remission of penalty even in cases where physical suffering does not take place a suffering of another kind does a citizen within the province of civil law is said to make amends for his fault when he pays a fine and suffers a loss of money as the compensation to civil justice what then is suffering suffering is of three kinds one calamity two chastisement three punishment or penalty one calamity does not refer to sin and guilt it is a kind of suffering that befalls man by the providence of god for other reasons than disciplinary or judicial calamitous suffering however it should be noticed occurs only in a sinful world consequently it is never found isolated and by itself alone it is associated either with chastisement as when a calamity falls upon a child of god or with punishment as when it falls upon the impenitent sinner calamity is therefore rather an element in suffering than the whole of the suffering 
when for illustration some of the galileans had been cruelly put to death by herod luke thirteen one to five our lord distinctly told those who informed him of this fact that these galileans were not sinners above all the galileans because they suffered such things they were sinners but not the worst of sinners in other words he taught them that the whole of this suffering was not penal as sinners they deserved to suffer and some of this suffering was for their sins but as they were not greater sinners than other galileans they did not deserve a suffering that was so much greater than that of the galilean people as a whole a part of this extraordinary suffering therefore was calamity not punishment as such it had no reference to the guilt of the galileans if it had it would have been a proof that they were sinners above all the galileans our lord then repeats and emphasizes the same truth by an allusion to the fall of the tower in siloam upon some of the inhabitants of jerusalem this event did not prove that those few persons were sinners above all men that dwelt in jerusalem there was therefore a calamitous as well as a penal element in this fall of the tower the same doctrine is taught by the extraordinary sufferings of the patriarch job job's friends contended that these were all and wholly penal they inferred that Job had been guilty of some extraordinary sin which merited this extraordinary punishment, and they urged him to confess it. The patriarch, though acknowledging himself to be a sinner and deserving to suffer for sin, Job 42, 5 and 6, was not conscious of any such extraordinary act of transgression as his friends supposed he must have committed, and cannot understand why he should have been visited with such enormous afflictions both he and they are finally informed by god himself out of the whirlwind that the extraordinariness of the suffering is due to the will of god that it is of the nature of calamity not of penalty jehovah resolves the mystery in the uncommon treatment of job into an act of almighty power by an infinitely wise being who gives no reason for his procedure in this instance job chapters thirty eight to forty one elihu the youngest of the speakers seems to have had an intimation in his own mind that this was the true explanation of the dark problem i will answer thee that god is greater than man why dost thou strive against him for he giveth not account of any of his matters job thirty three twelve and thirteen two the second species of suffering is chastisement this is spoken of in hebrews twelve six for whom the lord loveth he chastiseth Pervevi, treats like a child chastisement and punishment are distinguished from each other in one corinthians eleven thirty two when we are judged we are chastened of the lord that we should not be condemned with the world the purpose of chastisement is discipline and moral improvement the reason for it is not secret and unknown as in the case of calamity it is adapted to reform it is administered by paternal affection not by judicial severity it is the form which suffering assumes within the family the parent does not cause the child to feel pain for the satisfaction of justice but for personal improvement the suffering does indeed remind the child of his guilt and is suggestive of penalty but it is not itself penal family discipline is not of the nature of retribution hence analogies drawn from the family do not apply to the civil government and still less to the divine government when guilt and retribution are the subjects under consideration guilt and retribution are not arestomi they are not family affairs the family was not established for the purpose of punishing criminals but of educating children because a human father may forgive a child that is may forego the infliction of suffering for an offence without any satisfaction being rendered for him by a substitute and without any reference to the claims of law it does not follow that the state can do this or that the supreme ruler can within the sphere of family life there is nothing judicial and retributive there is therefore no analogy between the two spheres there can be no legitimate arguing from a sphere in which the retributive element is altogether excluded such as that of the father and the child over into a sphere in which the retributive is the prime element such as that of god the just and man the guilty it is metavasis is allogenos a parent is at liberty in case he judges that in a particular instance the child will be morally the better for so doing to forego chastisement altogether he can pass by the transgression without inflicting any pain at all upon the child but the magistrate has no right to do this in the instance of crime against the state he must cause each and every transgression to receive the penalty prescribed by the statute furthermore since chastisement has no reference to crime it is not graduated by justice and the degree of the offence but by expediency and the aim to reform 
Sometimes a small fault in a child may be chastised with a severe infliction, and a great fault with a mild one. The object not being to weigh out penalty in exact proportion to crime, but to discipline and reform the character, the amount of suffering inflicted is measured by this aim and object. A very slight offence, if there is a tendency frequently to repeat it on the part of the child, may require a heavy chastisement, so that the habit may be broken up. And on the other hand, a very grave offence, which is exceptional in its nature, and to which there is no habitual tendency on the part of the child, may be best managed with a slight infliction of pain, or even with none at all. A rebuke merely may be better adapted to promote the reformation of the offender. All this is illustrated in God's dealings with his own children. A Christian of uncommon excellence to human view sometimes experiences a great affliction, while one of less devoutness apparently is only slightly afflicted, or perhaps not at all. This difference is not caused by the degree of demerit in each instance, but by what the divine eye sees to be required in each case, in order to the best development of character. Now, the relation of a believer to God is like that of the child to the earthly father. Man enters into God's heavenly family by the act of faith in Christ. All the suffering that befalls him in this sphere is therefore of the nature of chastisement, not of punishment or retribution. It is not intrinsically endless and hopeless as divine retribution is. I will visit their transgression with the rod, nevertheless my loving kindness I will not utterly take from him. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. Psalm 89, 31-34, 103-9, Jeremiah 10:24. The penalty due to the believer's sin has been endured for him by his Redeemer, and therefore there is no need of his enduring it. Justice does not exact penalty twice over. Consequently, whenever the believer suffers pain from any cause or source whatever, he is not suffering retributive punishment for purposes of law and justice, but corrective chastisement for purposes of self-discipline and spiritual improvement. Epito sumferon, Hebrews 12.10. This suffering, though for the present moment not joyous but grievous, yet after it has been submissively endured, works out the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Hebrews 12.11. Even death itself, which is the climax of suffering, is not penal for a believer. Its sting, that is, its retributive quality, is extracted. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 and 56. Suffering is penal when it is intended and felt to be such, and is chastisement when it is not so intended and felt. God intends a benefit, not a punishment, when he causes a believer in Christ to suffer the pains of disillusion, and the believer so understands it. He feels that it is fatherly discipline, when a penitent believer dies, God supports and comforts the departing soul, but when an impenitent unbeliever dies, the soul is left to itself without support and comfort from God. The tranquilizing presence of God converts death into chastisement. The absence of such a presence makes it penalty. The relation of a rebellious and unbelieving man to God is like that of a rebellious citizen to the state. All that such a citizen can expect from the government under which he lives is justice, the due reward of his disobedience. The state is not the family, and what is peculiar to the one is not to the other. The disobedient citizen cannot expect from the magistrate the patient forbearance and affectionate tuition which the disobedient child meets with from a parent with a view to his discipline and moral improvement. The citizen is entitled only to justice, and if he gets it in the form of the righteous punishment of his crime, he must be silent. No man may complain of justice or quarrel with it. To do so is an absurdity as well as a fault. By creation man was within the circle both of the divine government and the divine family. Holy Adam was at once a subject and a child. By apostasy and rebellion he threw himself out of the circle of God's family, but not out of the circle of God's government. Sinful man is invited and even commanded to re-enter the divine family when he is invited and commanded to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of his sins, but so long as he is an unbeliever he has not re-entered it and is not an affectionate or dear child of God. The phraseology in Jeremiah 31.20, Ephraim is my dear son, in Ephesians 5.1, be ye followers of God as dear children, in Romans 8, 16 and 17, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs. In Galatians 3, 26, ye are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, and in Matthew 5, 9, the peacemakers shall be called the children of God. This and the like phraseology is not applicable to men indiscriminately, but only to believers. The childhood and the fatherhood in this case is special because it is founded in redemption. 
there is a providential fatherhood and childhood spoken of in Scripture which is not sufficient to constitute fallen man a member of God's heavenly family. In Acts 17.28 all men are called the offspring of God, and in Malachi 2.10 the question is asked, Have we not all one father? This providential fatherhood and childhood is founded in creation. This is proved by a second question in Malachi 2.10, which follows the one already cited and explains it. Hath not one God created us? And in Acts 17.26, the reason given why all nations are the offspring of God is that they are made of one blood by their Creator. Creation is a kind of paternity. In Job 38.28 and 29, this is extended even to the inanimate creation. Hath the rain a father? Or who hath begotten the drops of the dew, out of whose womb came the ice? And the hoary frost of heaven, who hath gendered it? In Deuteronomy 2.27, idolatrous Israel is represented as saying to a stock, Thou art my father, and to a stone, Thou hast brought me forth. In acknowledging a false god to be their maker, they acknowledged him to be their providential father. In accordance with this, God says to a wicked generation, Whose spot is not the spot of his children, who are not dear children in the special sense, Do ye thus requite the Lord, O foolish people, and unwise? Is he not thy father that bought thee? Hath he not made thee and established thee? Deuteronomy 32.6 our Lord, Matthew 7.11, teaches that evil men have a father in heaven, and explains this fatherhood by God's readiness to bestow good things in his general providence. This association of paternity with creation and providence is found also in secular literature. Plato says that to discover the creator and father of this universe is indeed difficult. Horace speaks of the father of all who governs the affairs of men and gods. Creation, together with providence and government, which are necessarily associated with creation, is a solid basis for this kind of paternity. It implies benevolent care and kindness towards its objects, and these are paternal qualities. God's providential and governmental goodness towards all his rational creatures is often referred to in Scripture. Matthew 5.45 Your Father which is in heaven maketh his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sendeth rain upon the just and the unjust. Acts 14.17. He left not himself without witness, in that he did good, and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. The fact, then, that God creates man after his own image, a rational and immortal being, that he continually upholds him and extends to him the blessings of a kind and watchful providence, and still more that he compassionates him in his sinful and guilty condition, and provides for him a way of salvation. All this justifies the use of the term father in reference to God, and the term child in reference to man. But the fatherhood and childhood in this case are different from those of redemption and adoption. The former may exist without the latter. God, as the universal parent, while showing providential benevolence and kindness to an impenitent sinner, filling his mouth with food and gladness all the days of his earthly existence, may finally punish him for ever for his ungrateful abuse of paternal goodness, and for his transgression of moral law, and especially for his rejection of the offer of forgiveness in Christ. And this lost man is still, even in his lost condition, one of God's offspring. Abraham, speaking in the place of God, calls Dives in hell a child of the universal parent. Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good things, Luke 16.25. And Dives recognizes the relationship when he says, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, Luke 16.24. The providential fatherhood of God is thus shown to be consistent with the punishment of a rebellious son. It is also consistent with the refusal to abate the merited punishment. Dives asks for a drop of water to cool his tongue and is refused. Dives was an impenitent man. He did not confess his sin or implore its forgiveness. He only asked for deliverance from suffering. He lacked the spirit of the prodigal son and of the penitent thief. He did not say, Father, I have sinned and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. I am in this condemnation justly. I am receiving the due reward of my deeds. The universal fatherhood and childhood may exist without the special, but not the special without the universal. There may be creation, providence, and government without redemption, but not redemption without the former. A man may experience all the blessings of God's general paternity without those of his special, but not the blessings of God's special fatherhood without those of his general. Christ speaks of those who are not God's children in the special sense when he says, in reply to the assertion of the Jews, we have one father, even God, if God were your father, you would love me. Ye are of your father, the devil. John 8, 
St. John refers to the same class in the words, In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. 1 John 3.10 When men universally are commanded to say, Our Father which art in heaven, they are commanded to do so with the heart, not the lips merely. They have no permission to employ the terms of the family from the position of a rebel. Says Christ, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Luke 6.46 In like manner God says, A son honoureth his father. If I be a father, where is mine honour? Malachi 1.6 The fact of the providential fatherhood, as previously remarked, is not sufficient to constitute fallen men members of God's heavenly family. Unfallen man was a member of the heavenly family merely by the fatherhood of creation and providence, but after his rebellion and apostasy this ceased to be the case. Redemption was needed in order to restore him to membership. The whole human family are not now God's heavenly family. Only a part of it are the dear children of God. Those only are members of God's family who are members of Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth, the church above and below, is named. Ephesians 3.15 All others are bastards and not sons. Hebrews 12.8 3. The third species of suffering is punishment. This is pain inflicted because of guilt. The intention of it is the satisfaction of justice. Retributive justice is expressed in the saying, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This is the lex talionis, or law of requital. Our Lord, in the Sermon on the Mount, did not abolish this law, but placed its execution upon the proper basis. That which was addressed to the judges, says Calvin, private individuals applied to themselves, and it was this abuse which our Lord Jesus Christ would correct. The private person may not put out the eye of him who has put out an eye, but the government may. Retribution is not the function of the individual, it belongs to God, and to the government which is ordained of God. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Romans 12.19 This retributive function is delegated by God to the magistrate, for he is the minister of God, an avenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Romans 13.4 when the private individual takes the lex talionis into his own hands, it is revenge. Christ forbade this. When God or the government administers it, it is vengeance. Christ did not forbid this. The former is selfish and wrong, the latter is dispassionate and right. That particular amount and kind of suffering which is required by the law of requital is punishment. Its primary aim is the satisfaction of justice, not utility to the criminal. The criminal is sacrificed to justice, his private interest is subservient to that of law and government, because the latter is of more importance than the former. Even if he derives no personal benefit from the retribution which he experiences, the one sufficient reason for it still holds good, namely, that he has voluntarily transgressed and deserves to suffer for it. Both the quantity and the quality of the suffering must be considered in order to penalty. A. In the first place, the amount of the suffering must be proportionate to the offence. To take human life for a petty larceny would be unjust. To take money as an offset for murder would be unjust. B. In the second place, suffering must be intended as penal and felt to be penal, in order to be penal. It must have this retributive quality. Two men might suffer from God precisely the same amount of suffering, and in one case it might be retribution, and in the other chastisement, because in the one case his intention was the satisfaction of law, in the other the correction of his child. Physical death, in the case of a wicked man, is penal evil, because it is designed as a punishment on the part of God, and is felt to be such by the man. God grants no comfort to the wicked in his death, the sting is not extracted, and death is remorseful and punitive. But the very same event of death and the same suffering in amount is chastisement and not punishment for a believer, because it is accompanied with inward strength from God to endure it, and is known to be the means of entrance into heaven. The sufferings of Christ the Mediator were vicariously penal or atoning because the intention, both on the part of the Father and the Son, was that they should satisfy justice for the sin of man. They were not calamity, for their object is known. The reason for calamitous suffering is secret. And they were not disciplinary, because Christ, having no sin, could not pass through a process of progressive sanctification. Scripture plainly teaches that our Lord's sufferings were vicariously retributive, that is, that they were endured for the purpose of satisfying justice in the place of the actual transgressor. 1 Peter 3.18 Christ hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Galatians 3.13 Christ was made a curse for us. Isaiah 53.5 Emmanuel was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. 
Romans 4.25, Jesus our Lord was delivered for our offences. 2 Corinthians 5.21, He hath made him to be sin, a sin offering, for us, who knew no sin. 1 John 2.2, 2, He is the propitiation for our sins. John 1.29, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Romans 8.32, He spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all. With this compare 2 Peter 2.4, he spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell. Penalty in the case of Christ was vicarious, in that of the fallen angels was personal. The penal and atoning sufferings of Christ were twofold. A. Ordinary. B. Extraordinary. The first came upon him by virtue of his human nature. He hungered, thirsted, was weary in body, was sad and grieved in mind by the operation of the natural laws of matter and mind. All that Christ endured by virtue of his being born of a woman, being made under the law, living a human life, and dying a violent death, belongs to this class. The extraordinary sufferings in Christ's experience came upon him by virtue of a positive act and infliction on the part of God. To these belong also all those temptations by Satan which exceeded in their force the common temptations incident to ordinary human life. Through these Christ was caused to suffer more severely than any of his disciples have, and that this was an intentional and preconceived infliction on the part of God for the purpose of causing the sinner's substitute to endure a judicial suffering is proved by the statement that Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, Matthew 4.1. These severe temptations from Satan occurred more than once. The devil departed from him for a season, Luke 4.13. But still more extraordinary was that suffering which was caused in the soul of Christ by the immediate agency of God, in the garden and on the cross, that agony which forced the blood through the pores of the skin, and wrung from the patient and mighty heart of the God-man the cry, My God, why hast thou forsaken me, cannot be explained by the operation of natural laws. There was positive desertion and infliction on the part of God. The human nature was forsaken, as the words of Christ imply. That support and comfort which the humanity had enjoyed, in greater or less degree, during the life of the God-man upon earth, was now withdrawn utterly and entirely. One consequence of this was that the physical suffering involved in the crucifixion was unmitigated. Christ had no such support as his confessors have always had in the hour of martyrdom. But this was the least severe part of Christ's extraordinary suffering. The pain from the death of crucifixion was physical only. There was, over and above this, a mental distress that was far greater. This is indicated in the terms employed to describe the spiritual condition of Christ's soul in the so-called agony in the garden. He began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy, and saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Mark 14.33 and 34. The words, Ek lamviste and ademonin imply a species of mental distress that stuns and bewilders. This mental suffering cannot be explained upon ordinary psychological principles, but must be referred to a positive act of God. Christ was sinless and perfect. His inward distress did not result from the workings of a guilty conscience. The agony in the garden and on the cross was not that of remorse, though it was equal to it. Neither was it the agony of despair, though it was equal to it. Footnote. Christ felt that he was forsaken of God, but not, like a despairing person, that he was eternally forsaken. The desertion was only temporary. The comforting presence of God returns to Christ, as is indicated in the statement of Luke 23.46, that Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Again, the agony of Christ was not despair, because in this very cry he says, My God. A despairing man or angel would say, O God and would not expostulate, saying, Why hast thou forsaken me? Again, Christ did not experience despair, because he knew that the union between the divine and human natures was indissoluble. He also knew that the covenant of redemption between him and the Father could not fail. His distress did not relate to either of these two particulars. It arose, a, from his view of the nature of the curse upon sin which he had vicariously come under b. because the comforting influences from the union of the divine with the human nature were temporarily restrained, c. from the temporary desertion of God, d. from positive infliction when the sword was awakened against him. Owen, Third Sacramental Discourse. The words, Why hast thou forsaken me, express wonder, not ignorance or unbelief or complaint. Christ well knew why he was deserted at this hour, had perfect faith and confidence in his Father, and was entirely submissive to his will. 
but he was amazed and paralyzed at the immensity of the agony why is not interrogative but exclamatory the words are equivalent to how thou hast forsaken me this is hughes and victor's explanation see hooker five forty eight when a christian exclaims why am i so unbelieving and sinful it is only another way of saying how unbelieving and sinful i am he is not asking for information he well knows the reason why End footnote. the positive agency of god in causing a particular kind of suffering to befall the mediator which could not have befallen him by the operation of natural causes is spoken of in isaiah fifty three five six and ten he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all it pleased the lord to bruise him and again in zechariah thirteen seven awake o sword against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow saith the lord of hosts smite the shepherd this language teaches that the incarnate second person of the trinity received upon himself a stroke inflicted by the positive act of another divine person the son of god was bruised wounded and smitten by god the father as the officer and agent of divine justice and the effects of it appear in that extraordinary mental distress which the mediator exhibited particularly during the last hours of his earthly life while he was buffeted scourged and nailed to the cross we hear nothing from him but like a lamb before the shearers he was dumb but when god reached forth his hand and darted his immediate rebukes into his very soul and spirit then he cries out my god my god why hast thou forsaken me the nature of this suffering is inexplicable because it has no parallel in human consciousness the other forms of christ's suffering are intelligible because they were like those of men thirst hunger weariness grief at the death of a friend were the same in christ that they are in us but that strange and unique experience which uttered itself in the cry my god why hast thou forsaken me belongs to the consciousness of the god man only he who occupied the actual position of the sinner's substitute can experience such a judicial stroke from eternal justice and only he can know the peculiarity of the suffering which it produces suffering is a form of consciousness and consciousness can be known only by the possessor of it there are some particulars respecting this positive infliction upon the messiah which must be carefully noted one though the father smote wounded and bruised the son he felt no emotional anger towards the person of the son the emotional wrath of god is revealed only against personal unrighteousness and christ was holy harmless undefiled and separate from sinners the father smote his beloved son in whom he was well pleased matthew three seventeen at the very instant when the father forsook the son he loved him emotionally and personally with the same infinite affection with which he had loved him before the world was when it is said that christ experienced the wrath of god the meaning is that he experienced a judicial suffering caused by god the wrath of god in this instance is not a divine emotion but a divine act by which god the father caused pain in jesus christ for a particular purpose this purpose is judicial and penal and therefore the act may be called an act of wrath ira dei est voluntas puniendi anselm cua deus homo one six in romans thirteen four the infliction of suffering by the magistrate upon the criminal is denominated an act of wrath he is the minister of wrath but the magistrate has no emotional anger towards the criminal god the father could love the son therefore at the very instant when he visited him with this punitive act his emotion might be love while his act was wrath nay his love might be drawn forth by this very willingness of the son to suffer vicariously for the salvation of man we do not admit says calvin that god was ever hostile or emotionally angry with him for how could he be angry with his beloved son in whom his soul delighted or how could christ by his intercession appease the father for others if the father were incensed against him but we affirm that he sustained the weight of the divine severity since being smitten and afflicted of god he experienced from god all the tokens of wrath and vengeance says witsius to be the beloved son of god and at the same time to suffer the wrath of god are not such contrary things as that they cannot stand together for as son as the holy one while obeying the father in all things he was always the beloved and indeed most of all when obedient to the death of the cross for that was so pleasing to the father that on account of it he raised him to the highest pitch of exaltation philippians two nine though as charged with our sins he felt the wrath of god burning not against himself but against our sins which he took upon himself two 
secondly the son of god understands the judicial infliction which he undergoes in this sense god the son knows that the blow which he experienced from god the father is not for sin which he has himself committed the transaction between the two divine persons is of the nature of a covenant between them the son agrees to submit his person incarnate to a penal infliction that is required by the attribute of justice but this attribute is as much an attribute of the son as it is of the father the second trinitarian person is as much concerned for the maintenance of law as is the first the son of god is not seized an unwilling victim and offered to justice by the father the son himself is willing and desires to suffer i have he says a baptism to be baptized with and how i am straitened till it be accomplished luke twelve seventy this explains the fact that christ everywhere represents himself as voluntarily giving up his life no man taketh my life from me i lay it down of myself john ten eighteen in some instances he employs his miraculous power to prevent his life from being taken because his hour was not yet come but when the hour had come though in the full consciousness that twelve legions of angels were at his command he suffers himself to be seized by a handful of men to be bound and to be nailed to a cross so far as the feature of mere voluntariness is concerned no suicide was ever more voluntary in the manner of his death than was jesus christ a distinction is made between christ's active and passive obedience the latter denotes christ's sufferings of every kind the sum total of the sorrow and pain which he endured in his estate of humiliation the term passive is used etymologically his suffering is denominated obedience because it came by reason of his submission to the conditions under which he voluntarily placed himself when he consented to be the sinner's substitute he vicariously submitted to the sentence the soul that sinneth it shall die and was obedient unto death philippians two eight christ's passive or suffering obedience is not to be confined to what he experienced in the garden and on the cross this suffering was the culmination of his piacular sorrow but not the whole of it everything in his human and earthly career that was distressing belongs to his passive obedience it is a true remark of edwards that the blood of christ's circumcision was as really a part of his vicarious atonement as the blood that flowed from his pierced side and not only his suffering proper but his humiliation also was expiatory because this was a kind of suffering says edwards the satisfaction or propitiation of christ consists either in his suffering evil or his being subject to abasement thus christ made satisfaction for sin by continuing under the power of death while he lay buried in the grave though neither his body nor soul properly endured any suffering after he was dead whatever christ was subject to that was the judicial fruit of sin had the nature of satisfaction for sin but not only proper suffering but all abasement and depression of the state and circumstances of mankind human nature below its primitive honour and dignity such as his body remaining under death and body and soul remaining separate and other things that might be mentioned are the judicial fruits of sin christ's active obedience is his perfect performance of the requirements of the moral law he obeyed this law in heart and in conduct without a single slip or failure he was wholly harmless and undefiled hebrews seven twenty six some theologians confine christ's atonement to his passive obedience in such sense that his active obedience does not enter into it and make a part of it footnote piscata was the first formally to present this view john taylor of norwich went to an opposite extreme and held that the active obedience was the sole cause of man's salvation he denied any piacular effect of christ's death and held that as a reward of christ's active obedience alone the remission of sin was given to man as the eminent services of a soldier are rewarded by the monarch by benefits to his family End footnote. since atonement consists in suffering and since obedience to the divine law is not suffering but happiness they contend that christ's active obedience cannot contribute anything that is strictly piacular or atoning this would be true in reference to the active obedience of a mere creature but not in reference to the active obedience of the god-man it is no humiliation for a created being to be a citizen of the divine government to be made under the law and to be required to obey it but it is humiliation for the son of god to be so made and to be so required to obey it is stooping down when the ruler of the universe becomes a subject and renders obedience to a superior in so far as christ's active obedience was an element in his humiliation it was an element also in his expiation consequently we must say that both the active and the passive obedience enter into the sum total of christ's atoning work
christ's humiliation confessedly was atoning and his obedience of the law was a part of his humiliation the two forms of christ's obedience cannot therefore be so entirely separated from each other as is implied in this theory which confines the piacular agency of the mediator to his passive obedience but while there is this atoning element in christ's active obedience it is yet true that the principal reference of the active obedience is to the law as precept rather than to the law as penalty it is more meritorious of reward than it is piacular of guilt the chief function of christ's obedience of the moral law is to earn a title for the believer to the rewards of heaven this part of christ's agency is necessary because merely to atone for past transgression would not be a complete salvation it would indeed save man from hell but it would not introduce him into heaven he would be delivered from the law's punishment but would not be entitled to the law's reward the man which doeth the things of the law shall live by them romans ten five mere innocence is not entitled to a reward obedience is requisite in order to this adam was not meritorious until he had obeyed the commandment do this before he could enter into life he must keep the commandment like every subject of the divine government and candidate for heavenly reward the mediator therefore must not only suffer for man but must obey for him if he would do for man everything that the law requires accordingly christ is said to be made of god unto the believer wisdom and sanctification as well as righteousness and redemption one corinthians one thirty believers are described as complete in christ colossians one ten that is they are entitled to eternal blessedness as well as delivered from eternal misery christ is said to be the end delos of the law for righteousness to every one that believeth romans ten four this means that christ completely fulfills the law for the believer but the law requires obedience to its precept as well as endurance of its penalty complete righteousness is conformity to the law in both respects romans five nineteen by his obedience shall many be made righteous isaiah fifty three eleven by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many jeremiah twenty three six the lord our righteousness jeremiah forty five twenty four in the lord have i righteousness romans eight four philippians three nine two corinthians five twenty one the imputation of christ's active obedience is necessary also in order to hope and confidence respecting the endless future if the believer founds his expectation of an eternity of blessedness upon the amount of obedience which he has himself rendered to the law and the degree of holiness which he has personally attained here upon earth he is filled with doubt and fear respecting the final recompense he knows that he has not by his own work earned and merited such an infinite reward as glory honour and immortality we cannot by our best works merit eternal life at the hand of god by reason of the great disproportion between them and the glory to come westminster confession sixteen five but if he founds this title to eternal life and his expectation of it upon the obedience of christ for him his anxiety disappears a distinction is made by some theologians between satisfaction and atonement christ's satisfaction is his fulfilling the law both as precept and penalty christ's atonement as antithetic to satisfaction includes only what christ does to fulfill the law as penalty according to this distinction christ's atonement would be a part of his satisfaction the objections to this mode of distinguishing are a satisfaction is better fitted to denote christ's piacular work than his whole work of redemption in theological literature it is more commonly the synonym of atonement b by this distinction atonement may be made to rest upon the passive obedience alone to the exclusion of the active this will depend upon whether obedience is employed in the comprehensive sense of including all that christ underwent in his state of humiliation both in obeying and suffering another distinction is made by some between satisfaction and merit in this case satisfaction is employed in a restricted signification it denotes the satisfaction of retributive justice and has respect to the law as penalty thus employed the term is equivalent to atonement merit as antithetic to satisfaction has respect to the law as precept and is founded upon christ's active obedience christ vicariously obeys the law and so vicariously merits for the believer the reward of eternal life respecting this distinction Puritan remarks that the two things are not to be separated from each other we are not to say as some do that the satisfaction is by the passive work of christ alone and the merit is by the active work alone the satisfaction and the merit are not to be thus viewed in isolation each by itself 
because the benefit in each depends upon the total work of christ for sin cannot be expiated until the law as precept has been perfectly fulfilled nor can a title to eternal life be merited before the guilt of sin has been atoned for meruit ergo satisfaciendo et merendo satisfeciat there is some ambiguity in this distinction also the term merit is often applied to christ's passive obedience as well as to his active the merit of christ's blood is a familiar phrase the mediator was meritorious in reference to the law's penalty as well as to the law's precept footnote owen justification chapter ten endorses the distinction as made by grotius whereas we have said that christ hath procured two things for us freedom from punishment and a reward the ancient church attributes the one of them to his satisfaction the other to his merit edwards adopts it whatever in christ had the nature of satisfaction it was by virtue of the suffering or humiliation in it but whatever had the nature of merit it was by virtue of the obedience or righteousness that was in it redemption works one four hundred and two in footnote vicarious atonement part three having thus considered the nature of atonement and the sufferings of the mediator as constituting it we proceed to notice some further characteristics of it one in the first place atonement is correlated to justice not to benevolence some have maintained that retributive justice is a phase of benevolence they would reduce all the moral attributes to one ultimately namely the divine love this theory is built upon the text god is love but there are texts affirming that god is light 1 john 1 5 and that god is a consuming fire hebrews 12 29 the affirmation holy 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 is the lord of hosts isaiah 6 3 is equivalent to god is holiness upon the strength of these texts it might be contended that all the divine attributes may be reduced to that of wisdom or of justice or of holiness the true view is that each of the attributes stands side by side with all the others and cannot be merged and lost in any other justice is no more a phase of benevolence than benevolence is a phase of justice each attribute has a certain distinctive characteristic which does not belong to the others and by which it is a different attribute the fact that one divine attribute affects and influences another does not convert one into another omnipotence acts wisely but this does not prove that omnipotence is a mode of wisdom god's justice acts benevolently not malevolently but this does not prove that justice is a mode of benevolence god's benevolence acts justly not unjustly but this does not prove that benevolence is a mode of justice the divine attributes do not find a centre of unity in any one of their own number but in the divine essence it is the divine nature itself not the divine attribute of love or any other attribute in which they all inhere accordingly the atoning sufferings and death of christ are related to the attribute of justice rather than to any other one of the divine attributes they manifest and exhibit other attributes such as wisdom omnipotence benevolence and compassion nay all the other attributes but they are an atonement only for retributive justice christ's death does not propitiate or satisfy god's benevolence nor his wisdom nor his omnipotence but it satisfies his justice atonement cannot be correlated to benevolence any more than creation can be correlated to omniscience it is true that the creation of the world supposes omniscience but creation is an act of power rather than of knowledge and is therefore referred to omnipotence rather than to omniscience in like manner christ's atonement supposes benevolence in god but benevolence is not the particular attribute that requires the atonement it is retributive justice that demands the punishment of sin if there were in god mere and isolated benevolence there would be neither personal nor vicarious punishment just as there would be no creation if there were in god mere and isolated omniscience benevolence alone and wholly disconnected from justice would not cause pain but pleasure it would relieve from suffering instead of inflicting it st paul in romans five seven teaches the diversity between the attribute of justice and that of benevolence in saying that scarcely for a just man will one die yet peradventure for a benevolent man some would even dare to die two secondly an atonement for sin of one kind or the other if not personal then vicarious is necessary not optional the transgressor must either die himself or someone must die for him 
this arises from the nature of that divine attribute to which atonement is a correlate retributive justice we have seen is necessary in its operation the claim of law upon the transgressor for punishment is absolute and indefeasible the eternal judge may or may not exercise mercy but he must exercise justice he can neither waive the claim of law in part nor abolish them altogether the only possible mode consequently of delivering a creature who is obnoxious to the demands of retributive justice is to satisfy them for him the claims themselves must be met and extinguished either personally or by substitution fiat justitia ruet coelum and this necessity of an atonement is absolute not relative it is not made necessary by divine decision in the sense that the divine decision might have been otherwise it is not correct to say that god might have saved man without a vicarious atonement had he been pleased so to do for this is equivalent to saying that god might have abolished the claims of law and justice had he been pleased to do so three in the third place an atonement either personal or vicarious when made naturally and necessarily cancels legal claims this means that there is such a natural and necessary correlation between vicarious atonement and justice that the former supplies all that is required by the latter it does not mean that christ's vicarious atonement naturally and necessarily saves every man because the relation of christ's atonement to divine justice is one thing but the relation of a particular person to christ's atonement is a very different thing christ's death as related to the claims of the law upon all mankind cancels those claims wholly it is an infinite propitiation for the sins of the whole world one john two two but the relation of an impenitent person to this atonement is that of unbelief and rejection of it consequently what the atonement has effected objectively in reference to the attribute of divine justice is not effected subjectively in the conscience of the individual there is an infinite satisfaction that naturally and necessarily cancels legal claims but unbelief derives no benefit from that fact in like manner a personal atonement naturally and necessarily cancels legal claims when the prescribed human penalty has been personally endured by the criminal human justice is satisfied and there are no more outstanding claims upon him and this by reason of the essential nature of justice justice insists upon nothing but what is due and when it obtains this it shows its righteousness in not requiring anything further as it does in not accepting anything less consequently personal atonement operates inevitably and we might almost say mechanically if a criminal suffers the penalty affixed to his crime he owes nothing more in the way of penalty to the law he cannot be punished a second time law and justice cannot now touch him so far as this particular crime and this particular penalty are concerned it would be unjust to cause him the least jot or tittle of further retributive suffering for that crime which by the supposition he has personally atoned for the law now owes him immunity from suffering anything more it is not grace in the law not to punish him any further but it is debt the law itself is under obligation not to punish a criminal who has once been punished st paul says respecting grace and debt in the case of active obedience that to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt otherwise work is no more work romans four four eleven six in like manner it may be said that to him who atones for sin the legal consequence of atonement is not reckoned of grace but of debt otherwise atonement is no more atonement this reasoning applies to vicarious atonement equally with personal justice does not require a second sacrifice from christ in addition to the first christ was once offered to bear the sins of many hebrews ten twenty eight this one offering expiated the sins of the whole world and justice is completely satisfied in reference to them the death of the god-man naturally and necessarily cancelled all legal claims when a particular person trusts in this infinite atonement and it is imputed to him by god it then becomes his atonement for judicial purposes as really as if he had made it himself and then it naturally and necessarily cancels his personal guilt and he has the testimony that it does in his peace of conscience divine justice does not in this case require an additional atonement from the believer it does not demand penal suffering from a person for whom a divine substitute has rendered a full satisfaction which justice itself has accepted in reference to this very person by accepting a vicarious atonement for a particular individual the divine justice precludes itself from requiring a personal atonement from him
Accordingly, Scripture represents the non-infliction of penalty upon the believer in Christ's atonement as an act of justice to Christ, and also to the believer viewed as one with Christ. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. 1 John 1 9. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Romans 8, 33 and 34. The atoning mediator can demand upon principles of strict justice the release from penalty of any sinful man in respect to whom he makes the demand. And if in such a case we should suppose the demand to be refused by eternal justice, we should suppose a case in which eternal justice is unjust. For by the supposition justice has inflicted upon the mediator the full penalty due to the sinner, and then refuses to the mediator that release of this sinner from penalty which the mediator has earned by his own suffering, and which is now absolutely due to him as the reward of his suffering. It is, says Edwards, so ordered that the glory of the attribute of divine justice requires the salvation of those that believe. The justice of God, that irrespective of Christ's atonement, required man's damnation, and seemed inconsistent with his salvation, now, having respect to Christ's atonement, as much requires the salvation of those that believe in Christ as ever before it required their damnation. Salvation is an absolute debt to the believer from God, so that he may in justice demand it on the ground of what his surety has done. See also Edwards, God's Sovereignty, Works 4, 5 two. 2 Similarly, Anselm asks, Can anything be more just than for God to remit all debt, when in the sufferings of the God-man he receives a satisfaction greater than all the debt? Says Ezekiel Hopkins, The pardon of sin is not merely an act of mercy, but also an act of justice. What abundant cause of comfort may this be to all believers, that God's justice as well as his mercy shall acquit them, that that attribute of God, at the apprehension of which they are wont to tremble, should interpose in their behalf and plead for them. And yet, through the all-sufficient expiation and atonement that Christ hath made for our sins, this mystery is effected, and justice itself brought over, from being a formidable adversary, to be of a party and to plead for us. Shed Theological Essays 310-316 it may be asked, if atonement naturally and necessarily cancels guilt, why does not the vicarious atonement of Christ save all men indiscriminately, as the universalist contends? The substituted suffering of Christ being infinite is equal in value to the personal suffering of all mankind. Why then are not all men upon the same footing and in the class of the saved by virtue of it? The answer is because it is a natural impossibility. Vicarious atonement without faith in it is powerless to save. It is not the making of this atonement, but the trusting in it, that saves the sinner. By faith are ye saved. He that believeth shall be saved. Ephesians 2.8, Mark 16.16 16. The making of this atonement merely satisfies the legal claims, and this is all that it does. If it were made, but never imputed and appropriated, it would result in no salvation. A substituted satisfaction of justice without an act of trust in it would be useless to sinners. It is as naturally impossible that Christ's death should save from punishment one who does not confide in it, as that a loaf of bread should save from starvation a man who does not eat it. The assertion that because the atonement of Christ is sufficient for all men, therefore no men are lost, is as absurd as the assertion that because the grain produced in the year 1880 was sufficient to support the life of all men on the globe, therefore no men died of starvation during that year. The mere fact that Jesus Christ made satisfaction for human sin, alone and of itself, will save no soul. Christ conceivably might have died precisely as he did, and his death have been just as valuable for expiatory purposes as it is, but if his death had not been followed with the work of the Holy Ghost and the act of faith on the part of individual men, he would have died in vain. Unless his objective work is subjectively appropriated, it is useless so far as personal salvation is concerned. Christ's suffering is sufficient to cancel the guilt of all men, and in its own nature completely satisfies the broken law. But all men do not make it their own atonement by faith in it. By pleading the merit of it in prayer and mentioning it as the reason and ground of their pardon, they do not regard and use it as their own possession and blessing. It is nothing for them but a historical fact. In this state of things, the atonement of Christ is powerless to save. It remains in the possession of Christ who made it, and has not been transferred to the individual. In the scripture phrase it has not been imputed. 
there may be a sum of money in the hands of a rich man that is sufficient in amount to pay the debt of millions of debtors but unless they individually take money from his hands into their own they cannot pay their debts with it there must be a personal act of each debtor in order that this money on deposit may actually extinguish individual indebtedness should one of the debtors when payment is demanded of him merely say that there is an abundance of money on deposit but take no steps himself to get it and pay it to his creditor he would be told that an undrawn deposit is not a payment of a debt the act of god says owen in laying our sins on christ conveyed no title to us to what christ did and suffered this doing and suffering is not immediately by virtue thereof ours or esteemed ours because god hath appointed something else namely faith not only antecedent thereto but as the means of it the supposition that the objective satisfaction of justice by christ saves of and by itself without any application of it by the holy spirit and any trust in it by the individual man overlooks the fact that while sin has a resemblance to a pecuniary debt as is taught in the petition forgiveth our debts it differs from it in two important particulars a in the instance of pecuniary indebtedness there is no need of a consent and arrangement on the part of the creditor when there is a vicarious payment any person may step up and discharge a money obligation for a debtor and the obligation ceases ipso facto but in the instance of moral indebtedness to justice or guilt there must be a consent of the creditor namely the judge before there can be a substitution of payment should the supreme judge refuse to permit another person to suffer for the sinner and compel him to suffer for his own sin this would be just consequently substitution in the case of moral penalty requires a consent and covenant on the part of god with conditions and limitations while substitution in the case of a pecuniary debt requires no consent covenant or limitations b secondly after the vicarious atonement has been permitted and provided there is still another condition in the case namely that the sinner shall confess and repent of the sin for which the atonement was made and trust in the atonement itself another error underlying the varieties of universalism is the assumption that because an atonement sufficient for all men has been made all men are entitled to the benefits of it this would be true if all men had made this atonement but inasmuch as they had nothing to do with the making of it they have not the slightest right or title to it no sinner has a claim upon the expiatory oblation of jesus christ it belongs entirely to the maker and, and he may do what he will with his own he may impute it to any man whom he pleases and not impute it to any man whom he pleases romans nine eighteen even the act of faith does not by its intrinsic merit entitle the believer to the benefits of christ's satisfaction this would make salvation a debt which the redeemer owes because of an act of the believer it is only because christ has promised and thereby bound himself to bestow the benefits of redemption upon every one that believeth that salvation is certain to faith it is objected that it is unjust to exact personal penalty from any individuals of the human race if a vicarious penalty equal in value to that due from the whole race has been paid to justice the injustice alleged in this objection may mean injustice towards the individual believer who is personally punished or it may mean injustice in regard to what the divine law is entitled to on account of man's sin an examination will show that there is no injustice done in either respect a when an individual believer is personally punished for his own sins he receives what he deserves and there is no injustice in this the fact that a vicarious atonement has been made that is sufficient to expiate his sins does not a stop justice from punishing him personally for them unless it can be shown that he is the author of the vicarious atonement if this were so then indeed he might complain of the personal satisfaction that is required of him in this case one and the same party would make satisfaction for one and the same sin one vicarious and one personal when therefore an individual believer suffers for his own sin he receives the due reward of his deeds luke twenty three twenty four and since he did not make the vicarious atonement for the sins of the whole world and therefore has no more right or title to it or any of its benefits than an inhabitant of saturn he cannot claim exemption from personal penalty on the ground of it says owen the satisfaction of christ made for sin being not made by the sinner there must of necessity be a rule order and law constitution how the sinner may come to be interested in it and made partaker of it for the consequent of the freedom of one by the sacrifice of another is not natural or necessary but must proceed and arise from a law constitution compact and agreement now the way constituted and appointed is that of faith as explained in the scriptures 
if men believe not they are no less liable to the punishment due to their sins than if no satisfaction at all were made for sinners b the other injustice alleged in the objection relates to the divine law and government it is urged that when the believer is personally punished after an infinite vicarious satisfaction for human sin has been made justice in this case gets more than its dues which is as unjust as to get less this is a mathematical objection and must receive a mathematical answer the alleged excess in the case is like the addition of a finite number to infinity which is no increase the everlasting suffering of all mankind and still more of only a part is a finite suffering neither the sufferer nor the duration is mathematically infinite for the duration begins though it does not end but the suffering of the god-man is mathematically infinite because his person is absolutely infinite when therefore any amount of finite human suffering is added to the infinite suffering of the god-man it is no increase of value justice mathematically gets no more penalty when the suffering of lost men is added to that of jesus christ than it would without this addition the law is more magnified and honoured by the suffering of incarnate god than it would be by the suffering of all men individually because its demand for a strictly infinite satisfaction for a strictly infinite evil is more completely met in this sense where sin abounded grace did much more abound romans five twenty it is for this reason that finite numbers small or great are of no consequence when the value of christ's oblation is under consideration one sinner needs the whole infinite christ and his whole sacrifice because of the infinite guilt of his sin and a million of sinners need the same sacrifice and no more the guilt of one man in relation to god is infinite and the infinite sacrifice of christ cancels it the guilt of a million of men is infinite not however because a million is a larger number than one but because of the relation of sin to god and the one infinite sacrifice of christ cancels it if only one man were to be saved christ must suffer and die precisely as he has and if the human race were tenfold more numerous than it is his death would be ample for their salvation an infinite satisfaction meets and cancels infinite guilt whether there be one man or millions four fourthly the vicarious satisfaction of justice is a mode or form of mercy it is so because it unites and harmonizes the two divine attributes in one divine act namely the suffering of incarnate deity for human guilt when the supreme judge substitutes himself for the criminal his own mercy satisfies his own justice for the transgressor this single act is therefore both an exercise of mercy and an exercise of justice it is certainly mercy to suffer for the sinner and it is certainly justice to suffer the full penalty which he deserves the personal satisfaction of justice on the contrary is not a mode or form of mercy because in this case the supreme judge inflicts the suffering required by the violated law upon the criminal himself personal satisfaction of justice is justice without mercy it is the severity spoken of by st paul in romans eleven twenty two vicarious atonement is both evangelical and legal gospel with law personal atonement is merely legal law without gospel the former is complex both merciful and just the latter is simple just not merciful in the legal sphere of ethics and natural religion where personal satisfaction rules justice and mercy are entirely separated attributes unblended and unharmonized justice obstructs the exercise of mercy by presenting its unsatisfied claims and mercy stands silent by there is no eye to pity and no arm to save isaiah fifty nine sixteen sixty three five but in the evangelical sphere of revealed religion the two attributes are united and harmonized mercy and truth meet together righteousness and peace kiss each other psalm eighty five ten divine mercy now satisfies divine justice and divine justice accepts the satisfaction the mercy is now infinitely just and the justice is now infinitely merciful the two coordinate and distinct attributes which outside of the gospel and apart from the incarnation are separate the one forbidding the exercise of the other are now blended the one meeting all the demands of the other and both concurring in the salvation of the guilty sinner for whose advantage all this costly sacrifice is made by the adorable trinity five fifthly the vicarious satisfaction of justice is the highest mode or form of mercy because it is mercy in the form of self-sacrifice a comparison of the different modes of the divine mercy will show this when the creator bestows temporal blessings in his providence upon the sinner when he makes his rain to fall and his sun to shine upon him there is a form of mercy greatly inferior to that shown in christ's atonement 
there is no loss on the part of the giver involved in the gifts of providence they do not cost the deity any sacrifice again should we conceive it possible for god to waive the claims of law by a word and to inflict no penal suffering upon either the sinner or a substitute this would be a lower form of mercy than that of vicarious atonement for the same reason as in the previous instance there is no suffering and no death undergone in the manifestation of such a species of compassion this would be the easiest and cheapest of all methods of deliverance from punishment again should we conceive of god in the exercise of ownership and sovereignty as taking one of his creatures say an archangel and making him a vicarious substitute for man this too would be a low species of mercy and for the same reason as in the previous cases it involves no self-sacrifice upon the part of god the transaction does not affect anything in the divine essence there is no humiliation and no suffering of god incarnate but when justice is satisfied for man by the extraordinary means of substituting god for man by the method of incarnating humiliating and crucifying a person of the trinity we see the highest conceivable form of divine compassion and pity it is so strange and stupendous that it requires very high testimony and proof to make it credible the vicarious satisfaction of justice is then the highest form of mercy because a the offended party permits a substitution of penalty b the offended party provides the substitute and c the offended party substitutes himself for the offender the infinite and eternal judge allows prepares and is a substitute for the criminal how hast thou loved us says augustine for whom he that thought it no robbery to be equal with thee was made subject even to the death of the cross for us both victor and victim and victor because victim for us both priest and sacrifice and priest because sacrifice aquinas remarks of the self-sacrificing pity of god miseria cordia non tolit justitiam sed quandam justitiae plenitudo est similarly vesse describes the vicarious atonement in the words ipse deus ipse sacerdos ipse hostia prose vesse sibi satisfecit pascal expresses the same truth in the remark that in the christian redemption the judge himself is the sacrifice and livingstone cries from the heart of africa what is the atonement of christ it is himself it is the inherent and everlasting mercy of god made apparent to human eyes and ears the everlasting love was disclosed by our lord's life and death it shows that god forgives because he loves to forgive he works by smiles if possible if not by frowns pain is only a means of enforcing love in this fact that the vicarious satisfaction of justice is self-sacrificing mercy we have the answer to the objection that if justice is satisfied there is no exhibition of mercy there would be none if the satisfaction were made personally by the sinner but when it is made vicariously by the eternal judge himself it is the acme of mercy and compassion says the westminster larger catechism question seventy one although christ by his obedience and death did make a full satisfaction to god's justice in the behalf of them that are justified yet inasmuch as god accepteth the satisfaction from a surety which he might have demanded of them and did provide this surety their justification is to them of free grace this truth is made still more evident by remarking the distinction between mercy and indulgence the first is founded in principle the latter is unprincipled mercy has a moral basis it is good ethics indulgence has no moral foundation it is bad ethics indulgence is foolish good nature it releases from punishment without making any provision for the claims of law its motive is sensuous not rational it suffers itself from the sight of suffering and this is the reason why it does not inflict it it costs an effort to be just and it does not like to put forth an effort indulgence in the last analysis is intensely selfish mere happiness in the sense of freedom from discomfort or pain is the final end which it has in view consequently the action of indulgence as distinguished from mercy is high-handed it is the exercise of bare power in snatching the criminal away from merited suffering it is might not right a mob exercises indulgence when it breaks open a prison and drags away the criminal merely because the criminal is suffering no member of this mob would take the criminal's place and suffer in his stead this would be real mercy and mercy in its highest form of vicarious satisfaction should god deliver man from the claims of law without the substitution of penalty it would be a procedure the same in principle with that of the mob in the case supposed it would be indulgence not mercy 
In Romans 3.25, indulgence in distinction from mercy is referred to. St. Paul mentions as a secondary reason why Christ was set forth as a propitiation for sin the fact that in the past history of the sinful world of mankind God had been indulgent towards those who deserved immediate and swift retribution. He had passed by and omitted to punish. Instead of inflicting penalty, he had bestowed rain and fruitful seasons upon rebellious men and had filled their hearts with food and gladness. He had suffered, Iase, all nations to walk in their own ways and had winked at that is overlooked uberidon the times of this ignorance acts fourteen sixteen seventeen and seventeen thirty st paul does not designate this indulgent treatment of sinful men by charis the usual and proper term for forgiving mercy but by anoche it is not mercy but forbearance it is in itself irregular and requires to be legitimated and it is explained and set right by the piacular offering of the Son of God, because the vicarious atonement of Christ is sufficient to atone for the sins of the whole world. Therefore it is that the sins of the whole world experience the forbearance of the Holy One. Therefore it is that the whole world receives many temporal blessings instead of swift retribution, because it is that God overlooks the times of guilty ignorance and disobedience and delays punishment this pretermission of transgressions differs from their remission in being only temporary this forbearance even though explained and legitimated by the propitiation of christ is not to be eternal justice will finally assert its claims and those whose unrepented transgressions have met with this temporary indulgence and delay of punishment on account of christ's atonement will in the end receive the just punishment of sin st paul in this passage does not say that these sins had been eternally pardoned by divine grace charis, but had been only temporarily passed by through divine forbearance anoeg. six in the sixth place the vicarious satisfaction of justice is the only mode of exercising mercy that is possible to a just being this follows from the nature of justice and its relation to other divine attributes if it be conceded that legal claims must be met at all hazards and cannot be either waived in part or abolished altogether then it is evident that the great problem before the divine mercy is how to meet these claims in behalf of the object of mercy the problem is not how to trample upon justice in behalf of the criminal but how to satisfy justice for him and if this problem cannot be solved then there can be no manifestation of mercy at all by a just being the penalty must be endured by the actual criminal and the matter end here god is a perfectly just being and therefore cannot forever exercise mere forbearance and indulgence towards a transgressor the mercy of the supreme being must be ethical that is must stand the test and scrutiny of moral principle and righteousness if therefore the merciful god desires to release a transgressor from the suffering which he deserves he must find someone who is fitted and willing to undergo this suffering in his place and there is in the whole universe no being who is both fitted and willing to do this but god himself a creature might be willing but he is unfit for the office of substitute the language of milton respecting the transgressor is a theology as well as poetry die he or justice must unless for him some other able and as willing pay the rigid satisfaction death for death respecting the possibility of the substitution of penalty it is to be observed one in the first place that the punishment inflicted by justice is aimed strictly speaking not at the person of the transgressor but at his sin the wrath of god falls upon the human soul considered as an agent not as a substance the spiritual essence or nature of man is god's own work and he is not angry at his own work and does not hate anything which he has created from nothing man's substance is not sin sin is the activity of this substance and this is man's work god is displeased with this activity and visits it with retribution consequently justice punishes the sin rather than the sinner the agency rather than the agent the act rather than the person it does not fix its eye upon the transgressor as this particular entity and insist that this very entity shall suffer and prohibit any other entity from suffering for him justice it is true is not obliged to allow substitution but neither is it obliged to forbid it if it were true that the penalty must be inflicted upon the transgressor's very substance and person itself as well as upon the sin in his person then there could be no substitution 
the very identical personal essence that had sinned must suffer, and justice would be the only attribute of God which could manifest towards a sinner. 2. Secondly, justice is dispassionate and unselfish. It bears no malice towards the criminal. It is not seeking to gratify a grudge against him personally, but only to maintain law and righteousness. It inflicts pain not for the sake of inflicting it upon a particular individual, but for the sake of a moral principle. Hence, if the sin can be punished in another way than by causing the sinner to be punished, if the claims of law can be really and truly satisfied by a vicarious method, there is nothing in the spirit and temper of justice towards the sinner's person or soul to forbid this. The aspect of the law upon a sinner, says Bates, being without passion, it admits of satisfaction by the sufferings of another. And the same truth is condensed in the schoolman's dictum, Impersonalita poenen necessario infligi omni peccato, sed non personalita omni peccatori. 3. Thirdly, the substitution of penalty is implied in the divine sovereignty in administering government. If God from his very nature could not permit a proper person to take the place of a criminal, but were necessitated in every single instance to inflict the penalty upon the actual transgressor, his government would be just, but not sovereign. He could make no changes in the mode of its administration, which is what is meant by a sovereign government. But God may vary the mode of administering justice, provided the mode adopted really satisfies justice, and there be no special reason in his own mind why in a particular instance the variation may not be permitted. There were such special reasons apparently in the case of the fallen angels, but not in the case of fallen men. This exercise of sovereignty and permitting substitution of penalty is by some Calvinistic theologians called a relaxation of justice, not in respect to the penalty demanded, but to the person enduring it. Justice relaxes its demands to the degree of permitting a vicar to suffer for the actual criminal, but not to the degree of abating the amount of the suffering. The vicar must pay the debt to the uttermost farthing. Owen uses the term relaxation in the sense of substitution, but describes our Lord's suffering as the strict and full satisfaction of retributive justice. To see him, he says, who is the wisdom of God and the power of God, always beloved of the Father, to see him, I say, fear and tremble, and bow and sweat, and pray and die, to see him lifted up upon the cross, the earth trembling under him, as if unable to bear his weight, and the heavens darkened over him, as if shut against his cry, and himself hanging between both, as if refused by both, and all this because our sins did meet upon him. This, of all things, doth most abundantly manifest the severity of God's vindictive justice. Here, or nowhere, is it to be learned. This is very different from Scotus's and Grotius's relaxation. The latter is a relaxation in respect to the amount of the penalty as well as to the person enduring it. In case the administrative sovereignty of God decides to permit and provide a substituted penalty, the following conditions are indispensable, not by reason of an external necessity, but by reason of an internal necessity springing from the divine nature and attributes. 1. First, the suffering substituted must be penal in its nature and purpose, and of equal value with the original penalty. The theory of Duns Scotus, afterwards perfected by Grotius, according to which God's administrative sovereignty is so extended that he can, by a volitionary decision, accept a substituted penalty of inferior value, is the same in principle with the later theory of Sosinus. This scheme, denominated acceptiliation from a term of the Roman law, logically carried out, is fatal to the doctrine of vicarious atonement. From the same arbitrary sovereignty which compels justice to be content with less than its dues, can compel it to be content with none at all. If a government has power and authority to say that fifty cents shall pay a debt of a dollar, it has the power to extinguish debts entirely by a positive decision of the same kind. The principle of justice being surrendered in part is surrendered altogether. An illustration sometimes employed, taken from the instance of Zeleucus and his son, contains the false ethics of the theory of acceptiliation. This Locrian lawgiver had decreed that a person guilty of adultery should be made blind. His own son was proved to be an adulterer. He ordered one of his son's eyes and one of his own to be put out. Alien, Historia Verie, 13, 24. This was an evasion, not a satisfaction of the law. The penalty threatened and intended to be threatened against adultery was total blindness. In a substitution of this kind, no one was made blind. 
two eyes were put out, but not the two eyes of one man. Had Sir Lucas ordered both of his own eyes to be put out, the case would have been a proper illustration of Christ's vicarious atonement. As the case actually stood, the lawgiver had principle enough to acknowledge the claims of justice, but not principle enough to completely satisfy them. That he was willing to lose one eye proves that he felt the claims of law, but that he was unwilling to make himself totally blind in the place of his son shows that he preferred to sacrifice justice to self, rather than self to justice. In saying that the suffering substituted for that of the actual criminal must be of equal value, it is not said that it must be identical suffering. A substituted penalty cannot be an identical penalty, because identical means the same in every respect. Identity is inconsistent with any exchange whatever. To speak of substituting an identical penalty is a contradiction in terms. The identical punishment required by the moral law is personal punishment involving personal remorse, and remorse can be experienced only by the actual criminal. If in commercial law a substituted payment could be prevented, a pecuniary debtor would be compelled to make an identical payment. In this case he must pay in person and wholly from his own resources. Furthermore, he could not pay silver for gold, but gold for gold, and not only this, but he must pay back exactly the same pieces of gold, the ipsima pecunia, which he had received. Identical penalty implies sameness without a difference in any particular. Not only is the quantity the same, but the quality is the same. But substituted penalty implies sameness with a difference in some particular and in the case before us that of christ's satisfaction the difference is in the quality the quantity being unchanged the vicarious suffering of christ is of equal value with that of all mankind but is not the same in kind equivalency not identity is the characteristic therefore of vicarious penalty the exchange implied in the term substitution is of quality not of quantity one kind of judicial suffering, that is suffering endured for the purpose of satisfying justice, is substituted for another kind. Christ's sufferings were of a different nature or quality from those of a lost man. But there was no difference in quantity or value. A less degree of suffering was not exchanged for a greater degree. The sufferings of the mediator were equal in amount and worth to those whose place they took. Vicarious penalty, then, is the substitution of an equal quantity, but a different quality of suffering. The mediator suffers differently from the lost world of sinners, but he suffers equally. Equivalency satisfies justice as completely as identity. One hundred dollars in gold extinguishes a debt of one hundred dollars as completely as does one hundred dollars in silver. If the sufferings of the mediator between God and man are of equal value with those of the world of mankind, they are as complete a satisfaction of justice as the eternal death of mankind would be, although they do not in their nature or quality involve any of that sense of personal wickedness or remorse of conscience which enters into the punishment of a lost man. They get their value from the nature of the God-man, and it is the value of what is substituted which justice looks at. The following extract from Samuel Hopkins enforces this truth. The mediator did not suffer precisely the same kind of pain in all respects which the sinner suffers when the curse is executed on him. He did not suffer that particular kind of pain which is the necessary attendant or natural consequence of being a sinner and which none but the sinner can suffer. But this is only a circumstance of the punishment of sin and not of the essence of it. The whole penalty of the law may be suffered, and the evil may be as much and as great, without suffering that particular sort of pain. Wherefore Christ, though without sin, might suffer the whole penalty, that is, as much and as great evil as the law denounces against transgression. 2. Secondly, the penalty substituted must be endured by a person who is not himself already indebted to justice, and who is not a subject of the government under which the substitution takes place. If he be himself a criminal, he cannot, of course, be a substitute for a criminal. And if he be an innocent person, yet owes all his own service to the government, he cannot do a work of supererogation, such as is implied in vicarious satisfaction. An earthly state could not righteously allow an innocent citizen to die for another, even if he were willing so to die, because there are claims upon the person and life of every citizen which must go undischarged if his life should be taken. These are the claims of family, of society, of the commonwealth, and of God. It is impossible, says Owen, that by anything a man can do well, he should make satisfaction for anything he hath done ill. For what he so doeth is due in and for itself. 
and to suppose that satisfaction can be made for a former fault by that whose omission would have been another fault had the former never been committed is madness an old debt cannot be discharged with ready money for new commodities nor can past injuries be compensated by present duties which we are anew obliged unto says anselm cum redis aliquid quod debes deo non debes computare hoc pro debito quod debes pro peccato omnia enim debis deo the words of the jewish elders to christ respecting the roman centurion illustrate the point under consideration they besought christ to heal his servant saying that the centurion was worthy of such a favour for he loveth our nation and he hath built us a synagogue luke seven five the centurion had acquired merit because as a roman citizen he was under no obligation to build a jewish synagogue the sufferings of christ meet all these conditions one first they were penal in their nature and intent since they were neither calamitous nor disciplinary they were a judicial infliction voluntarily endured by christ for the purpose of satisfying the claims of law due from man and this purpose makes them penal it pleased the lord to bruise him he was wounded for our transgressions isaiah fifty three five and ten christ was made a curse for us galatians two thirteen no man taketh my life from me but i lay it down of myself john ten seventeen and eighteen some writers while defending the doctrine of vicarious atonement object to applying the terms penal and penalty to christ's sufferings maggie does so the idea of punishment cannot be abstracted from personal guilt christ's sufferings are a judicial infliction and may perhaps be figuratively denominated punishment if thereby be implied a reference to the actual transgressor and be understood that suffering which was due to the offender himself and which if inflicted upon him would then take the name of punishment in no other sense can the suffering inflicted on account of the transgressions of another be called a punishment ebrard quoted by van ustersee two six o three who agrees with ebrard says if i endure the infliction due to another instead of him this suffering which for him would have had the moral quality of a punishment has not the moral quality of a punishment for me because i am an innocent person for the idea of a punishment contains beside the objective element of suffering inflicted by the judge also in addition the subjective element of the sense of guilt or an evil conscience possessed by the guilty this last assertion is the point in dispute does the idea of a punishment contain beside the objective element of suffering inflicted by the judge also the subjective element of the sense of guilt the question is whether the simple purpose and aim of the suffering in a given instance is sufficient to constitute it punishment if a person suffers with a view to satisfy the claims of law be he guilty himself or not is this a penal suffering is such a judicial infliction as muggy calls it properly denominated penalty does the existence of the objective element alone apart from the subjective element in the case of suffering for the purpose of atonement for sin warrant the use of the terms penal and penalty there are three reasons why it does a there is no other term but this by which to designate a suffering that is endured for the sole purpose of satisfying justice it cannot be denominated either calamity or chastisement b when a commercial debt is vicariously paid by a friend of the debtor it is as truly a payment as if paid personally and the term payment is applied to it in the strict sense of the word but if there is no valid objection to denominating the vicarious satisfaction of a pecuniary claim a payment there is none to denominating the vicarious satisfaction of a moral claim a punishment c a third reason for the use of the term punishment or penalty in this connection is found in the use of the corresponding term atonement no objection is made to calling christ's suffering an atonement but atonement and punishment are kindred in meaning both alike denote judicial suffering there is consequently no more reason for insisting that the term punishment be restricted to personal endurance of suffering for personal transgression than there would be in insisting that the term atonement be restricted to personal satisfaction for personal sin but the vicarious sufferings of christ are as truly an atonement for sin as would be the personal sufferings of the sinner himself and are as freely called so it is as proper therefore to denominate christ's suffering as vicarious punishment as to denominate it a vicarious atonement the objection of Maggi and ebrard is met by the qualifying term vicarious invariably joined with the term punishment when christ's sufferings are denominated a punishment 
no one asserts that they were a personal punishment. Anselm marks the difference by denominating the infliction when laid upon the sinner, poena, and when laid upon the substitute, satisfactio. Footnote. While there may be vicarious as well as personal punishment, because punishment is suffered for a judicial purpose, and this purpose can be fulfilled by a substitute as well as by the criminal, there can be no vicarious confession of sin and no vicarious repentance for it. Confession and repentance are necessarily personal acts. The scriptures never represent Christ as vicariously confessing the sins of his people or as vicariously repenting of them. Yet MacLeod Campbell, while dissatisfied with the Catholic doctrine of vicarious atonement, has set forth the theory that Christ has made a perfect confession of human sin and that this is an adequate satisfaction for sin. See Crawford on Atonement and on the Fatherhood of God, Lecture 4. End footnote. 2. Secondly, the vicarious sufferings of Christ were infinite in value. In the substitution, the amount is fully equal to that of the original penalty. A smaller suffering and inferior atonement was not put in the place of a greater and superior. The worth of any suffering is determined by the total subject who suffers, not by the particular nature in the subject which is the seat of the suffering. Physical suffering in a brute is not so valuable as it is in a man because a brute has only an animal nature, while a man has an animal united with a rational nature. Yet the nature which is the sensorium or seat of the physical pain is the same in both cases. But one hour of human suffering through the physical sentiency is worth more than days of brutal suffering through the physical sentiency, as one hour of Europe is worth a cycle of Cathay. When animal life and organization suffer in a man's person, the agony is human and rational. It is high up the scale. It has the dignity and greatness of degree which pertain to man. But when animal life and organization suffer in an ox or a dog, the agony is brutal and irrational. It is low down the scale. It has nothing of the worth and dignity that belong to the physical agony of the martyr and confessor. To apply this reasoning to the case before us, when a human nature suffers in an ordinary human person, the suffering is human and rational but finite. No mere man's suffering can be infinite in value because the total subject or person is finite. Whatever a man suffers in either of his natures, body or mind, gets its value from his personality. Measured by this, it is limited suffering, but when a human nature suffers in a theanthropic person, the suffering is divine and infinite because of the divinity and infinity of such a person. The suffering of the human nature in this instance is elevated and dignified by the union of the human nature with the divine, just as the suffering of an animal nature in an ordinary man is elevated and dignified by the union of the animal nature with the rational. The suffering of a mere man is human, but the suffering of a God-man is divine. Yet the divine nature is not the sensorium or seat of the suffering in the instance of the God-man any more than the rational nature is the sensorium or seat of the suffering in the instance of physical suffering in the man. A man's immaterial soul is not burned when he suffers human agony and martyrdom, and the impassable essence of God was not bruised and wounded when Jesus Christ suffered the divine agony. Hence it is said that Christ suffered in the flesh, that is, in his human nature. 1 Peter 4.1 it has been objected that the sufferings of Christ, not being endless, cannot be of equal value with those of all mankind, but when carefully examined and strictly computed, they will be found to exceed in value and dignity the sufferings for which they were substituted. The suffering of the God-man during a section of time is more exactly and mathematically infinite than would be the suffering of the human race in endless time. The so-called infinitude of human suffering is derived from the length of its duration, not from the dignity of the sufferer. It is the suffering of a finite creature in a duration that is eternal, only a parte post. This would not yield strict eternity. The suffering of the whole human race in an endless duration would, consequently, be only relatively infinite. But the vicarious suffering of the God-man obtains its element of infinitude from the person, not from the duration and this person is absolutely not relatively infinite. The suffering of an absolutely infinite person in a finite duration is therefore a greater suffering in degree and dignity than is the suffering of a multitude of finite persons in an endless but not strictly infinite time. God incarnate is a greater being and a greater sufferer than all mankind collectively, and his crucifixion involved a greater guilt upon the part of the perpetrators and a more stupendous sacrifice than would the crucifixion of the entire human family. 
if inquires anselm of his pupil bozo that god man were here present before you and you having a full knowledge of his nature and character it should be said unless you slay that person the whole world and the whole created universe will perish would you put him to death in order to preserve the whole creation to this question the pupil makes answer i would not even if an infinite number of worlds were spread out before me another proof that the vicarious work of christ is of greater value in satisfying the claims of the divine law than would be the endless punishment of the whole human race is the fact that christ not only suffered the penalty but obeyed the precept of the law in this case law and justice get their whole dues but when lost man only suffers the penalty but does not obey the precept the law is defrauded of a part of its dues no law is completely obeyed if only its penalty is endured the law does not give its subjects an option either to obey or to suffer punishment it does not say to them if you will endure the penalty you need not keep the precept it requires obedience primarily and principally and then it also requires suffering in case of disobedience but this suffering does not release from the primary obligation to obey the law still has its original and indefeasible claim on the transgressor for a sinless obedience at the very time that it is exacting the penalty of disobedience from him consequently a sinner can never completely and exhaustively satisfy the divine law however much or long he may suffer because he cannot at one and the same time endure the penalty and obey the precept he owes ten thousand talents and has nothing wherewith to pay matthew eighteen twenty four but christ did both and therefore he magnified the law and made it honourable isaiah forty two twenty one in an infinitely higher degree than the whole human family would have done had they all personally suffered for their sins compare edwards redemption works one four o six three thirdly the vicarious sufferings of christ were not due from him as from a guilty person he was innocent and retributive justice had no claims upon him what he voluntarily suffered could therefore inure to the benefit of another than himself the active obedience of christ was also a work of supererogation as well as his passive obedience for although his human nature as such owed obedience yet it owed only a human and finite obedience but the obedience which the mediator actually rendered to the moral law was not that of a mere man but of a god-man it was theanthropic obedience not merely human as such it was divine and infinite it could therefore like the passive obedience of an innocent person inure to the benefit of another and earn for him a title to eternal life and reward and lastly the god-man not being a mere creature but also the creator and lord of all things could rightfully dispose of himself and his agency as he pleased he asserted this sovereign lordship over himself in the words no man taketh my life from me but i lay it down of myself I have power and authority, exousian, to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. John 10.18 The above-mentioned grounds and reasons for the substitution of penalty abundantly demonstrate its harmony with the principles of law and justice, but should they still be disputed, the whole question may be quickly disposed of by asking, who objects? Objections to any method of administering a government can be urged only by some party whose rights and claims have been disregarded or trampled upon. In the instance of the vicarious atonement of the Son of God, no objection is raised by God the Father, for he officially proposed and planned the method. No objection is raised by God the Son, for he not only consents to be a party in the transaction, but to be the sacrificial victim required by it and no objection is raised by god the spirit for he likewise is a party in the transaction and cooperates in its execution and application this substitution of penalty is therefore a method devised and authorized by the entire godhead it is a trinitarian transaction nothing is urged against it from this quarter and when we pass from the divine being to angels and men and ask for objections for one having real grounds of complaint there must be of course a dead silence no angelic or human rights have been interfered with objections to the method of vicarious atonement from the world of mankind especially would be not merely unthankful but absurd that the criminal who has no claims at all before the law which he has transgressed and under whose eternal condemnation he lies in utter helplessness that the criminal in whose behalf eternal pity has laid down its own life should object to the method would deserve not only no reply but everlasting shame and contempt vicarious atonement part four 
having considered the nature and value of christ's atonement we are prepared to consider its extent some controversy would have been avoided upon this subject had there always been a distinct understanding as to the meaning of words we shall therefore first of all consider this point the term extent has two senses in english usage a it has a passive meaning and is equivalent to value the extent of a man's farm means the number of acres which it contains the extent of a man's resources denotes the amount of property which he owns in this signification of the word the extent of christ's atonement would be the intrinsic and real value of it for purposes of judicial satisfaction in this use of the term all parties who hold the atonement in any evangelical meaning would concede that the extent of the atonement is unlimited christ's death is sufficient in value to satisfy eternal justice for the sins of all mankind if this were the only meaning of extent we should not be called upon to discuss it any further for all that has been said under the head of the nature and value of the atonement would answer the question what is the extent of the atonement being an infinite atonement it has an infinite value b the word has an active signification it denotes the act of extending the extent of the atonement in this sense means its personal application to individuals by the holy spirit the extent is now the intent the question what is the extent of the atonement now means to whom is the atonement effectually extended the inquiry now is not what is the value of the atonement but to whom does god purpose to apply its benefits the active signification is the earlier meaning of the word in english literature the following are a few out of many instances in which extent means extending or putting to use let my officers of such a nature make an extent levy upon his house and lands shakespeare as you like it act three scene one let thy fair wisdom not thy passion sway in this uncivil and unjust extent attack against thy peace shakespeare twelfth night act four scene one but both his hands most filthy feculent above the water were on high extent extended and feigned to wash themselves incessantly yet nothing cleaner were they for such intent spencer fairy queen act two scene seven second him in his dishonest practices but when this manner is extended applied to my use you'll speak in an humble way and sue for favour massinger new way to pay old debts act four scene one the rule of solon concerning the territory of athens is not extendable applicable unto all allowing the distance of six foot unto common trees and nine for the fig and olive brown cyrus's garden four the following are examples of the use of the term in the active signification in the older theologians and doctrinal statements the rest of mankind god was pleased according to the unsearchable counsel of his own will whereby he extendeth or withholdeth mercy as he pleaseth to pass by westminster confession three seven according to the unsearchable counsel of his own will god extendeth or withholdeth favour as he pleaseth larger catechism thirteen in these passages to extend mercy means to effectually apply christ's redemption not merely to offer it because in the latter sense god does not withhold mercy from any man is grace impaired in its extent we affirm it to be extended to every one that is or was or ever shall be delivered from the pit owen against universal redemption four seven here to extend grace is to actually save the soul by effectual calling in modern english the term extent is so generally employed in the passive signification of value that the active signification has become virtually obsolete and requires explanation writers upon the extent of the atonement have sometimes neglected to consider the history of the word and misunderstanding has arisen between disputants who were really in agreement with each other accordingly in answering the question as to the extent of christ's atonement it must first be settled whether extent means its intended application or its intrinsic value whether the active or the passive signification of the word is in the mind of the inquirer if the word means value then the atonement is unlimited if it means extending that is applying then the atonement is limited the dispute also turns upon the meaning of the preposition for 
one theologian asserts that christ died for all men and another denies that christ died for all men there may be a difference between the two that is reconcilable and there may be an irreconcilable difference the preposition for denotes an intention of some kind if in the case under consideration the intention is understood to be the purpose on the part of god both to offer and apply the atonement by working faith and repentance in the sinner's heart by the operation of the holy spirit then he who affirms that christ died for all men is in error and he who denies that christ died for all men holds the truth these two parties are irreconcilable but he who asserts that christ died for all men may understand the intention signified by the preposition to be the purpose on the part of god only to offer the atonement leaving it to the sinner whether it shall be appropriated through faith and repentance the intention in this latter case does not include so much as in the former and the preposition is narrower in meaning when the word for is thus defined the difference between the two parties is reconcilable the latter means by for intended for offer or publication the former means intended for application again the preposition for is sometimes understood to denote not intention but value or sufficiency to say that christ died for all men then means that his death is sufficient to expiate the guilt of all men here again the difference is possibly reconcilable between the parties the one who denies that christ died for all men takes for in the sense of intention to effectually apply the other who affirms that christ died for all men takes for in the sense of value as to the question which is the most proper use of the word for it is plain that it more naturally conveys the notion of intention than of sufficiency or value if it be said to a person this money is for you he does not understand merely that it is sufficient in value to pay his debt but that it actually inures to his benefit in paying it in the scripture statement that christ gave himself a ransom for all one timothy two six if the word for be made to denote value so that the text reads christ gave himself a ransom sufficient for all a circumlocution is introduced the preposition for does not express the idea of sufficiency or value directly but through an explanation but it expresses the idea of intention immediately and without circumlocution and this agrees better with the term ransom which denotes subjective redemption rather than objective satisfaction this remark applies to such a text as that christ tasted death for every man hebrews two nine which is explained by many sons in verse ten if we interpolate and say that christ tasted a death that is sufficient for every man we indeed state a truth but we inject into the preposition for a larger meaning than accords with the strictly idiomatic use of it the distinction between the sufficiency of the atonement and its extent in the sense of intent or effectual application is an old and well-established one it is concisely expressed in the dictum that christ died sufficienter pro omnibus sed efficaciter tantum pro electis the following extracts from owen illustrated it was the purpose and intention of god that his son should offer a sacrifice of infinite worth value and dignity sufficient in itself for the redeeming of all and every man if it had pleased the lord to employ it for that purpose yea and of other worlds also if the lord should freely make them and would redeem them sufficient we say then was the sacrifice of christ for the redemption of the whole world and for the expiation of all the sins of all and every man in the world this is its own true internal perfection and sufficiency that it should be applied unto all made a price for them and become beneficial to them according to the worth that is in it is external to it doth not arise from it but merely depends upon the intention and will of god it was in itself of infinite value and sufficiency to have been made a price to have bought and purchased all and every man in the world that it did formally become a price for any is solely to be ascribed to the purpose of god intending their purchase and redemption by it the intention of the offerer and acceptor of the sacrifice that it should be for such some or any is that which gives the formality of a price unto it this is external to the sacrifice but the value and fitness of it to be made a price ariseth from its own internal sufficiency in respect to such phraseology as a ransom price for all 1 timothy 2 6 owen remarks that it must be understood to mean that christ's blood was sufficient to be made a ransom for all to be made a price for all but that the terms ransom and ransom price more properly denote the application than the value of christ's sacrifice he adds that the expression to die for any person holds out the intention of our saviour in the laying down of the price to be their redeemer 
atonement must be distinguished from redemption. The latter term includes the application of the atonement. It is the term redemption, not atonement, which is found in those statements that speak of the work of Christ as limited by the decree of election. In the Westminster Confession, 8.8, it is said that to all those whom Christ hath purchased redemption, he doth certainly and effectually apply and communicate the same. In chapter 8, 5, it is stated that the Lord Jesus hath purchased not only reconciliation, but an everlasting inheritance in the kingdom of heaven for all those whom the Father hath given unto him. Since redemption includes reconciliation with God and inheritance in the kingdom of heaven, it implies something subjective in the soul, an appropriation by faith of the benefits of Christ's objective work of atonement. Reconciliation and inheritance of heaven are elements and parts of redemption and are limited to those who have believed, and those who have believed are those who have been called and chosen. Ephesians 2.9, faith is the gift of God. 1 Corinthians 3.5, ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. Acts 3.48, as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Accordingly, the scripture limits redemption as contradistinguished from atonement to the church. Christ makes reconciliation for the sins of his people, Hebrews 12.17. His work is called the redemption of the purchased possession, Ephesians 1.14. He is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of his death they which are called might receive an eternal inheritance, Hebrews 9.15. He hath visited and redeemed his people, Luke 1.68. David, addressing Jehovah, says, Remember thy congregation which thou hast purchased of old, the rod of thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed. Psalm 74, 2. The elders of Ephesus are commanded to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased by his own blood. Acts 20, 28. He sent redemption unto his people. Psalm 3, 9. O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. Isaiah 43, 1. He shall save his people from their sins. Matthew 1, 21. Christ is the saviour of his body, the church. Ephesians 5:23. He said, Surely they are my people, so he was their saviour. Isaiah 63, 8 I will save my people from the east country and from the west country. Zechariah 8, 7 See the Old Testament passages in which Jehovah is called the saviour of Israel, and the New Testament passages in which God is called our saviour, that is, of the church. Since redemption implies the application of Christ's atonement, Universal or unlimited redemption cannot logically be affirmed by any who hold that faith is wholly the gift of God, and that saving faith is bestowed solely by election. The use of the term redemption, consequently, is attended with less ambiguity than that of atonement, and it is the term most commonly employed in controversial theology. Footnote. Owen, in his treatise Against Arminianism, presents arguments against universal redemption. End footnote. Atonement is unlimited and redemption is limited. This statement includes all the scripture texts, those which assert that Christ died for all men and those which assert that he died for his people. He who asserts unlimited atonement and limited redemption cannot well be misconceived. He is understood to hold that the sacrifice of Christ is unlimited in its value, sufficiency and publication, but limited in its effectual application. But he who asserts unlimited atonement and denies limited redemption might be understood to hold either of three views. 1. The doctrine of the universalist that Christ's atonement per se saves all mankind. Or 2. The doctrine of the Arminian that personal faith in Christ's atonement is necessary to salvation, but that faith depends partly upon the operation of the Holy Spirit and partly upon the decision of the sinful will. Or three, the doctrine of the school of Salmur, hypothetic universalism, that personal faith in Christ's atonement in the first arrangement of God depended in part upon the decision of the sinful will. But since this failed by a second arrangement, it now depends wholly upon the work of the Spirit according to the purpose of election. The tenant of limited redemption rests upon the tenant of election, and the tenant of election rests upon the tenant of the sinner's bondage and inability. Soteriology here runs back to theology, and theology runs back to anthropology. Everything in the series finally recurs to the state and condition of fallen man. The answer to the question, how is the atonement of Christ savingly appropriated, depends upon the answer to the question, how much efficient power is there in the sinful will to savingly trust in it? 
if the answer be that there is efficient power either wholly or in part in the sinful will itself to believe then faith is either wholly or in part from the sinner himself and is not wholly the gift of god which is contrary to ephesians two eight and justification does not depend wholly upon electing grace which is contrary to one peter one two and redemption is not limited but if the answer be that there is not efficient power in the sinful will itself either wholly or in part to savingly believe then faith is wholly the gift of god is wholly dependent upon his electing grace and redemption is limited by election as is taught in one corinthians five three who then is paul and who is apollos by whom ye believed even as the lord gave to every man and in romans nine sixteen it is not of him that willeth nor of him that runneth but of god that showeth mercy the difference between the calvinist and the arminian appears at this point both are evangelical in affirming that salvation is solely by faith in christ's atoning blood this differentiates him from the legal Socinian who denies the doctrine of vicarious atonement and founds salvation from condemnation on personal character and good works but they differ regarding the origin of faith the calvinist maintains that faith is wholly from god being one of the effects of regeneration the arminian that it is partly from god and partly from man the calvinist asserts that a sinner is unconditionally elected to the act of faith and that the holy spirit in regeneration inclines and enables him to the act without cooperation and assistance from him the arminian asserts that a sinner is conditionally elected to the act of faith and that the holy spirit works faith in him with some assistance and cooperation from him this cooperation consists in ceasing to resist and yielding to the operation of the spirit in this case the holy spirit does not overcome a totally averse and resisting will which is the calvinistic view but he influences a partially inclining will the calvinist contends that unconditional election and total inability agree best with the scripture representations and that the arminian really adopts them when he sings with charles wesley other refuge have i none hangs my helpless soul on thee conditional election is inconsistent with the biblical texts which describe god as independent and sovereign in bestowing faith and salvation it is no sufficient reply to say that plenary ability to appropriate the atonement of christ is not attributed to the fallen soul but only a partial ability that it is not contended that sinful man can exercise faith in the atonement without any aid at all from god but only that he can and must contribute a certain degree of voluntary power which if united with that of god the spirit will produce faith and that the exercise of this is the condition of election this position of partial ability or synergism comes to the same result with that of plenary ability so far as the divine independence and sovereignty are concerned for it is this decision of the sinner to contribute his quota to do his part in the transaction which conditions the result it is indeed true upon this theory that if god does not assist the act of faith is impossible but it is equally true that if the sinner does not assist the act of faith is impossible neither party alone and by himself can originate faith in christ's atonement god is as dependent in this respect as man in this case therefore it cannot be said that faith depends wholly upon the divine purpose or that redemption is regulated and limited by election the middle theory of partial ability and conditional election is found in the greek anthropology and the semi-pelagian fathers generally and is opposed by calvin as follows the proposition of paul it is not of him that willeth nor of him that runneth but of god that showeth mercy is not to be understood in the sense of those who divide saving power between the grace of god and the will and exertion of man who indeed say that human desires and endeavours have no efficacy of themselves unless they are rendered successful by the grace of god but also maintain that with the assistance of his blessing these things have their share in procuring salvation to refute their views i prefer augustine's words to my own if the apostle only meant that it is not of him that wills or of him that runs without the assistance of the merciful lord we may retort the converse proposition that it is not of god's mercy alone without the assistance of man's willing and running but it is certain that the apostle ascribes everything to the lord's mercy and leaves nothing to our wills or exertions again calvin marks the difference between augustine and chrysostom in the following terms let us not hesitate to say with augustine that god would convert to good the will of all the wicked because he is omnipotent why then does he not 
because he would not, why he would not remains with himself, for we ought not to aim at more wisdom than becomes us. That would be much better than adopting the evasion of Chrysostom, that God draws those who are willing and who stretch out their hands for his aid, so that the difference may not appear to consist in the decree of God, but in the will of man. Luther took the same ground with Calvin. Some allege that the Holy Spirit works not in those that resist him, but only in such as are willing and give consent thereto, whence it follows that a free will is a cause and helper of faith, and that consequently the Holy Ghost does not alone work through the word, but that our will does something therein. But, I say it is not so, the will of man works nothing at all in his conversion and justification. Non est efficiens causa justificationis sed materialis tantum. It is the matter on which the Holy Ghost works, as a potter makes a pot out of clay, equally in those that resist and are averse, as in St. Paul. But after the Holy Ghost has wrought in the wills of such resistance, then he also manages that the will be consenting thereunto. Table Talk of Free Will In saying that Christ's atonement is limited in its application, and that redemption is particular, not universal, it is meant that the number of persons to whom it is effectually applied is a fixed and definite number. The notion of definiteness, not of smallness, is intended. In common speech, if anything is limited, it is little and insignificant in amount. This is not the idea when the redemptive work of Christ is denominated a limited work. The circle of election and redemption must indeed be a circumference, but not necessarily a small one. No man is redeemed outside of the circle, all the sheep must be within the fold, but the circle is that of the heavens, not of the earth. The fold is that of the great shepherd, not that of an under-shepherd. The biblical representation is to this effect. Matthew 6.13, Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. 1 Corinthians 15.25, Christ must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Psalm 103.21, The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Revelation 21.3, The tabernacle of God is with men, and they shall be his people. Revelation 14.6, The angel, having the everlasting gospel to preach to every nation, kindred, and tongue. Revelation 19.6, The voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters. Revelation 21.16, The new Jerusalem lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. Romans 5.20, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Psalm 68.17, the chariots of God are twenty thousand, even thousands upon thousands. Although Christ's atonement in the discussion of its value and sufficiency can be separated from the intention to apply it, yet in the divine mind and decree the two things are inseparable. The atonement and its application are parts of one covenant of redemption between the Father and Son, the sacrifice of Christ is offered with the intention that it shall actually be successful in saving human souls from death. It is not rational to suppose that God the Father merely determined that God the Son should die for the sin of the world, leaving it wholly or in part to the sinful world to determine all the rest of this stupendous transaction. Leaving it wholly or in part to the sinful world to decide how many or how few this death should actually save. Neither is it rational to suppose that the Son of God would lay down his life upon such a peradventure. For it might be that not a single human soul would trust in his sacrifice, and in this case he would have died in vain. On the contrary, it is most rational to suppose that in the covenant between the Father and Son, the making of an atonement was inseparably connected with the purpose to apply it, the purpose namely to accompany the atoning work of the Son with the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. The Divine Father, in giving the Divine Son as a sacrifice for sin, simultaneously determined that this sacrifice should be appropriated through faith by a definite number of the human family, so that it might be said that Christ died for this number, with the distinct intention that they should be personally saved by this death. This is taught in Scripture. The Good Shepherd layeth down his life for the sheep. John 10.15 Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. John 15.13 being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation, and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. John 11:51 and 52. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Ephesians 5:25. The annunciation to Joseph respecting the miraculous conception described the Saviour as one who should save his people from their sins. Matthew 1:21. 1, 
Furthermore, in accordance with this fact of an intention to apply the atonement at the time when the atonement is provided, we find that believers are said to have been chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1, four, that they have been given to Christ by the Father, John 10.29, that Christ knows them as so given, John 10.27 that he claims them as his sheep before they have actually believed, and even before they have been born, saying, Other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one flock, pumen, and one shepherd. John 10.16 And when Paul was at Corinth, Christ encouraged his apostle to continue his labours, notwithstanding that little success had thus far attended them, by saying, I have much people in this city, Acts 18.9. That the atonement in the mind of God was inseparable from his purpose to apply it to individuals is proved, a. by the fact that atonement in and by itself, separate from faith, saves no soul. Christ might have died precisely as he did, but if no one believed in him, he would have died in vain. Hence it is said that God hath set forth Christ to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, Romans 3.25. It is only when the death of Christ has been actually confided in as an atonement that it is completely set forth as God's propitiation for sin. In like manner, Christ is said to have been delivered for our offences and raised again for our justification, Romans 4.25. If Christ had not risen from the dead, he could not have been believed in. A dead and buried Christ could not have been an object of personal trust and confidence. Consequently, although it was the suffering and death of Christ, and not his resurrection and exaltation, that properly constitutes the atoning sacrifice, yet this sacrifice in itself, and apart from its vital appropriation, is useless. In order, therefore, to man's justification, Christ must not only be delivered to death for offences, but raised again from death, so that he might be an object of faith. It cannot be said, says Owen, that Christ's satisfaction was made in such a way as to render it uncertain whether it should save or not. Such an arrangement might be just in pecuniary payments. A man may lay down a sum of money for the discharge of another on such a condition as may never be fulfilled. For on the failure of the condition his money may and ought to be returned to him, whereupon he hath received no injury or damage but in penal suffering for crime and sin there can be no righteous arrangement that shall make the event and efficacy of it to depend on a condition absolutely uncertain and which may not be fulfilled. For if the condition fail, no recompense can be made to him that hath suffered. Wherefore, the application of the satisfaction of Christ unto them for whom it was made is sure and steadfast in the purpose of God. B. If in the mind of God the death of Christ was separate from the intention to apply it, then it would be as true that Christ died for lost angels as for lost men. Because his atonement, being infinite, is sufficient in value to atone for their sin as well as that of mankind. When it is said that Christ died for the sin of the world, it is implied that he did not die for any sin but that of man. The offer of Christ's atonement is confined to the human race and not made to the angelic world. Now, as the divine intention accompanies the providing of an atonement in respect to the difference between angels and men, so it accompanies the application of the atonement in respect to the difference between elect and non-elect men. As the atonement of Christ is not intended to be offered to the angels, though it is sufficient for them, so it is not intended to be applied to non-elect men, though it is sufficient for them. C. If, in the mind of God, the purpose that Christ should die had not been accompanied with the purpose that his death should be effective for individuals, the former purpose would have been an unproductive and useless one. It would have accomplished nothing because of man's unbelief and rejection of the gospel offer. But no purpose of God is unproductive and useless. D. The analogy of the typical atonement under the Mosaic economy shows that Christ's atonement is intended for application only to believers. The lamb offered by the officiating priest was offered for the particular person who brought it to the priest to be offered. Each man had his own lamb, and there was no lamb that belonged to no one in particular, but to everyone indiscriminately. E. The atoning work of Christ in its intended application is no wider than his intercessory work. He pleads the merit of his death for those to whom the Father purposed to impute it, and only for those. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. John 17, 9. This was Christ's intercessory prayer. He here teaches that he does not discharge the particular office of intercessor for the non-elect, 
the world as distinguished from those whom the father had given him it is logical therefore to conclude that he does not discharge the particular office of priest for them there are biblical passages which are cited to teach unlimited redemption hebrews two nine christ tasted death for every man one john two two christ is the propitiation not for our sins only but for the sins of the whole world one timothy two six christ gave himself a ransom for all john one twenty nine the lamb of god which taketh away the sins of the world john three sixteen and seventeen god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son respecting this class of passages the following particulars are to be noticed one scripture must be explained in harmony with scripture texts that speak of the universal reference of christ's death must therefore be interpreted in such a way as not to exclude its special reference one timothy four ten god is the saviour of all men especially of those that believe hebrews two seventeen christ makes reconciliation for the sins of his people ephesians five twenty three christ is the saviour of his body the church luke one sixty eight christ hath visited and redeemed his people matthew twenty twenty eight christ gives his life a ransom for many matthew one twenty one jesus shall save his people from their sins psalm seventy four two a hundred and eleven nine isaiah sixty three eight matthew twenty six twenty eight hebrews nine twenty eight two the word world in scripture frequently denotes a part of the world viewed as a collective whole and having a distinctive character as we speak of the scientific or the religious world a sometimes it is the world of believers the church examples of this use are john six thirty three and fifty one the bread of god is he which giveth life to the world of believers romans four thirteen abraham is the heir of the world the redeemed romans eleven twelve if the fall of them be the riches of the world romans eleven fifteen if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world in these texts church could be substituted for world b sometimes the word world denotes the contrary of the church psalm seven fourteen men of the world john one ten the world knew him not john seven seven the world cannot hate you but me it hateth john fourteen seventeen twenty two and twenty seven fifteen eighteen and nineteen sixteen twenty and thirty three seventeen nine i pray not for the world john seventeen fourteen sixteen and twenty five one corinthians two twelve one john two fifteen to seventeen three one four five five four c sometimes the term world means all mankind in distinction from the jews matthew twenty six thirteen the gospel shall be preached in the whole world matthew thirteen thirty eight the field is the world john three sixteen god so loved the world one corinthians one twenty one by wisdom the world knew not god two corinthians five nineteen reconcile the world unto himself one john two two propitiation for the sins of the whole world these texts teach that redemption is intended for all races classes and ages of men similarly the word all sometimes has a restricted signification denoting all of a particular class one corinthians fifteen twenty two as in adam all die so in christ shall all be made alive the all in adam is a larger aggregate than the all in christ because scripture teaches that all men without exception are the children of adam and that not all without exception are believers in christ two corinthians five fourteen if one died for all then all died with that one the all here denotes the body of believers because it is described as the living Uzontos verse 15 romans five eighteen. as the judgment came upon all men to condemnation even so the free gift came upon all men unto justification the all in one instance is described verse 17 as receiving abundance of grace but not in the other footnote as a specimen of exegesis that throws out the qualifying words and explanatory statements of the author consider the following from farah quote the word all is the governing word in the epistle to the romans all for whatever may be the modifications which may be thought necessary st paul does not himself make them all are equally guilty all are equally redeemed all have been temporarily rejected all shall be ultimately received all shall be finally brought into living harmony with that god who is above all and through all and in all ephesians 4 6 end quote 
the words of St. Paul in Ephesians 4, 6 are God who is in you all, the reference being to believers. End footnote. The passage 1 Corinthians 8, 11, shall the weaker brother perish for whom Christ died, and also Hebrews 6, 4-10, and 10, 26-30, is a supposition for the sake of argument of something that does not and cannot happen, like 1 Corinthians 13, 1-3, Galatians 1, 8. The influence and natural tendency of the conduct spoken of is to spiritual death. It is not said that the actual result will be the death of the weaker brother. On the contrary, it is said that God shall hold him up, Romans 14.4. In the text 2 Peter 2.1, denying the Lord that bought them, the false teachers are described according to their own profession, not as they are in the eye of God. They claim to have been bought by the blood of Christ, and yet by their damnable heresies nullify the atonement. Turretin explains the purchase in this case as redemption from the errors of paganism. See verse 20, escape the pollutions of the world. Only the outward call is meant. Turretin defends this by the use in the passage of despotes instead of sotera, and of agorazin instead of lutroste. In 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The will is that of decree, and the reference is to believers only. The Greek shows this, me voulomenos dinas apoleste, not purposing that any of us should perish. The preceding clause, long-suffering to usward, isemas, shows that dinas refers to God's children. The true rendering of is metanuan Choresa is should go on to repentance, metanuan here denoting the process of sanctification or renewing, Ephesians 4.23, and choresi, a progressive motion or advance, as in Matthew 15.17, The passage, Isaiah 5.4, what could have been done more unto my vineyard, does not teach that God could not realize his desire that all men should turn and live. It is not the idea of power, but of patience and long-suffering that is contained in this text. Calvin and Genesius explain, What more was there to be done, or was I bound to do? Alexander in Loco. The question arises, if the atonement of Christ is not intended to be universally applied, why should it be universally offered? The gospel offer is to be made to every man because, one, it is the divine command. Matthew 16, 5. God has forbidden his ministers to accept any man in the offer. 2. No offer of the atonement is possible, but a universal offer. In order to be offered at all, Christ's sacrifice must be offered indiscriminately. A limited offer of the atonement to the elect only would require a revelation from God informing the preacher who they are. As there is no such revelation and the herald is in ignorance on this point, he cannot offer the gospel to some and refuse it to others. In this state of things, there is no alternative but to preach Christ to everybody or to nobody. 3. The atonement is sufficient in value to expiate the sin of all men indiscriminately, and this fact should be stated because it is a fact. There are no claims of justice not yet satisfied. There is no sin of man for which an infinite atonement has not been provided. All things are now ready. Therefore the call to come is universal. It is plain that the offer of the atonement should be regulated by its intrinsic nature and sufficiency, not by the obstacles that prevent its efficacy. The extent to which a medicine is offered is not limited by the number of persons favorably disposed to buy it and use it. Its adaptation to disease is the sole consideration in selling it, and consequently it is offered to everybody. 4. God opposes no obstacle to the efficacy of the atonement in the instance of the non-elect. a. He exerts no direct efficiency to prevent the non-elect from trusting in the atonement. The decree of reprobation is permissive. God leaves the non-elect to do as he likes b. There is no compulsion from the external circumstances in which the providence of God has placed the non-elect. On the contrary, the outward circumstances, especially in Christendom, favor, instead of hindering, trust in Christ's atonement. And so, in a less degree, do the outward circumstances in heathendom. The goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering of God tend to lead to repentance. Romans 2.4, Acts 14.17, 17.26-30. 17, C. The special grace which God bestows upon the elect does not prevent the non-elect from believing, neither does it render faith any more difficult for him. 
the non elect receives common grace and common grace would incline the human will if it were not defeated by the human will if the sinner should make no hostile opposition common grace would be equivalent to saving grace footnote to say that common grace if not resisted by the sinner would be equivalent to regenerating grace is not the same as to say that common grace if assisted by the sinner would be equivalent to regenerating grace in the first instance god would be the sole author of regeneration in the second he would not be End footnote. acts seven fifty one ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears ye do always resist the holy ghost two timothy three eight as Janus and Jumbres withstood Moses, so do these also withstand the truth. See Howe's remarks on common grace, oracles two two. Five. The atonement of Christ is to be offered indiscriminately because God desires that every man would believe in it. God, says Turretin, delights in the conversion and eternal life of the sinner as a thing pleasing in itself and congruous with his infinitely compassionate nature, and therefore demands from man as a duty due from him danquam officium debitum to turn if he would live substitute in this passage faith and repentance for conversion and eternal life and it is equally true it is the divine delight in faith and repentance and the divine desire for its exercise that warrants the offer of the benefits of christ's atonement to the non-elect plainly the offer of the atonement ought to be regulated by the divine desire and not by the aversion of the non-elect god in offering his own atonement should be guided by his own feeling and not by that of sinful man because the non-elect does not take delight in faith and repentance is surely no reason why god who does take delight in it should be debarred from saying to him turn ye turn ye for why will ye die may not god express his sincere feeling and desire to any except those who are in sympathy with him and have the same species of feeling if a man has a kind and compassionate nature it is unreasonable to require that he suppress its promptings in case he sees a proud and surly person who is unwilling to accept a gift the benevolent nature is unlimited in its desire it wishes well-being to everybody and hence its offers are universal they may be made to a churlish and ill-natured man and be rejected but they are good and kind offers nevertheless and they are none the less sincere though they accomplish nothing the universal offer of the benefits of christ's atonement springs out of god's will of complacency ezekiel thirty three eleven i have no pleasure in the death of the wicked but that the wicked turn from his evil way and live god may properly call upon the non-elect to do a thing that god delights in simply because he does delight in it the divine desire is not altered by the divine decree of, of preteritition though god decides not to overcome by special grace the obstinate aversion which resists common grace yet his delight in faith and repentance remains the same his desire for the sinner's faith and repentance is not diminished in the least by the resistance which it meets from the non-elect nor by the fact that for reasons sufficient he does not decide to overcome this resistance six it is the non-elect himself not god who prevents the efficacy of the atonement for the real reason of the inefficacy of christ's blood is impenitence and unbelief consequently the author of impenitence and unbelief is the author of limited redemption god is not the cause of a sinner's impenitence and unbelief merely because he does not overcome his impenitence and unbelief if a man flings himself into the water and drowns a spectator upon the bank cannot be called the cause of that man's death non-prevention is not causation the efficient and responsible cause of the suicide is the suicide's free will in like manner the non-elect himself by his impenitence and unbelief is the responsible cause of the inefficacy of christ's expiation god is blameless in respect to the limitation of redemption man is guilty in respect to it god is only the indirect and occasional cause of it man is the immediate and efficient cause of it this being the state of the case there is nothing self-contradictory in the universal offer of the atonement upon the part of god if either of the following suppositions were true it would be fatal to the universal offer a if at the time of offering christ's atonement god was actively preventing the non-elect from believing the offer would be inconsistent b if at the time of offering it god were working upon the will of the non-elect to strengthen his aversion to the atonement the offer would be inconsistent c if god were the efficient author of that apostasy and sinfulness which enslaves the human will and renders it unable to believe in christ without special grace then the offer of the atonement unaccompanied with the offer of special grace would be inconsistent but none of these suppositions are true seven 
the offer of the atonement is universal because when god calls upon men universally to believe he does not call upon them to believe that they are elected or that christ died for them in particular he calls upon them to believe that christ died for sin for sinners for the world that there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved that the blood of christ cleanseth from all sin and that there is no condemnation to them that are in christ jesus the atonement is not offered to an individual either as an elect man or as a non-elect man but as a man and a sinner simply men are commanded to believe in the sufficiency of the atonement not in its predestinated application to themselves as individuals the belief that christ died for the individual himself is the assurance of faith and is more than saving faith it is the end not the beginning of the process of salvation god does not demand assurance of faith as the first act of faith assurance of grace and salvation not being of the essence of faith true believers may wait long before they obtain it larger catechism eighty one in whom after ye believed ye were sealed with that holy spirit of promise ephesians one thirteen eight the atonement is to be offered to all because the preacher is to hope and expect from god the best and not the worst for every man he is consequently to expect the election of his hearer rather than his reprobation the fact of the external call favours election not reprobation the external call embraces the following particulars a hearing the word b religious education by parents and friends c common grace experienced in conviction of sin fear of death and judgment general anxiety and dissatisfaction with this life upon such grounds as these the individual is to be encouraged to believe that god's purpose is to elect him rather than to reprobate him if a person fears that he is of the non-elect he should be assured rather that he is mistaken in this fear than that he is correct in it because god has done more for him that tends to his salvation than to his perdition nine the atonement is to be offered to all men because even those who shall prove in the day of judgment to be non-elect do yet receive benefits and blessings from it turretin mentions the following benefits a the preaching of the gospel whereby paganism with its idolatry superstition and wretchedness is abolished b the extremes of human depravity are restrained c many temporal blessings and gifts of providence are bestowed romans two four acts fourteen seven d punishment is postponed and delayed acts seventeen thirty romans three twenty five the grace of the redeemer says bates is so far universal that upon his account the indulgent providence of god invited the heathen to repentance his renewed benefits that sweetened their lives romans two four and his powerful patience in forbearing so long to cut them off when their impurities were so provoking was a testimony of his inclination to clemency upon their reformation acts fourteen seventeen and for their abusing his favours and resisting the methods of his goodness they will be inexcusable to themselves and their condemnation righteous to their own conscience the reasons for the universal offer of the atonement thus far have had reference to god's relation to the offer they go to show that the act upon his part is neither self-contradictory nor insincere but there is another class of reasons that have reference to man's relation to the offer and these we now proceed to mention one the atonement is to be offered to every man because it is the duty of every man to trust in it the atonement is in this particular like the decalogue the moral law is to be preached to every man because it is every man's duty to obey it the question whether every man will obey it has nothing to do with the universal proclamation of the law it is a fact that the law will have been preached in vain to many persons but this is no reason why it should not have been preached to them they were under obligation to obey it and this justified its proclamation to them still more than this the moral law should be preached to every man even though no man is able to keep it perfectly in his own strength the slavery of the human will to sin is no reason why the primary and original duty which the human will owes to god should not be stated and enjoined because this slavery has been produced by man not by god in like manner faith in christ's atonement should be required as a duty from every man notwithstanding the fact that no man can come unto christ except the father draw him john six forty four that faith is not of ourselves but is the gift of god ephesians two eight and that christ is the author and finisher of faith hebrews twelve two man's inability without the grace of god to penitentially trust in christ's atonement being self-caused like his inability to perfectly keep the moral law without the same grace still leaves his duty in the case binding upon him the purpose of god to bestow grace is not the measure of man's duty neither is the power that man has as fallen the measure of man's duty only the power that man had as unfallen and by creation is the measure of it 
two the offer of christ's atonement for sin should be universal because it is the most impressive mode of preaching the law in exhibiting the nature of christ's sacrifice and its sufficiency to atone for all sin and especially in showing the necessity of it in order to the remission of any sin whatever the spirituality and extent of the divine law are presented more powerfully than they can be in any other manner the offer of the atonement is consequently a direct means of producing a sense of guilt and condemnation without which faith in christ is impossible three the offer of the atonement to an unbeliever is adapted to disclose the aversion and obstinacy of his own will this method of forgiving sin displeases him it is humbling if he were invited to make a personal atonement this would fall in with his inclination but to do no atoning work at all and simply to trust in the atoning work of another is the most unwelcome act that human pride can be summoned to perform belief in vicarious atonement is distasteful and repulsive to the natural man because he is a proud man when therefore a man is informed that there is no forgiveness of sin but through christ's atonement that this atonement is ample for the forgiveness of every man and that nothing but unbelief will prevent any man's forgiveness his attention is immediately directed to his own disinclination to trust in this atonement and aversion to this method of forgiveness but this experience is highly useful it causes him to know his helplessness even in respect to so fundamental an act as faith the consequence is that he betakes himself to god in prayer that he may be inclined and enabled to believe larger catechism fifty nine and sixty seven regeneration part one in the westminster symbol the application of redemption is attributed to a particular work of god denominated effectual calling the spirit applieth to us the redemption purchased by christ by working faith in us and thereby uniting us to christ in our effectual calling and this effectual calling is defined to be the work of god's spirit whereby convincing us of our sin and misery enlightening our minds in the knowledge of christ and renewing larger catechism sixty seven adds and powerfully determining our wills he doth persuade and enable us to embrace jesus christ freely offered to us in the gospel according to this definition the effectual call produces a conviction of conscience b illumination of understanding c renovation of the will d faith in christ's atonement everything in redemption runs back ultimately to god his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness two peter one three but such effects in the soul as conviction illumination renovation and faith imply a great change within it these are fruits and evidences of that spiritual transformation which in scripture is denominated a new birth a new creation a resurrection from the dead a death to sin and life to righteousness a passage from darkness to light consequently effectual calling includes and implies regeneration hence it is said in the westminster confession thirteen one that they who are effectually called and regenerated having a new heart and a new spirit created in them are farther sanctified in the westminster confession ten two effectual calling is made to include regeneration because man is said to be altogether passive until he is enabled to answer the call footnote in the older theological treatises regeneration commonly does not constitute a separate topic but is discussed under the head of vocation End footnote the term regeneration has been used in a wide and in a restricted sense it may signify the whole process of salvation including the preparatory work of conviction and the concluding work of sanctification or it may denote only the imparting of spiritual life in the new birth excluding the preparatory and concluding processes the romish church regards regeneration as comprehending everything in the transition from a state of condemnation on earth to a state of salvation in heaven and confounds justification with sanctification the lutheran doctrine stated in the apology for the augsburg confession and in the formula concordiae employs regeneration in the wide meaning but distinguishes carefully between justification and sanctification in the reformed church the term regeneration was also employed in the wide signification like the lutheran while carefully distinguishing between justification and sanctification the reformed theologian brought under the term regeneration everything that pertains to the development as well as to the origination of the new spiritual life regeneration thus included not only the new birth but all that issues from it it comprised the converting acts of faith and repentance and also the whole struggle with indwelling sin in progressive sanctification thus calvin remarks 
I apprehend repentance, poenatentiam, to be regeneration, regenerationem, the end of which is the restoration of the divine image within us. In this regeneration we are restored by the grace of Christ to the righteousness of God from which we fell in Adam, and this restoration is not accomplished in a single moment, or day, or year, but by continual, even tardy advances, the Lord destroys the carnal corruptions of his elect. Here, regeneration is employed to denote not merely the instantaneous act of imparting life to the spiritually dead, but also the processes of conversion and sanctification that result from it. This wide use of the term passed into the English theology. The divines of the 17th century very generally do not distinguish between regeneration and conversion, but employ the two as synonyms. Owen does this continually, on the spirit 3.5, and Charnock likewise, attributes practical atheism. The Westminster symbol does not use the term regeneration. Instead of it, it employs the term vocation or effectual calling. This comprises the entire work of the Holy Spirit in the application of redemption. Under it belongs everything pertaining to the process of salvation, from the first step of conviction of sin to the act of saving faith in Jesus Christ. Compare Fisher on the Catechism 31 and 32. The wide and somewhat vague use of the term regeneration was suggested by a few scripture texts. The Apostle in Ephesians 4, 22-25 gives the injunction, Put off the old man, put on the new man, and be renewed, ananeuste, in the spirit of your minds. In Romans 12, 2, he exhorts Christians to be transformed by the renewing, anakenosi, of their mind. In 2 Corinthians 4.16, he says that the inward man is renewed, ana que nunte, day by day. In these instances, as the uses of ana ne o o and ana que no o instead of genga o shows, the notion of molding or forming rather than that of regenerating is in St. Paul's mind. He is addressing those in whom the principle of the new life has been implanted, who have been born again, and now urges them to the exercise and nurture of the new life. Similarly, the prophet Ezekiel, 1831, addressing the house of Israel, the church of God, says, Make you a new heart and a new spirit. Here, the return from backsliding and the reformation and culture of the spiritual life, not the actual regeneration of the soul, are what is demanded. Neither of these two texts refers to regeneration in the restricted signification of the term. God does not in either of them command man to quicken himself, to create life from the dead, to command the light to shine out of darkness, to call things that be not as though they were. 2 Corinthians 4.6, Romans 4.17 In them both he exhorts regenerate but backsliding man, as he does the church at Ephesus, to repent and do the first works. Revelation 2.5 in the New Testament, the renewing of regeneration is denoted by ktizin, yengan, zoopuin, and that of sanctification by ana zeuste, Ephesians 4.23, ana keunte, 2 Corinthians 4.16, ana kenosis, Romans 12.2. But this wide use of the term regeneration led to confusion of ideas and views. As there are two distinct words in the language, regeneration and conversion, there are also two distinct notions denoted by them. Consequently, there arose gradually a stricter use of the term regeneration and its discrimination from conversion. Turretin defines two kinds of conversion, as the term was employed in his day. The first is habitual or passive conversion. It is the production of a habit or disposition of the soul. Conversio habitualis seo passiva fit per habitum supernaturalium infusionem a spiritu sancto. The second kind is actual or active conversion. It is the acting out in faith and repentance of this implanted habit or disposition. Conversio actualis seo activa fit per bonorum istorum habitum exercitium quo actus fidei et poenitente et dantur adeo et homine elicuntur. After thus defining, Turretin remarks that the first kind of conversion is better denominated regeneration because it has reference to that new birth by which man is renewed in the image of his maker, and the second kind of conversion is better denominated conversion because it includes the operation and agency of man himself. De Moore, on Mark, after distinguishing between conversio activa and passiva, 
says that the latter is synonymous with vocation. We shall adopt this distinction between regeneration and conversion. Regeneration, accordingly, is an act. Conversion is an activity or a process. Regeneration is the origination of life. Conversion is the evolution and manifestation of life. Regeneration is wholly an act of God. Conversion is wholly an activity of man. Regeneration is a cause. Conversion is an effect. Regeneration is instantaneous. Conversion is continuous. The doctrine of regeneration was taught by Christ to Nicodemus, John 3, 3 and 6. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. John 1, 13. The sons of God are born not of the will of man, but of God. It had been previously taught in the Old Testament, Ezekiel 11.19, I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of your flesh, and will give you a heart of flesh. Ezekiel 36.26, A new heart will I give you. Jeremiah 31.33, I will put my law in their inward parts, and write it in their hearts. The vision of dry bones, Ezekiel 37, taught the doctrine symbolically. Moses taught the doctrine in Deuteronomy 36. The Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart, and the heart of thy seed, to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul. Compare Psalm 51.10. Respecting regeneration, the following characteristics are to be noted. 1. Regeneration is solely the work of God. The terms employed in Scripture prove this. Creating anew, Ephesians 4.24. Begetting, James 1.18. Quickening, John 5.21, Ephesians 2.5 calling out of darkness into light, 1 Peter 2, 9, commanding the light to shine out of darkness, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, alive from the dead, Romans 6, 13, new creature, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, born again, John 3, 3 to 7, God's workmanship, Ephesians 2, 10. These terms denote a work of omnipotent power. The origination of life is impossible to the creature. He can receive life, he can nurture life, and he can use and exert life, but he cannot create life. 2. Regeneration, as the creative and life-giving act of God, produces an effect on the human understanding. It is illumination, enlightening the mind. Westminster Larger Catechism 67. God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, 1 Corinthians 2, 12 and 13. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, Ephesians 1.18, Philippians 1, 9, Colossians 3, 10, 1 John 4, 7, 5, 20, John 17, 5, Psalm 19, 7 and 8, 43, 3 and 4. The distinguishing peculiarity of the knowledge produced by regeneration is that it is experimental. By this is meant that the cognition is that of immediate consciousness. This is the highest and clearest form of cognition. When, for example, the truth that God is merciful is stated in language, the natural man understands the language grammatically and logically, but nothing more. He has no accompanying consciousness of God's mercy. In common phrase, he does not feel that God is merciful. But a knowledge that is destitute of inward consciousness is an inferior species. It is a blind man's knowledge of color. The blind man understands the phraseology by which the color is described. It conveys logical and self-consistent notions to his understanding, but it is unattended with sensation. Such a knowledge of color is inadequate. In reality is ignorance compared with that of a man possessed of vision. It is the knowledge of a sensuous object without any sensation. It is quasi-knowledge, such as Christ refers to when he says of the natural man, seeing he sees not and hearing he hears not. Illumination or instruction by the Holy Spirit implies, then, the production of an experimental consciousness of religious truth. In this respect, it differs from human teaching. This is alluded to in John 6.63, The words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. That is, they are spiritual life. Vital and conscious knowledge of religious truth is the effect of the operation of the Holy Spirit in the human understanding. One man can teach religious truth by grammatical propositions to another, but he cannot illumine his mind in respect to it. He can tell a man that God is holy, is love, that sin is hateful, and virtue is lovely, but he cannot impart the consciousness that God is holy, that God is love, that sin is hateful, that virtue is lovely. The production of an experience upon such subjects is the prerogative of God. Hence, all the unexperimental knowledge of the natural man upon religious subjects is denominated ignorance in Scripture. Said Christ to the Jews, Ye neither know me nor my Father, 
john eight nineteen to his disciples he said it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven matthew thirteen eleven this is life eternal to know thee the only true god and jesus christ whom thou hast sent john seventeen three no man knoweth the father save the son and he to whomsoever the son will reveal him matthew eleven twenty seven the book of proverbs and ecclesiastes are filled with the praise of a kind of knowledge which they represent sinful man to be destitute of and which is the gift of god christ the great high priest has compassion upon the ignorant hebrews five two scoffers are willingly ignorant two peter three five unbelieving jews were ignorant of god's righteousness romans ten three before regeneration men fashion themselves according to their lusts in ignorance one peter one fourteen the sinful condition of the pagan world is called a time of ignorance which god in his forbearance temporarily overlooked acts seventeen thirty sin is often denominated folly the psalmist mourning over the remainders of sin exclaims so foolish was i and ignorant psalm seventy three thirty two st paul explains the difference between the knowledge of the natural man and that of the regenerate in one corinthians two fourteen the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of god for they are foolishness unto him there is a wide difference says owen between the mind's receiving doctrines notionally and its receiving the things taught in them really the first a natural man can do it is done by all who by the use of outward means do know the doctrine of scripture in distinction from human ignorance and error hence men unregenerate are said to know the way of righteousness two peter two twenty one this true and real reception of divine truth according to owen denotes a an apprehension that these spiritual things agree with the divine attributes and express them the doctrine of gratuitous justification for example when received by the regenerate mind is perceived to accord with all the attributes of god and thus to be a manifestation of the glory of god b an apprehension that the particular spiritual thing is suited to the end proposed the death of christ for example is adapted in every way to meet the demands of god's holy nature and of man's sinful nature it is not foolishness but wisdom or an adaption of means to ends and is so perceived and understood by the spiritual man but not by the natural that there is this power of illuminating the understanding is proved by the fact that good men pray that it may be exercised psalm one hundred nineteen thirty four give me understanding and i shall keep thy law psalm one hundred nineteen sixty eight teach me thy statutes three regeneration with respect to the human will is renewal the westminster larger catechism question sixty seven describes one part of effectual calling as the renewing and powerfully determining of the will biblical texts that prove this are ezekiel eleven nineteen i will put a new spirit within you and i will take away the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh ezekiel thirty six twenty six and twenty seven psalm fifty one ten renew a right spirit within me hebrews thirteen twenty one may the god of peace make you perfect to do his will working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight romans nine sixteen it is not of him that willeth but of god that showeth mercy philippians two thirteen god worketh in you to will psalm one hundred ten three thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power two thessalonians three five the lord direct your hearts into the love of god those texts also which describe regeneration as a quickening prove that the will is renewed recurring to the distinction which we have made between inclination and volition or choice regeneration is to be defined as the origination of a new inclination by the holy spirit not as the exertion of a new volition or making a new choice by the sinner keeping this distinction in mind we say that in regeneration god inclines man to holiness and disinclines him to sin this change of the disposition of the will is attributable solely to the holy spirit the sinner discovers on making the attempt that he is unable to reverse his determination to self and the creature he cannot start a contrary disposition of his will he is unable to incline himself to god as the chief end of his existence he can choose the antecedents or preparatives to inclining but he cannot incline by a volition he can read his bible this is a preparative or antecedent to supreme love of god but it is not supreme love and cannot produce it by volitions he can listen to preaching and can refrain from vicious actions these also are preparatives or antecedents to a holy inclination of the will but are not this inclination itself and cannot produce it 
it is a fact of consciousness that while the sinner can put forth single volitions or particular choices that are favourable to a new voluntary disposition because they evince the need of it, he cannot begin the new disposition itself. He cannot incline himself by any volition whatsoever. The will, says Edwards, in the time of a leading act or inclination that is opposite to the command of God, is not able to exert itself to the contrary. The sinful inclination is unable to change itself, and for this plain reason that it is unable to incline to change itself. To employ a phrase of Edwards, the unregenerate is unable to be willing in the direction of holiness. The reason and ground of this inability has been explained in anthropology. The inability is voluntary in the sense that it is the consequence of an act of self-determination, and this act was the sin in Adam by which the human will became sinfully inclined. By the operation of the Holy Spirit in regeneration, the man is enabled to incline to holiness instead of sin. In the scripture phraseology he is made willing, Psalm 110.3. God works in him to will, Philippians 2.13. In the phraseology of the Westminster Statement, Larger Catechism 67, he is powerfully determined. By renewing the sinful and self-enslaved will, the Holy Spirit empowers it to self-determine or incline to God as the chief good and the supreme end. This new determination expels and takes the place of the old sinful self-determination. From this new self-determination or inclination or disposition or principle, holy volitions or choices proceed, and from the holy choices, holy actions. That God the Spirit possesses the power to originate an inclination to holiness in the human will is proved by the biblical representations. David frequently asks God to exert this power. Psalm 119.36, Incline my heart unto thy testimonies. Psalm 119.35, Make me to go in the path of thy commandments. Psalm 119.37, Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity. Psalm 51.10, Create in me a clean heart. Psalm 51.15, Open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. Isaiah 64.8, We are the clay, and thou our potter. Acts 16.14, The Lord opened the heart of Lydia, that she attended to the things which were spoken by Paul. The assurance of Christ that the Holy Spirit shall be given to every one that asks implies the power of the Spirit to incline the human will. While the operation of the Holy Spirit upon the human will is inexplicable, John 3.8, yet certain particulars are clear. a. The influence of the Spirit is distinguishable from that of the truth, for that of man upon man and from that of any instrument or means whatever. His energy acts directly upon the human soul itself. It is the influence of spirit upon spirit, of one of the Trinitarian persons upon a human person. Neither the truth nor a fellow man can thus operate directly upon the essence of the soul itself. It is in this respect that theologians have defined the influence of the Holy Ghost upon the human will to be physical. The physis, or essence of the Holy Spirit, operates upon the Fusis of the human spirit. In regeneration there is immediate contact between God and man. Spiritual essence touches spiritual essence. Yet there is no mingling or confusion of substance. God and man are two distinct and different beings, yet in regeneration they approach closer to each other than they do either in creation or providence. This fact is supported by the metaphors which describe the intimacy of the union between the believer and Christ. The one is the head and the other is a member of the same body. Christ is the very life of the regenerate soul. In two instances the church is called Christ. Galatians 3.16, to thy seed, which is Christ. 1 Corinthians 12.12, 12. Christ is formed in the believer. Galatians 4.19, it is also supported by the biblical statements respecting the working of the Holy Spirit in the soul. Romans 8.26 and 27, the Spirit maketh intercession. The operation of the Spirit is so intimate that his working cannot in consciousness be distinguished from that of the soul itself. The believer is a temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6.19 That the influence of the Holy Spirit is directly upon the human spirit, and is independent even of the word itself, is further proved by the fact that it is exerted in the case of infants without any employment of the truth. John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. Luke 1.15 Footnote. Maya, in loco, explains eti literally, still from his mother's womb. After birth, he was still the subject of the Holy Spirit's influences as he was before it. End footnote.
b by reason of this peculiarity in the operation of the holy spirit it does not force the human will it is purely spiritual agency exerted upon a spiritual being if matter could operate by contact and come upon the will and directly upon mind the consequence would be compulsion the two things are heterogeneous but when god operates directly upon man the two beings are homogeneous it is a scholastic maxim that quisquid recipitur recipitur in modum recipientis sensuous organs alone are adapted to receive sensuous impressions from objects of sense the immaterial spirit alone is adapted to receive an impression from the eternal spirit man's body cannot experience spiritual influences and his soul cannot be affected by matter c the operation of the holy spirit is in the will that of the truth and of man upon man is on the will the more interior an influence is the farther is it from being compulsory it is better able to work in accordance with the nature and constitution of that within which it works if it were operating up extra it would be more apt to work across or against the constitutional structure propriem est dei movere voluntatem maxime interius eam inclinando aquinas summa one hundred and five four four man is passive in regeneration he cannot actively originate spiritual life his relation to regeneration is that of a recipient this is a part of the meaning of passivity in this connection in that particular instant when the divine and holy life is implanted the soul of man contributes no energy or efficiency of any kind being dead in sin it cannot produce life to righteousness a corpse cannot originate animal life lazarus was passive at that punctum temporis when his body was reanimated the same is true of the soul of man in respect to regeneration but since regeneration is instantaneous the sinner's passivity is instantaneous also man is passive only for a moment during the twinkling of an eye god's regenerating act is like the sounding of the last trumpet the resurrection of dead bodies is instantaneous and the regeneration of dead souls is so likewise the doctrine that the sinner is passive in regeneration does not imply that the passivity extends over a great length or even any length of time in his existence on the contrary it is only a punctum temporis in his history up to that point of time he is active active in enmity to god after that point of time he is active in submission to god the carnal mind is enmity the spiritual mind is love enmity and love are activities of the soul between the carnal mind and the spiritual mind there is nothing but the instant of regeneration in this instant when the new life is imparted the activity is solely that of god the holy ghost five man cannot cooperate in regeneration this follows logically from the fact that he is passive in regeneration a dead man cannot assist in his own resurrection it also follows from the fact that cooperation implies some agreement between the parties god and the sinner must harmonize before they can work together two forces cannot cooperate unless they are coordinate and coincident forces but up to the instant of regeneration man is hostile to god the carnal mind is enmity toward god romans eight seven enmity cannot cooperate with love upon the semi-pelagian the tridentine and the arminian theory of depravity there may be cooperation but not upon the augustinian and calvinistic according to the former theories there are slight remainders of holiness in the natural man which though feeble can afford a point of contact and an element of force in his regeneration calvin attributes synergism to chrysostom and also to bernard and lombard in his institutes two two six lombard in order to establish the position that the human will performs its part in regeneration informs us that two sorts of grace are necessary one he calls operative by which we efficaciously will what is good the other cooperative which attends as auxiliary to a good will this division i dislike because while he attributes an efficacious desire of what is good to the grace of god he insinuates that man has of his own nature antecedent though ineffectual desires after what is good as bernard asserts that a good will is the work of god but yet allows that man is self-impelled to desire such a good will but this is very remote from the meaning of augustine from whom however lombard claims to have borrowed this distinction synergism is enunciated in the canons of the council of trent 
regeneration is explained as taking place by some cooperation of the will with the divine the will is said to be excited and assisted by divine grace similarly limborg says that grace is not solitary yet it is the primary cause of salvation for the cooperation of free will is due to grace as a primary cause for unless the free will had been excited excitatum by provenient grace it would not be able to cooperate with grace these are not the terms which the scriptures employ to excite and assist sinful man is not the same as to quicken and renew him to excite the human will is to stimulate it not to impart life excitement supposes some vitality which is in low tone and requires a tonic assistance implies that the will already has some force in the right direction which only needs to be added to this is very different from the view presented in ezekiel thirty seven fourteen i will put my spirit in you and ye shall live if there be some spiritual life in the natural man he can cooperate in regeneration but if he is dead in trespasses and sins ephesians two eleven he cannot the truth upon this subject is well stated in the westminster confession ten two this effectual call is of god's free and special grace alone not from anything at all foreseen in man who is altogether passive therein until being quickened and renewed by the holy spirit he is thereby enabled to answer the call and to embrace the grace offered and conveyed in it according to this statement man is passive until he is quickened after which divine act he is actively holy it is said by some that the sinful will has the power to cease self-determination to evil though it has not the power to self-determine or incline to good it can stop resistance to god though it can do nothing more but this would involve a cessation of all action in the will both sinful and holy action at the instant of regeneration and this would make the will characterless at this instant but in anthropology we have shown that the will cannot be inactive or destitute of an inclination either good or evil the will must be incessantly inclined in order to be a will as the understanding must be incessantly intelligent in order to be an understanding consequently the cessation of sinful inclination must be caused by the origination of holy inclination sin does not first stop and then holiness comes into the place of sin but holiness positively expels sin darkness does not first cease and then light enters but light drives out darkness sin goes out as chalmers phrases it by the expulsive power of a new affection consequently the regeneration of the will is the only way to stop the evil inclination of the will again it is said that there is receptivity for holiness in the fallen will though there is no energy to produce it but receptivity is more than capacity it is a faint desire or inclination hence st paul says that the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of god for they are foolishness unto him one corinthians two fourteen there is repulsion not recipiency in the natural man the carnal mind phronema is enmity against god romans eight seven when christ luke eighteen forty two said to the blind man receive thy sight there was no receptivity in the eye no favouring condition of the organ that facilitated the restoration of sight the causing of vision was wholly miraculous simultaneously with the words receive thy sight there was the exertion of creative power upon the sightless eye enabling it to the act of vision six regeneration is a work of god in the human soul that is below consciousness there is no internal sensation caused by it no man was ever conscious of that instantaneous act of the holy spirit by which he was made a new creature in christ jesus and since the work is that of god alone there is no necessity that man should be conscious of it this fact places the infant and the adult upon the same footing and makes infant regeneration as possible as that of adults infant regeneration is taught in scripture luke one fifteen he shall be filled with the holy spirit even from his mother's womb luke eighteen fifteen and sixteen suffer little children to come unto me for of such is the kingdom of god acts two thirty nine the promise is unto your children one corinthians seven fourteen now are your children holy infant regeneration is also taught symbolically a by infant circumcision in the old testament b by infant baptism in the new testament seven regeneration is not affected by the use of means in the strict signification of the term means the holy spirit employs means in conviction in conversion and in sanctification but not in regeneration 
the appointed means of grace are the word the sacraments and prayer none of these means are used in the instant of regeneration first because regeneration is instantaneous and there is not time to use them secondly because regeneration is a direct operation of the holy spirit upon the human spirit it is the action of spirit upon spirit of a divine person upon a human person whereby spiritual life is imparted nothing therefore of the nature of means or instruments can come between the holy ghost and the soul that is to be made alive god did not employ an instrument or means when he infused physical life into the body of adam there were only two factors the dust of the ground and the creative power of god which vivified that dust the divine omnipotence and dead matter were brought into direct contact with nothing intervening the dust was not a means or instrument by which god originated life so in regeneration there are only two factors the human soul destitute of spiritual life and the holy spirit who quickens it the dead soul is not an instrument by which spiritual life is originated but the subject in which it is originated when christ restored sight to the blind man he did it by creative energy alone without the use of means or instruments the light of day was not a means it contributed nothing to the result nor was the blind eye a means of originating vision when christ anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay mixed with spittle the act was symbolical probably but certainly the spittle was not a means employed by him to work the miracle in like manner the word and truth of god the most important of all the means of grace is not a means of regeneration as distinct from conviction conversion and sanctification this is evident when it is remembered that it is the office of a means or instrument to excite or stimulate an already existing principle of life physical food is a means of physical growth but it supposes physical vitality if the body is dead bread cannot be a means or instrument intellectual truth is a means of intellectual growth but it supposes intellectual vitality if the mind be idiotic secular knowledge cannot be a means or instrument spiritual truth is a means of spiritual growth in case there be spiritual vitality but if the mind be dead to righteousness spiritual truth cannot be a means or instrument truth certainly cannot be a means unless it is apprehended but the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of god neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned one corinthians two fourteen that regeneration is not affected by the use of means will appear from considering those cases in which means are employed one first the word and truth of god is a means of conviction because there is in the human conscience a kind of vitality that responds to the truth as convicting and condemning the apostasy did not kill the conscience stone dead if it had no fallen man could feel remorse adam's fall has benumbed and stupefied the conscience but there is still sufficient vitality left in it for it to be a distressing witness to man consequently the holy spirit employs truth as a means of exciting and stimulating the human conscience not of regenerating it in the strictest sense of the term the conscience is not made alive from the dead in the sense that the will is it has not lost all sensibility to moral truth it possesses some vitality that only needs to be stimulated and toned up this is done in conviction and by the use of truth as an instrument two secondly the word and truth of god is a means of conversion because regeneration has proceeded and has imparted spiritual life to the soul footnote in the case of an adult the precedence of regeneration to conversion is of order and nature only not of time regeneration immediately exhibits its fruit in the converting acts of faith and repentance in the case of infant regeneration there is an interval of time between regeneration and conversion End footnote there is now a spiritual vitality that can respond to the truth the understanding having been enlightened by regeneration when the particular truth that the blood of christ cleanseth from all sin is presented it is apprehended this truth is now spiritually understood and is no longer foolishness to the mind and the will having been renewed and powerfully determined or inclined this same cardinal truth is believed savingly the doctrine of vicarious atonement thus becomes a means of faith in christ and faith in christ works by sorrow for sin and love of holiness faith and repentance are converting acts they are the substance of conversion and are brought about by the use of the appropriate means by the presentation of evangelical truth to a soul in which the holy spirit has operated with regenerating grace three thirdly the word and truth of god is a means of sanctification upon the same principle 
regeneration and conversion precede sanctification by regeneration spiritual life is originated by conversion spiritual life is put in action and manifested of course then the means of sanctification find a spiritual vitality in the soul to which they are correlated the holy spirit employs the word sacraments and prayer afflictions and all the discipline of life as instruments by which he excites and induces the renewed man to struggle with indwelling sin and to endure unto the end but when we consider regeneration itself and look into the soul for a principle of life and power to be correlated to means or instruments of regeneration we do not find any the unenlightened understanding is unable to apprehend and the unregenerate will is unable to believe vital force is lacking in these two principal faculties what is needed at this point is life and force itself consequently the author of spiritual life himself must operate directly without the use of means or instruments and outright give spiritual life and power from the dead that is ex nihilo the new life is not implanted because man perceives the truth but he perceives the truth because the new life is implanted a man is not regenerated because he has first believed in christ but he believes in christ because he has been regenerated he is not regenerated because he first repents but he repents because he has been regenerated eight regeneration is the cause of conversion the holy spirit acts in regeneration and as a consequence the human spirit acts in conversion and as the act of regeneration is not divisible between god and man neither is the act of conversion the converting activity of the regenerate soul moves in two principal directions a faith which is the converting or turning of the soul to christ as the redeemer from sin b repentance which is the converting or turning of the soul to god as the supreme good regeneration is instantaneous conversion is continuous faith is gradual and unceasing and so is repentance but regeneration is effected completely and once for all in connection with the doctrine that god is the sole author of regeneration several particulars are to be noticed one the reason for expecting the regeneration of men is found in god's promise to bestow regeneration not in man's power to produce it in his discourse on the day of pentecost peter assigns as a reason for repenting and being baptized for the remission of sins the fact that god has promised remission to as many as he had called acts two thirty eight and thirty nine he expected to see men repent under his preaching because god had exalted jesus to be a prince and a saviour for to give repentance acts five thirty one and because god also to the gentiles had granted repentance unto life acts eleven eighteen similarly paul exhorts timothy to be gentle unto all men in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves if god peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth two timothy two twenty four the preacher should confidently expect faith and repentance to follow from his preaching because of god's purpose and promise to bestow regenerating grace in connection with preaching in order to this expectation it is not necessary that he should know who are the particular persons whom god has elected it is enough to know that god has made an immense election that he has formed a purpose to regenerate a multitude which no man can number out of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues revelation seven nine two a second ground of hope and expectation that sinners will be regenerated is the fact that under the gospel dispensation god's regenerating grace is being continually exerted the holy ghost actually accompanies the faithful preacher of the word the prophets preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, 1 Peter 1.12. The Holy Spirit, as a regenerating spirit, is actually poured out among mankind. There is not a moment in which he does not regenerate many souls. Men are being born spiritually all the time, as men are being born physically all the time. 3. A third reason for the expectation that sinners will be regenerated is the fact that God has promised to pour out the regenerating spirit in answer to the prayers of the church the church can obtain the holy spirit for the sinful world bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse and prove me saith the lord of hosts if i will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing malachi three ten if ye being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children how much more shall your heavenly father give the holy spirit to them that ask him luke eleven thirteen the outpouring of the spirit at pentecost was an answer to the prayer of the church the question here arises what is man's relation to regeneration the answer is that his agency is not in regeneration itself but in the work of conviction which is preparatory or antecedent to regeneration 
the term preparative as used by the augustinian and calvinist is very different from its use by the semi-pelagian and arminian the former means by it conviction of sin guilt and helplessness the latter employs it in the sense of a preparative disposition or a favouring state of heart this is referred to in the westminster confession nine three a natural man is not able to convert himself or prepare himself thereunto the tenth of the thirty-nine articles also excludes the semi-pelagian preparatives to regeneration we have no power to do good works acceptable to god without the grace of god by christ preventing us that we may have a good will and working with us when we have that good will in the semi-pelagian use a preparative denotes some faint desires and beginnings of holiness in the natural man upon which the holy spirit according to the synergistic theory of regeneration joins having this sense of the term in view Whitsius says let none think it absurd that we now speak of means of regeneration when but a little before we rejected all preparatives for it owen on the other hand denies means and asserts preparatives of regeneration yet owen and Whitsius agree in doctrine in the calvinistic system a preparative to regeneration or a means of it is anything that demonstrates total lack of holy desire and his need of regeneration it is consequently not a part of regeneration but something prior and antecedent to it there is a work performed in the soul previous to the instantaneous act of regeneration as there is a work performed in the body previous to the instantaneous act of death a man loses physical life in an instant but he has been some time in coming to this instant so man gains spiritual life in an instant though he may have had days and months of a foregoing experience of conviction and sense of spiritual death this is the ordinary divine method except in the case of infants john the baptist was sent to preach the law in order to make ready a people prepared for the lord luke one seventeen conviction of sin in this instance was an antecedent or preparative to the regenerating work of the holy spirit but no part of regeneration itself there is a grace of god that goes before regenerating grace and makes the soul ready for it it is common or provenient grace man's work in respect to regeneration is connected with this moved and assisted by common or provenient grace the natural man is to perform the following duties in order to be convicted of sin and know his need of the new birth one reading and hearing the divine word romans ten seventeen faith cometh by hearing matthew thirteen nine who hath ears to hear let him hear the spirit of god maketh the reading but especially the preaching of the word an effectual means of enlightening convincing and humbling sinners of driving them out of themselves and drawing them unto christ larger catechism one five five two serious application of the mind and examination of the truth in order to understand and feel its force luke eight eighteen take heed how ye hear for whosoever hath to him shall be given says owen should men be as intent in their endeavours after knowledge in spiritual things as they are to skill in crafts sciences and other mysteries of secular life it would be much otherwise with them the use of these means of conviction under common grace produces a illumination in regard to the requirements of the law and failure to meet them this is not the spiritual illumination of the regenerate mind one corinthians two fourteen but the legal illumination referred to in two corinthians seven ten b conviction and distress of conscience c reformation of the outward life regeneration part two three prayer for the gift of the holy spirit both as a convicting and a regenerating spirit which is commanded by christ in luke eleven nine and thirteen i say unto you ask and it shall be given you if ye being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children how much more shall your heavenly father give the holy spirit to them that ask him that prayer for regenerating grace is a duty and a privilege for the unregenerate man is proved a by the fact that the holy spirit is promised generally under the gospel as a regenerating spirit ezekiel thirty six twenty four and twenty seven i will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and i will put my spirit within you a new heart will i give you joel two twenty eight to thirty two it shall come to pass that i will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be delivered this is quoted by peter on the day of pentecost in accordance with these scriptures the westminster confession teaches that god promises to give unto all those who are ordained to life his holy spirit to make them willing and able to believe 
all men are to call upon the name of the lord for the gift of the holy spirit thus promised because no man has the right to assert that he is of the non-elect or to affirm this of another man as christ's atonement is offered indiscriminately so the holy spirit is offered indiscriminately and this warrants every man in asking for what is offered b by the fact that a man must obtain the gift of the holy spirit as a regenerating spirit before he can obtain it as a converting and sanctifying spirit the holy ghost is not given as a converting and a sanctifying spirit until he has been given as a regenerating spirit regeneration is the very first saving work in the order and this therefore is the very first blessing to be asked for make the tree good and his fruit good matthew twelve thirty three except a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of god john three three no man has any warrant or encouragement to pray either for conversion or for sanctification before he has prayed for regeneration whoever therefore forbids an unregenerate man to pray for regenerating grace forbids him to pray for any and all grace in prohibiting him from asking God to create within him a clean heart, he prohibits him altogether from asking for the Holy Spirit. C. By the fact that the Church is commanded to pray for the outpouring of the Spirit upon unregenerate sinners in order to their regeneration, it is not supposable that God would command the Church to pray for a blessing upon sinners which sinners are forbidden to ask for themselves. To recapitulate, then, we say that the sinner's agency in respect to regeneration is in the antecedent work of conviction, not in the act of regeneration itself. The Holy Spirit does not ordinarily regenerate a man until he is a convicted man, until, in the use of the means of conviction under common grace, he has become conscious of his need of regenerating grace. To the person who inquires, how am I to obtain the new birth, and what particular thing am I to do respecting it? The answer is, find out that you need it, and that your self-enslaved will cannot originate it. And when you have found this out, cry unto God the Holy Spirit, create in me a clean heart, and renew within me a right spirit. And this prayer must not cease until the answer comes, as Christ teaches in the parable of the widow and the unjust judge, Luke 18, to 8 when men are convicted of sin and utter helplessness they are a people prepared for the lord luke one seventeen a sense of guilt and danger is a preparative to deliverance from it a convicted man is a fit subject for the new birth but an unconvicted man is not a person who denies that he is a guilty sinner before god or that sin deserves endless retribution or who has no fears of retribution is not prepared for the regenerating work of the spirit it is true that the holy spirit who is free to work with means without means above means and against means can convict a sinner without his cooperation if he pleases an utterly careless and thoughtless person is sometimes by the power of god the spirit suddenly filled with remorse and terror on account of his sins and sometimes a convicted person does his utmost to repress conviction and get rid of moral anxiety and the divine spirit will not permit him to succeed but this is not to be counted upon the sinner is commanded to cooperate with the Holy Spirit in the work of conviction. Quench not the Spirit, 1 Thessalonians 5.19, is enjoined upon him as well as upon the believer. He must endeavour to deepen, not to dissipate, the sense of sin which has been produced in his conscience, or he is liable to be entirely deserted by the Spirit, and left to his own will, and be filled with his own devices. The sinner cannot cooperate in the work of regeneration, but he can in the work of conviction this preparative of conviction does not make the sinner deserving of regeneration god is not obliged to overcome the sinner's self-determination to sin because the sinner knows that he cannot overcome it himself the sinner's helplessness does not make him meritorious of salvation because it is self-produced but it does make him a suitable subject for the exercise of god's unmerited compassion in regenerating grace one thing is important, therefore, in giving advice to an unregenerate person, namely to remind him of the danger of legality and self-righteousness. He must not suppose that by the use of the means of conviction, reading and hearing the word of God, avoiding all associations and practices that dissipate seriousness and quench conviction and prayer that God would apply the truth to his conscience, he is doing a meritorious work that obliges God to the regenerating act. He must not imagine that by doing his own part, as it is sometimes said, he can necessitate God to do his. This would make regeneration a debt, not grace. It would make it depend upon the sinner's action, and not, as St. Paul says, upon God's purpose according to election, Romans 9.11. The sinner must not require beforehand an infallible certainty that he will be regenerated as the condition of his using the means of common grace in conviction. He must not say to the Most High, I will do my part, provided thou wilt do thine. 
he must proceed upon a probability remembering all the while that he merits not and has no claim to the new birth after his best endeavours he must look up as the leper did saying lord if thou wilt thou canst make me clean he must do as the preacher does in regard to the regeneration of his hearers the preacher does not say to the lord i will preach thy word upon condition that thou wilt regenerate every one to whom i preach but he does as paul bade timothy in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves if god peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth two timothy two twenty five and as the preacher has ample encouragement to preach because of the general promise that god's word shall not return to him void so every convicted sinner has ample encouragement to look up for god's grace in christ for the new heart and right spirit which come only from this source and are promised generally under the gospel dispensation the language of edwards accords with the scripture representations though god has not bound himself to anything that a person does while destitute of faith and out of christ there is great probability that in a way of hearkening to this counsel you will live and that by pressing onward and persevering you will at last as it were by violence take the kingdom of heaven those of you who have not only heard the directions given but shall through god's merciful assistance practice according to them are those that probably will overcome of the same tenor is the following from davies men say to us you teach us that faith is the gift of god and that we cannot believe of ourselves why then do you exhort us to it how can we be concerned to endeavour that which is impossible for us to do i answer to this i grant that the premises are true and god forbid that i should so much as intimate that faith is the spontaneous growth of corrupt nature or that you can come to christ without the father's drawing you but the conclusions you draw from these premises are very erroneous i exhort and persuade you to believe in jesus christ because it is while such means as preaching the gospel are used with sinners and by use of them that it pleases god to enable them to comply or to work faith in them i would therefore use those means which god is pleased to bless to this end i exhort you to believe in order to set you upon the trial to believe for it is putting it to trial and that only which can fully convince you of your own inability to believe and till you are convinced of this you can never expect strength from god I exhort you to believe, because sinful and enfeebled as you are, you are capable of using various preparatives to faith. You may attend upon prayer, preaching, and all the outward means of grace, with natural seriousness. You may endeavour to get acquainted with your own helpless condition, and, as it were, place yourself in the way of divine mercy. And though all these means cannot of themselves produce faith in you, yet it is only in the use of these means that you are to expect divine grace to work it in you never was it yet produced in one soul while lying supine lazy and inactive compare owen works two two seven two and following edition russell the speculative difficulties connected with the doctrine of regeneration arise from the fact that men put their questions and make objections from the viewpoint and position of the unconvicted sinner they deny that they are helpless sinners, or they deny that sin deserves endless punishment, or they deny that sin requires vicarious atonement in order to its remission. A mind that is speculatively in this state is not prepared for regenerating grace. These are not the antecedents of regeneration. Such opinions as these must be given up, and scriptural views must be adopted before the Holy Spirit will create the new heart or even if there be no heterodoxy yet if the orthodox truth be held in unrighteousness if the person does not reflect upon the truth and makes no effort to know his guilt and danger but lives on in thoughtlessness and pleasure this state of things must be changed by a serious application to his own case of the law of god the person must become an anxious inquirer as a preparative to regeneration the questions about man's relation to regeneration will give no serious trouble to any convicted man to any one who honestly acknowledges he is a guilty and a helpless sinner and seeks deliverance from the guilt and bondage of sin the questions will then answer themselves one it is objected that the prayer of the unregenerate is sinful this proves too much because it would preclude any action whatever by the unregenerate man the hearing of the word by the unregenerate is sinful but the unregenerate is not forbidden to hear upon this ground the thinking of the wicked like his ploughing is sin all the acts of the unregenerate are sinful because none of them spring from supreme love to god yet some of them are better preparatives for or antecedents to god's work of regeneration than others attendance upon public worship is better adapted to advance a man in the knowledge of his spiritual needs than attendance upon the theatre 
prayer is better adapted than prayerlessness to bring a blessing to the soul. Behold, he prayeth was mentioned as a hopeful indication in the case of Saul of Tarsus. An act, says Owen, may be good as to the matter of it, though sinful as to the form, for example, hearing the word by the unregenerate, and an act may be bad both as to the matter and the form, for example, pleasure-seeking on the Sabbath by the unregenerate. The former act is to be preferred rather than the latter. The former act is positively commanded of God, the latter is positively forbidden. The Westminster Confession teaches that works done by unregenerate men, although for the matter of them they may be things which God commands, yet because they do not proceed from faith, are sinful and cannot please God. And yet their neglect of them is more sinful and displeasing unto God than their performance of them. If the presence of sin in the soul is a reason why an unregenerate man may not pray for regenerating grace, then it is a reason why the regenerate man may not pray for sanctifying grace. A regenerate man's prayer is mixed with sin. If then a person may not pray until he is regenerated, neither may he pray until he is perfectly sanctified. If the existence of sin is a reason for not praying in one case, it is in the other. 2. It is objected, secondly, that only the prayer of faith is infallibly granted. But this is no reason why a prayer that will probably be granted should not be offered. Prayer for sanctification supposes previous regeneration. This is the prayer of faith and is heard in every instance. But it does not follow that the prayer for regeneration which God is able to answer, and which he encourages convicted sinners to hope that he will answer, should not be put up, because infallible certainty is not connected with the answer. Probability of an answer is good reason for asking for regenerating grace. The fact that the prayer of the unregenerate does not deserve an answer does not prove that God will not answer it. The prayer of the regenerate does not deserve an answer on the ground of merit. A. The first reason why prayer for sanctification is infallibly certain to be granted, while that for regeneration is not, is that God has bound himself by a promise in the former case, but not in the latter. The former is connected with a covenant, the latter is not. God has promised to sanctify every believer without exception who asks for sanctification, but he has not promised to regenerate every convicted sinner without exception who asks for regeneration. Regeneration is according to the purpose of God in election, and election does not depend upon any act of the creature, be it prayer or any other act. Consequently, the convicted sinner's prayer cannot infallibly secure regeneration, as the believer's prayer can sanctification. Whenever regenerating grace be implored, the sovereignty of God in its bestowment must be recognized. The words of St. Paul apply here. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, 2 Timothy 2.25. The words of the prophets also, Let every man cry mightily unto God, who can tell if God will turn and repent, that we perish not. Jonah 3.9. Rend your heart and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, who knoweth if he will return and repent, and leave a blessing behind him. Joel 2.13 and 14. The words of the leper must always be a part of the prayer for regenerating grace. If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Mark 1.40. When it is said that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, Joel 2.32, Acts 2.21, Romans 10.13, the prayer of the convicted may be meant, and the general fact is that it will be answered. Footnote. Compare, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me, and my word shall not return unto me void. These texts do not mean that every single individual shall be saved, but describe the general and common effect of the gospel. End footnote. Or the prayer of the regenerate for sanctification may be meant. Whosoever shall believingly and penitently call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. B. A second reason why the answer to prayer for regeneration is optional and sovereign, while that for sanctification is not, is that in the latter instance it is a means to the end, while in the former it is not. The prayer for sanctification is a part of the process of sanctification, but the prayer for regeneration is not a part of regeneration. Prayer as a divinely appointed means infallibly secures its end, but prayer as an appointed antecedent, and not a means, is accompanied with probability, not absolute certainty. Because God has not bound himself by a covenant to hear the prayer of every convicted sinner without exception, it by no means follows that he does not hear such a prayer, and that it is useless for such a person to pray. He has heard the cry of multitudes of this class. 
it is his general rule under the gospel economy to hear this cry the highest probability of success therefore attends the prayer of an anxious and convicted person for regenerating grace this is ample encouragement for him to call upon the merciful and mighty god for what he needs namely a heart of flesh in place of the stony heart it is not true that god never granted the prayer of an unregenerate man such men in peril have called upon god to spare their lives and have been heard this is taught in psalm 107 verses 10 to 14 convicted men from a sense of danger and the fear of the wrath to come have prayed for the salvation of their souls from perdition and god has saved them in such cases god has granted the petition not because it was a holy one or because it merited to be granted but because the blessing was needed and because of his mercy to sinners in christ calvin mentions the prayers of jotham judges nine twenty and of samson judges sixteen twenty eight as instances in which the lord complied with some prayers which nevertheless did not arise from a calm or well-regulated heart whence it appears that prayers not conformable to the rules of the divine word are nevertheless efficacious but in addition to the fact that the prayer of a convicted sinner may have an effect upon god and be answered favourably it also has an effect on the person himself and prepares for the regenerating act of god no man can study the divine word and receive legal illumination from it without having some sense of danger awakened and giving utterance to it in prayer even if the prayer be only the cry of fear and is not accompanied with filial trust and humble submission it is of use the prayer by its very defects prepares for the new birth by showing the person his need of it the person in distress asks for a new heart the answer does not come immediately the heart is displeased is perhaps made more bitter and rebellious by this experience the holy spirit discloses to the unregenerate man more and more of the enmity of the carnal mind and the impotence of the self-enslaved will this goes towards preparing him for the instantaneous act of regeneration it is says owen in no way inconsistent that faith should be required previously unto the receiving of the spirit as a spirit of sanctification though it be not so as he is the author of regeneration and the reason he assigns is that in the instance of sanctification prayer is a means while in the instance of regeneration prayer is not a means but a preparative he discusses the point in the following manner may a person who is yet unregenerate pray for the spirit of regeneration to effect that work in him for whereas as such he is promised only to the elect such a person not knowing his election seems to have no foundation to make such a request upon answer one election is no qualification on our part which we may consider and plead in our supplications but is only the secret purpose on the part of god of what himself will do and is known to us only by its effects two persons convinced of sin and a state of sin may and ought to pray that god by the effectual communications of his spirit unto them would deliver them from that condition this is one way whereby we flee from the wrath to come three the especial object of their supplications herein is sovereign grace goodness and mercy as disclosed in and by jesus christ such persons cannot indeed plead any especial promise as made unto them but they plead for the grace and mercy declared in the promises as indefinitely proposed unto sinners it may be that they can proceed no further in their expectations but unto that of the prophet who knoweth if god will come and give a blessing joel two fourteen yet is this a sufficient ground and encouragement to keep them waiting at the throne of grace so paul after he had received his vision from heaven continued in great distress of mind praying until he received the holy ghost acts nine nine and seventeen four persons under such convictions have really sometimes the seeds of regeneration communicated unto them and then as they ought to so they will continue in their supplications for the increase and manifestation of it when our lord john fourteen seventeen asserts that the world cannot receive the holy spirit because it seeth him not neither knoweth him the reference is to the holy spirit as the spirit of sanctification christ is speaking of him as the comforter who augments and strengthens already existing spiritual life but if the world that is the unregenerate are incapable of receiving the holy ghost in his regenerating office they cannot be regenerated there is the highest encouragement in the word of god to pray for the regenerating grace of the holy ghost it is a duty enjoined upon all men without exception like that of hearing the word 
If ye, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Luke 11.14 Thou, Lord, art plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Psalm 86.5 The Lord is nigh to all them that call upon him. Psalm 145.18 The Lord is rich unto all that call upon him. Romans 10.12 Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he is near, Isaiah 55, 6. I will that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, 1 Timothy 2, 8. Behold, he prayeth, Acts 9, 11. Thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come, Psalm 65, 2. These and other similar texts relate to spiritual gifts. They invite and command men universally and indiscriminately to ask God for the Holy Spirit in any of his operations, as the first and best of his gifts. Prayer, being one special part of religious worship, is required by God of all men. Westminster Confession 21.3 While regeneration is a sovereign act of God, according to election, it is an encouraging fact both for the sinner and the preacher of the word that God's regenerating grace is commonly bestowed where the preparatory work is performed. This is the rule under the gospel dispensation. He who reads and meditates upon the word of God is ordinarily enlightened by the Holy Ghost, perhaps in the very act of reading or hearing or meditating. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Acts 10.44 He who asks for regenerating grace may be regenerated, perhaps in the act of praying, God has appointed certain human acts whereby to make ready the heart of man for the divine act. Without attentive reading and hearing of the word and prayer, the soul is not a fit subject for regenerating grace. By fitness is not meant holiness or even the faintest desire for holiness, but a conviction of guilt and danger, a sense of sin and utter impotence to everything spiritually good. Such an experience as this breaks up the fallow ground to employ the scripture metaphor. Jeremiah 4.3, Hosea 10.12. When the Holy Ghost finds this preparation, then he usually intervenes with his quickening agency. The effect of prevenient grace in conviction is commonly followed by special grace in regeneration. The fact of the outward call is a reason both for the sinner and the minister of the word for expecting the inward call. Yet regeneration, after all the preparation that has been made by conviction and legal illumination, depends upon the sovereign will of God. The wind bloweth where it listeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. John 3, 8. Regeneration rests upon God's election and not upon man's preparative acts, upon special grace and not upon common grace. It follows consequently that the unregenerate man should be extremely careful how he deals with common grace. If he suppresses conviction of sin and thus nullifies common grace, then God may withdraw all grace. This was the case with some of the Jews. For they, being willingly ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, did not submit themselves to the righteousness of God, and because of unbelief were broken off. Romans 10.3, 11.20 The same is true of some nominal Christians. God has sovereignty and liberty in respect to regenerating grace. When a person has stifled conviction, God sometimes leaves him to his self-will forever. Yet observation shows that the Holy Spirit suffers long and is very patient and forbearing with convicted men, that he does not hastily leave them even when they disobey his admonitions, but continues to strive with them and finally brings them to faith and repentance. Upon this general fact in the economy of redemption, that the right use of common grace is followed by regenerating grace, both the sinner and the preacher should act. In this respect both are like other men. The farmer has no stronger motive than that of probable success for sowing grain, the merchant for sending out ships, the manufacturer for erecting factories. Salvation is in the highest degree probable for any person who earnestly and diligently uses common grace and the means of common grace. It is to be confidently expected that a convicted man will be made a new man in Christ Jesus. Every lost man ought to be thankful for such an encouraging probability. But to insist beforehand upon infallible certainty, and especially a certainty that is to depend upon his own action, is both folly and sin. It is folly to suppose that so weak and fickle a faculty as the human will can make anything an infallible certainty, and it is sin to attempt to divide the glory of regenerating the human soul between the Holy Spirit and the soul itself. 3. 
it is objected thirdly that to pray for regeneration is to delay faith and repentance the sinner is commanded immediately to believe on christ and turn from his sin with godly sorrow but praying for regeneration is dallying with the use of means it is an excuse for procrastination to this it is to be replied a that prayer for regeneration is a prayer that god the holy spirit would work instantaneously upon the heart and would immediately renew and incline the will there would be force in this objection if the sinner were taught that there are means of regeneration and were exhorted to supplicate god to regenerate him at some future time through his own use of these means but he who truly prays for regenerating grace despairs of all agency in the use of means and precludes all procrastination by entreating an immediate and instantaneous act on the part of god by which he shall this very instant be delivered from the death and bondage of sin and be brought into the life and liberty of the gospel he implores god who commanded the light to shine out of darkness to shine in his heart to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of god in the face of jesus christ two corinthians four six he asks the son of god who quickeneth whom he will john five twenty one to enliven his spirit now dead in trespasses and sins ephesians two one consequently prayer for regenerating grace is an evidence that the convicted person has come to know that the word sacraments and prayer all the means of grace are inadequate to reanimate the soul and make it alive to righteousness it is not until he has discovered that legal conviction legal illumination resolutions to reform external reformation reading and hearing the word and prayer itself cannot change the heart that he leaves all these behind him and begs god immediately and instantaneously to do this needed work in his soul the prayer for regenerating grace is in truth the most energetic and pressing act that the sinner can perform it is the farthest removed of any from procrastination it is an immediate act on the part of the sinner and it entreats god to do an instantaneous work within him in this manner prayer for the instantaneous gift of regenerating grace harmonizes with the gospel call to immediate faith and repentance faith and repentance naturally and necessarily result from regeneration whoever is regenerated will believe and repent footnote the regenerate child youth and man believes and repents immediately the regenerate infant believes and repents when his faculties will admit of the exercise and manifestation of faith and repentance in this latter instance regeneration is potential or latent faith and repentance End footnote. to pray therefore for instantaneous regeneration is virtually to pray for instantaneous faith and repentance and vice versa he who prays help thou mine unbelief take away the stony heart and give the heart of flesh prays that god would renew and powerfully determine the will which is the definition of regeneration at the same time prayer for regenerating grace must not be substituted for the act of faith and repentance the direction is believe on the lord jesus christ this is the biblical answer to the question what must i do to be saved but when the convicted person discovers that the act of faith is hindered and prevented by the blindness of his understanding and the bondage of his will to sin and asks if he may implore the enlightening and quickening energy of the holy spirit to persuade and enable him to embrace jesus christ freely in the gospel shorter catechism thirty one he is to be answered in the affirmative in imploring the regenerating grace of the holy spirit he is striving to enter in at the straight gate he is endeavouring to believe on the lord jesus christ the act of faith in the blood of christ in its own nature is simple and easy my yoke is easy and my burden is light matthew eleven thirty but considered in reference to the pride and self-righteousness of the natural heart faith is impossible without regeneration hence the frequent statement in calvinistic creeds that man needs to be persuaded and enabled to this act conversion conversion is the action of man which results from regeneration as the etymology implies it is turning towards converto a certain point and away from a certain point conversion consists of two acts one faith two repentance faith is turning to christ as the ground of justification and away from self as the ground repentance is turning to god as the chief end of existence and away from the creature as the chief end faith and repentance are converting acts the first having principal reference to justification the second to sanctification the first to the guilt of sin the second to its corruption 
the westminster confession defines faith in jesus christ as a saving grace whereby we receive and rest upon him for salvation there is a difference between belief a census and faith fiducia. the first is assent to testimony the last is assent to testimony and also trust in the person who gives the testimony justifying faith not only assenteth to the truth of the promise but receiveth and resteth upon christ for pardon larger catechism seventy two there may be belief without faith a man may credit the statements made by jesus christ and yet not rest in him for salvation faith is a saving grace but belief is not all who are not skeptics believe the testimony of christ and his apostles but not all who are not skeptics have faith faith is accompanied with love belief is not the devils believe and tremble the natural man believes that god is merciful but does not trust in his mercy this distinction is marked in the new testament by the use of the prepositions connected with the verb or noun pistevo when used in reference to christ is accompanied with en is and epi because the object is to denote rest and reliance upon his person paul said to the jailer believe on pistevson epi the lord jesus christ and thou shalt be saved he did not bid him merely to believe that the statements which he had heard from paul respecting christ were correct he bade him do much more than this namely receive and rest on christ himself as a living and personal redeemer had he asked only for the assent of the mind to testimony he would have said believe the lord jesus christ the same use of the prepositions is sometimes associated with the gospel because of its connection with christ repent and believe pistevete en the gospel mark one fifteen even when there is no preposition pistevo sometimes denotes trust christ did not commit himself uc e pisteven e afton john two twenty four who will commit to your trust the true riches this pistevsi luke sixteen eleven unto them were committed the oracles epistevthesan romans three two the gospel of circumcision was committed to me galatians two seven i know whom i have believed or trusted in or pepistevka two timothy one twelve an instance of mere belief in testimony is found in mark eleven thirty one why did ye not believe him theati uc epistevsate after this fiducial or confiding nature of faith is taught in the phrases looking to christ receiving christ eating his flesh drinking his blood the definition which makes faith merely belief in testimony converts christ into a witness only he is this but much more a prince and saviour a prophet priest and king a person not to be believed merely but to believe in and on faith is an effect of which regeneration is the cause this is taught in one john five one whosoever believeth that jesus is the christ is born of god philippians one twenty nine unto you it is given in behalf of christ to believe on him two thessalonians one eleven we pray that god would fulfil in you all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power one corinthians two five that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men but in the power of god john six forty four and sixty five no man can come to me except the father which hath sent me draw him no man can come unto me except it were given him of my father one peter one twenty one by him do you believe in god that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in god the order and connection between regeneration and faith is taught by our lord after announcing the doctrine of regeneration to nicodemus in john three three except a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of god he then in john three fourteen to eighteen proceeds to speak of his own atonement for sin and of man's trust in it the son of man must be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life that great change which christ denominates being born again manifests itself first of all in an act of reliance upon christ's blood of atonement saving faith in the person and work of the redeemer follows regeneration and always presupposes it the following particulars are to be noted one evangelical faith is an act of man the active nature of faith in christ is indicated in the scripture phraseology which describes it as coming to christ matthew eleven twenty eight looking to christ john one twenty nine receiving christ john three eleven following christ john eight twelve 
the object of the epistle of james is to teach that faith is an active principle dead faith the epistle defines to be faith without works that is pretended faith that does not work the hypocrite merely says that he has faith james two fourteen two evangelical faith is an act of both the understanding and the will it is complex involving a spiritual perception of christ and an affectionate love of him a that faith is an intelligent act is proved by john six forty four to forty five they shall be all taught by god every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the father cometh unto me two corinthians three fourteen four four ephesians one seventeen and eighteen god giveth the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of christ one john two twenty ye have an unction from the holy one and ye know all things b that faith is an affectionate and voluntary act is proved by galatians five six faith worketh by love ephesians six twenty three peace be to the brethren and love with faith from god the father ephesians three seventeen four sixteen five two colossians two two one thessalonians three twelve five eight one timothy one fourteen two timothy one thirteen hold fast the form of sound words in faith and love which is in christ jesus three evangelical faith is the particular act that unites the soul to christ for this reason it stands first in the order of the acts that result from regeneration the holy spirit applieth to us the redemption purchased by christ by working faith in us and thereby uniting us to christ in our effectual calling shorter catechism thirty penitence for sin love of holiness hope long-suffering patience temperance etc are none of them acts by which christ's atonement for sin is laid hold of and made personal trusting faith is the special exercise of the soul by which this is done and hence faith is the first thing commanded believe on the lord jesus christ and thou shalt be saved acts sixteen thirteen this is the work of god that ye believe on him whom he hath sent john six twenty nine footnote the priority in the order of faith to all other acts is illustrated by the following anecdote in a beautiful new england village a boy lay very sick drawing near to death and very sad his heart longed for the treasure which was worth more to him now than all the gold of the western mines one day i sat down by him took his hand and looking in his troubled faith asked him what made him sad uncle said he i want to love god won't you tell me how to love god i cannot describe the piteous tones in which he said these words and the look of anxiety which he gave me i said to him my boy you must trust god first and then you will love him without trying to at all with a surprised look he exclaimed what did you say i repeated the exact words again and i shall never forget how his large hazel eyes opened on me and his cheek flushed as he slowly said well i never knew that before i always thought that i must love god first before i had any right to trust him no my dear boy i answered god wants us to trust him that is what jesus always asks us to do first of all and he knows that as soon as we trust him we shall begin to love him this is the way to love god put your trust in him first of all then i spoke to him of the lord jesus and how god sent him that we might believe in him and how all through his life he tried to win the trust of men how grieved he was when men would not believe in him and every one who believed came to love without trying at all he drank in all the truth and simply saying i will trust jesus now without an effort put his young soul into christ's hands that very hour and so he came into the peace of god which passeth understanding and lived in it calmly and sweetly to the end End footnote. The union with Christ by faith is not natural and substantial like that between Adam and his posterity, nor is it moral and social like that between individuals in a corporation or state. Its characteristics are the following. A. It is a spiritual union because of its author, the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6.17 He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. 1 Corinthians 12.13 By one spirit are we all baptized into one body. 1 John 3.24 Hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. 1 John 4.13 b. It is a vital union because it involves a divine and spiritual life derived from Christ. John 14.19 Because I live, ye shall live also. John 11.25 He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Galatians 2.20 I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. c. It is an eternal union john ten twenty eight 
they shall never perish neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand romans eight thirty five to thirty nine who shall separate us from the love of christ one thessalonians four fourteen and seventeen d it is a mystical that is mysterious union the elect are mystically joined to christ larger catechism sixty seven ephesians five thirty two this is a great mystery i speak concerning christ and the church the spiritual union between christ and his people is individual not specific it does not rest upon unity of race and nature it results from regeneration not from creation consequently it is not universal but particular upon this spiritual and mystical union rests the federal and legal union between christ and his people because they are spiritually vitally eternally and mystically one with him his merit is imputable to them and their demerit is imputable to him the imputation of christ's righteousness supposes a union with him it could not be imputed to an unbeliever because he is not united to christ by faith four saving faith terminates on christ as its object and upon christ in all three of his offices prophet priest and king since however guilt is a prominent fact in man's condition the priestly office is prominent in relation to faith as described in scripture under the levitical economy faith was indispensable the typical sacrifice must be offered trusting in the promise of god concerning the messiah merely to bring and slay a lamb as an opus operatum was not sufficient there must be filial reverence for the divine command and confidence in the divine promise of mercy through the coming redeemer the second effect of regeneration is repentance the word metanua denotes a change of mind nous but mind is employed in the sense of disposition will or inclination as in romans seven twenty five with the mind noi i myself serve the law of god it is an instance in which nous is put for cardia see anthropology page one hundred and thirty the word metamelome is sometimes employed to denote the genuine sorrow that accompanies repentance matthew twenty one twenty nine afterwards he repented and went two corinthians seven eight though i made you sorry i do not repent though i did repent matthew twenty one thirty two and ye when ye had seen it repented not afterwards that ye might believe him hebrews seven twenty one the lord swore and will not repent in matthew twenty seven three it denotes the impenitent remorse of judas but metanua not metamelia is the technical term in the new testament for repentance the difference between penitence and remorse is described in two corinthians seven nine and ten penitence is godly sorrow and is one of the elements in repentance the definition of repentance in the westminster confession fifteen two comprises the following particulars a a sense not only of the danger but of the odiousness of sin b the apprehension of god's mercy in christ c grief for and turning from sin footnote sorrow for sin must be carefully distinguished from shame on account of it the impenitent experience shame for sin and they awake to shame and everlasting contempt daniel twelve two a person may feel degraded by his vices and ashamed of them without any sincere grief for them as committed against god such feeling as this is selfish while godly sorrow is disinterested a man may be vexed and angry with himself and despise himself without any humble prostration of soul before god and confession of guilt a sense of the meanness and disgrace of sin is not the sense of its odiousness and ill desert End footnote. d the purpose and endeavour to walk in god's commandments ezekiel thirty six thirty one then shall ye remember your evil ways and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities psalm fifty one four against thee thee only have i sinned that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and clear when thou judgest two corinthians seven eleven that ye sorrowed after a godly sort what carefulness is wrought in you yea what indignation what fear what vehement desire what zeal Ezekiel eighteen thirty and thirty one, Joel two twelve and thirteen, Amos five fifteen, Psalm one hundred and nineteen one hundred and twenty eight, Jeremiah thirty one eighteen and nineteen. I have heard Ephraim bemoaning himself thus: Thou hast chastised me as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. Turn thou unto me, and I shall be turned, for thou art the Lord my God though faith and repentance are inseparable and simultaneous, yet in the order of nature faith precedes repentance zechariah twelve ten 
they shall look on me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son acts eleven twenty two a great number believed and turned unto the lord this order is evinced by the following particulars a faith is the means and repentance is the end faith leads to repentance not repentance to faith the scriptures present god's mercy in redemption as the motive to repentance jeremiah three fourteen turn o backsliding children saith the lord for i am married unto you joel two thirteen turn unto the lord your god for he is gracious and merciful b repentance involves turning to god but there can be no turning but through christ john fourteen six no man cometh unto the father but by me john ten nine i am the door c if repentance precedes faith then it stands between the sinner and christ the sinner cannot go to christ just as he is but must first make certain that he has repented d if repentance precedes faith then none but the penitent man is invited to believe in christ this contradicts romans five six christ died for the ungodly impenitent sinners are commanded to believe on the lord jesus christ in order to the remission of their sins e the doctrine that repentance precedes faith tends to make repentance legal that is a reason why christ should accept the sinner f god out of christ and irrespective of faith in christ is a consuming fire deuteronomy four twenty four hebrews twelve twenty nine it is impossible to have godly sorrow with this view of god only remorse and terror are possible in such passages as Mark one fifteen, Repent ye and believe the gospel, and Acts twenty twenty one, testifying repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ, the end is mentioned first and the means last. In a proposition, a term may have a position verbally, which it has not logically. In Jeremiah thirty one thirty four, sanctification is mentioned before pardon. They shall all know me, for I will forgive their iniquity. Footnote melanchthon taught that repentance was the effect of the law and anterior to faith and used forms of expression which were thought to imply that good works or sanctification although not the ground of justification were nevertheless a causa sine qua non of our acceptance with god to this luther objected as true sanctification is the consequence and in no sense the condition of the sinner's justification we are not justified because we are holy but being justified we are made holy hodge theology three two three eight end footnote justification justification is one of the most important doctrines in the christian system it supposes faith and faith supposes regeneration whosoever believeth that jesus is the christ is born of god one john five one i will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts for i will forgive their iniquity and will remember their sin no more jeremiah thirty one thirty three to thirty four this order is given in the larger catechism question sixty seven the mind being enlightened and the will being renewed the person is enabled to accept christ as offered in the gospel faith unites with christ and union with christ results in justification this is defined in the shorter catechism question thirty three to be an act of god's free grace wherein he pardoneth all our sins and accepteth us as righteous in his sight only for the righteousness of christ imputed to us and received by faith acts thirteen thirty eight to thirty nine through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of moses Romans three twenty three to twenty four all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans four five to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly his faith is counted for righteousness. Romans four six to eight five seventeen to nineteen eight thirty one Corinthians one thirty of God are ye in Christ Jesus of whom is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption 2 corinthians 5 19 and 21 ephesians 1 7 2 8 philippians 3 9 jeremiah 23 6 habakkuk 2 4 the just justified shall live by his faith the justification of a sinner is different from that of a righteous person the former is unmerited the latter is merited the former is without good works the latter is because of good works the former is pardon of sin and accepting one as righteous when he is not the latter is pronouncing one righteous because he is so 
the former is complex, the latter is simple. The justification of the ungodly, Romans 4, 5, 5, 6, includes both pardon and acceptance. Either alone would be an incomplete justification of the ungodly. In the case of a sinner, the law requires satisfaction for past disobedience and also perfect obedience. When a criminal has suffered the penalty affixed to his crime, he has done a part, but not all that the law requires of him. He still owes a perfect obedience to the law in addition to the endurance of the penalty. The law does not say to the transgressor, if you will suffer the penalty, you need not render the obedience. But it says, you must both suffer the penalty and render the obedience. Sin is under a double obligation. Holiness is under only a single one. A guilty man owes both penalty and obedience. A holy angel owes only obedience. Consequently, the justification of a sinner must not only deliver him from the penalty due to disobedience, but provide for him an equivalent to personal obedience. Whoever justifies the ungodly must lay a ground both for his delivery from hell and his entrance into heaven. In order to place a transgressor in a situation in which he is vikeos, or right in every respect before the law, it is necessary to fulfill the law for him both as penalty and precept. Hence the justification of a sinner comprises not only pardon, but a title to the reward of the righteous. The former is specially related to Christ's passive righteousness, the latter to his active. Christ's expiatory suffering delivers the believing sinner from the punishment which the law threatens, and Christ's perfect obedience establishes for him a right to the reward which the law promises. The right and title in both cases rest upon Christ's vicarious agency. Because his divine substitute has suffered for him, the believer obtains release from a punishment which he merits, and because his divine substitute has obeyed for him, the believer obtains a reward which he does not merit. The meaning of the term justify must be determined by its scripture use and connection, and not by the etymology merely. It may have two meanings, like glorify and sanctify. To glorify God and to glorify the body are different significations of the word. The one signifies to declare to be glorious, the other to make glorious. The clause, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, employs the term sanctify differently from the clause, ye are sanctified. Similarly, to justify might mean to make just, justum facere, as well as to pronounce just, but in scripture it never means to sanctify or make inwardly holy. In the New Testament, the verb dekeo signifies a to pronounce or declare to be just, Luke 7.29, and the publicans justified God, Romans 3.4, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, b to acquit from condemnation, Acts 13.39, justified from all things from which ye could not be justified in the law of Moses. Romans 4, 5-7, 5-1 and 9, 8, 30-33, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, Galatians 2, 16, 3, 11. That dikeo does not mean sanctifying or making just is proved by its antithesis to condemning, Deuteronomy 25, 1, Proverbs 17, 15, Isaiah 5, 23, 2 Chronicles 18, 6 and 7, and by its equivalents, imputing righteousness and covering sin, Romans 4, 3, 6 to 8, 2 Corinthians 5, 19 and 21. In order to be justified or pronounced righteous, a person must possess a righteousness, the kiosune, upon the grounds of which the verdict is pronounced. There are two kinds of righteousness upon the ground of which a person might be justified before the divine law. A. Legal righteousness, or that of the covenant of works. This is perfect personal conformity to the law. Romans 10.5 Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which perfectly doeth those things shall live by them. A holy being is justified by this kind of righteousness. A sinner cannot be pronounced righteous upon the ground of legal righteousness or perfect obedience, because he has not rendered it. Romans 3.20 By the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. Romans 3.10 There is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23 Acts 13.39 Galatians 2.16 The impossibility of man's being justified by legal righteousness is relative, not absolute. If he had rendered perfect obedience, he would be pronounced just upon this ground. The doers of the law shall be justified, Romans 2.13. b. Gratuitous or evangelical righteousness, 
or that of the covenant of grace. This is technically denominated the righteousness of God. Matthew 6.33, Romans 1.17, 3.5, 21, 22, 25, and 26, 10.3, 2 Corinthians 5.21, Philippians 3.9, 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. The Old Testament teaches it. The Lord our righteousness, Jeremiah 23.6, 33.16. It is so denominated to distinguish it from the ordinary ethical or legal righteousness, which is the righteousness of man. In Romans 10.3, this latter is called Ivian Degiosunen, and in Philippians 3.9, Emen Degiosunen. If man should perfectly obey the law, the righteousness would be the result of his own agency. It would be his own righteousness. But the righteousness of God is the result of God's agency solely. Hence, it is described, Romans 4, 6, as choris ergon, supply anthropo, choris ergon. Man is not the author of it in any sense whatever. The righteousness of God is the active and passive obedience of incarnate God. It is Christ's vicarious suffering of the penalty and vicarious obedience of the precept of the law which man has transgressed, it is Christ's atoning for man's sin and acquiring a title for him to eternal life. It is gratuitous righteousness because it is something given to man outright without any compensation or equivalent being required from him in return. Ho, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat, yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Isaiah 55.1 being justified gratuitously, Dorian, by his grace, Romans 3.24. Since this evangelical righteousness of God is not inherent and personal to man like the legal or ethical righteousness of the law, it has to be imputed to him. Romans 4.6. David describeth the blessedness of the man to whom God imputeth righteousness. Romans 4.9 and 10. Christ's atoning death for sin is not the sinner's atoning death for sin, but God imputes it to him, that is, he calls or reckons it his. Christ's perfect obedience, which merits eternal life, is not the sinner's perfect obedience, but God imputes it to him. He calls or reckons it his. Genesis 15, 6, Romans 4, 3 and 5, Abraham believed God and it was counted, Elohiste, to him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. James 2.23 Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. We have just observed that in order that a person may be pronounced just, there must be a reason or ground for the verdict. Justification cannot be groundless and without a reason. The righteousness of God is the ground or basis upon which a believing sinner is pronounced to be righteous. Because Christ has suffered the penalty for him, he is pronounced righteous before the law in respect to its penalty and is entitled to release from punishment. Because Christ has perfectly obeyed the law for him, he is pronounced righteous before the law in respect to its precept and is entitled to the reward promised to perfect obedience. To pardon a believer and accept him as if he had rendered the sinless obedience which entitles to eternal reward is to impute the righteousness of God to him. The following particulars in connection with the justification of a sinner are to be noted. 1. Faith is the instrumental, not the procuring or meritorious cause of his justification. God justifieth not by imputing faith itself, the act of believing, but by imputing the obedience and satisfaction of Christ. Westminster Confession 11.1 1. The reasons are a. Because faith is an internal act or work of man. If the sinner's act of faith merited the pardon of his sin and earned for him a title to life, he would be pronounced righteous because of his own righteousness and not because of God's righteousness. Faith is denominated a work. John 6.29, this is the work of God that ye believe. It is the activity of the man, like hope and charity, and can no more be meritorious of reward or atoning for disobedience than these acts can be. In a right conception, fides est opus, if I believe a thing because I am commanded, this is opus. Footnote. For the Tridentine view of justification adopted partially by a Protestant, see Jeremy Taylor's sermon, Faith Working by Love. Coleridge refers to this defect in Jeremy Taylor, Works 5195. 
yet in an earlier period in his life he fell into the same error himself. See the Friend Works 2288 Editor Harper. End footnote. Selden Table Talk. B. Because, as an inward act of the believer, faith is the gift of God, being wrought within him by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 2.8, Philippians 1.29 but a divine gift cannot be used as if it were a human product and made the ground of pardon and eternal reward a debt to god cannot be paid by man out of god's purse though it can be so paid by god himself c because the believer's faith is an imperfect act as such it cannot be either atoning or meritorious d because faith is not of the nature of suffering and consequently cannot be of the nature of an atonement the believing sinner is justified by faith only instrumentally as he lives by eating only instrumentally eating is the particular act by which he receives and appropriates food strictly speaking he lives by bread alone not by eating or the act of masticating and strictly speaking the sinner is justified by christ's sacrifice alone not by his act of believing in it Two, the justification of a sinner is solely by Christ's satisfaction. No man may look at his own graces as a part of his legal righteousness in conjunction with Christ's righteousness as the other part. We must go wholly out of ourselves and deny and disclaim all such righteousness of our own. Baxter, Spiritual Peace and Comfort. Bacon's Edition, 1, 2, 7, 3 justification does not depend partly upon the merit of christ's work and partly upon that of the believer the tridentine theory is heretical at this point because it makes the believer's justification to rest upon christ's satisfaction in combination with inward sanctification and outward works scripture explicitly teaches that justification is by faith alone not by faith and works combined a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law romans three twenty eight paul's faith alone in this passage must not be confounded with james's faith that is alone james two seventeen the latter is spurious faith and produces no works or dead faith three the justification of a sinner is instantaneous and complete it is a single act of god which sets the believer in a justified state or condition romans eight one there is no condemnation to them that are in christ jesus Romans 8, 33 and 34, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Who is he that condemneth? John 5, 24, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation. 4. The justification of a sinner is an all-comprehending act of God. All the sins of a believer, past, present, and future, are pardoned when he is justified. The sum total of his sin, all of which is before the divine eye at the instant when God pronounces him a justified person, is blotted out or covered over by one act of God. Consequently, there is no repetition in the divine mind of the act of justification, as there is no repetition of the atoning death of Christ upon which it rests. Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands that he should offer himself often, for then must he have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself and as he was once offered to bear the sins of many unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation for by one offering hath he perfected for ever them that are sanctified hebrews nine twenty four to twenty eight ten fourteen while, however, there is no repetition of the divine act of justification, yet the consequences of it in the soul of the believer are consecutive. In the believer's experience, God is continually forgiving his sins. The divine mercy is constantly absolving us by a perpetual remission of our sins. Calvin Institutes 3, 14, 10. The one eternal act of justification is executed successively in time, as the divine decree is. God doth from all eternity decree to justify all the elect. Nevertheless, they are not consciously justified until the Holy Spirit doth in due time actually apply Christ unto them. Westminster Confession 11.4 When a justified man commits sin, though his sin deserves eternal death, yet he is not exposed to eternal death as an unbeliever is, and as he himself was prior to justification. 
but he experiences the withdrawal of the divine favour and god's paternal chastisement this may be very severe and painful and perhaps sometimes in the believer's experience may be almost equal to the distress of the unpardoned david's experience during his backslidings was fearful in the extreme psalm 116 3 the sorrows of death compassed me and the pains of hell get hold of me psalm 32 4 day and night thy hand was heavy upon me my moisture is turned into the drought of summer psalm 42 7 all thy waves and thy billows are gone over me here in this life the believer oftentimes suffers more than the unbeliever does god deals with the former as with a son and causes him great mental distress for his soul's good he deals with the latter as with a bastard and not a son hebrews 12 8 lazarus in this life suffered more than dives did at the same time the true believer under all this experience is really and in the eye of god a justified and forgiven man the believer himself may be in great doubt upon this point and sometimes may be on the brink of despair but he is not cast off by god david himself after those dreadful passages in his experience is enabled to hope in the divine pity he never falls into the absolute despair of the lost psalm seventy one three thou hast given commandment to save me psalm forty two five why art thou cast down o my soul hope thou in god for i shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance some writers in this reference distinguish between actual and declarative justification cunningham and buchanan make this distinction actual justification is the act in the divine mind declarative justification is the announcement of the divine act in the consciousness of the believer the believer's experience has its fluctuations and varieties but the act of god is one and immutable a person may be actually justified with little or even no confident and joyful sense of it in some chapters of his experience yet a justified man will not absolutely lose the hope of justification and have the experience of blaspheming despair five the justification of a sinner includes a title to eternal life as well as deliverance from condemnation this is denoted by the clause accepting as righteous in the westminster definition eternal life as a reward rests upon perfect obedience of the law had man rendered this obedience he could claim the reward he has not rendered it and hence cannot claim it yet he must get a title to it or he can never enjoy it the rewards of eternity must rest upon some good basis and reason they cannot be bestowed groundlessly christ the god man has perfectly obeyed the law god gratuitously the rean choris ergon imputes this obedience to the believer and the believer now has a right and title to the eternal life and blessedness founded upon christ's theanthropic obedience this is the second part of justification the first part being the right and title to exemption from the penalty of the law founded upon christ's atoning sacrifice justification thus includes the imputation of christ's obedience as well as of his suffering of both his active and his passive righteousness piscator tillotson wesley and emmons denied the imputation of christ's active obedience contending that justification is pardon alone without acceptance or title to life they maintain that after the pardon of the believer's sin on the ground of christ's passive obedience sanctification by the holy spirit ensues and this earns the title to eternal life the objections to this theory are the following a the obedience of the believer is imperfect but eternal life is the recompense of perfect obedience the believer cannot claim such an immense reward for such an inferior service b even if after his regeneration the believer's obedience were perfect and sinless he has been disobedient previously but eternal life is promised only to a perfect obedience from the beginning of man's existence to the end of it for these two reasons the believer cannot establish a valid title to an infinite and eternal reward upon the ground of his imperfect and halting service of god here in this life he must therefore found it upon the perfect obedience of his redeemer and expect entrance into heaven because his substitute has obeyed for him even as he expects to escape retribution because his substitute has suffered for him the reason why the believer must press forward after perfect sanctification is that he may be fit for heaven not that he may merit heaven sinless perfection in the next life is not the ground and reason of the believer's future reward but the necessary condition of his future blessedness if there be remaining sin there must be so far unhappiness passages of scripture that prove the imputation of christ's active obedience are the following 
Romans 5.19, through the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. 1 Corinthians 1.30, Christ is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This righteousness is complete and therefore includes a title to the reward of righteousness. Colossians 2.10, ye are complete in him. Ephesians 1.6, he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Ephesians 3.12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence. The boldness and confidence imply that there is no deficiency in the justification effected for the believer by Christ. But if he were resting his title to eternal life upon his own character and works, he could be neither bold nor confident in the day of judgment. 1 John 4.17 John 3.16, whosoever believeth shall not perish. This is pardon, but shall have eternal life. This is acceptance as righteous. It is objected that the believer is represented as being rewarded for his works and in proportion to his works in the last day. The reply is, a. The reward of the last day is gracious, resulting from a covenant and promise on the part of God. It is the recompense of a parent to a child, not the payment of a debtor to a creditor. God is not under an absolute indebtedness to the believer, founded on an independent agency of the believer, but only a relative obligation established by himself and depending upon his assistance and support in the performance of the service. This is proved by the fact that the reward of a Christian is called an inheritance. Matthew 25.34, Acts 20.32, Galatians 3.18, Ephesians 5.5, 5, Colossians 1.12. The believer's reward is like a child's portion under his father's will. This is not wages and recompense in the strict sense, and yet it is relatively a reward for filial obedience. If an angel under the legal covenant fails to keep the law in a single instance, he gets no reward. A redeemed man under the evangelical covenant, though he often fails, yet gets his reward. God graciously compensates the believer in Christ because he is fatherly and compassionate towards his child, and not because the reward has been completely earned and is strictly due upon the principle of abstract justice. Where remission of sins, says Calvin, has been previously received, the good works which follow are estimated by God far beyond their intrinsic merit, for all their imperfections are covered by the perfection of Christ, and all their blemishes are removed by his purity. Now, if any one urge as an objection to the righteousness of faith that there is a righteousness of works, I will ask him whether a man is to be reputed righteous on account of one or two holy actions, while in all the other actions of his life he is a transgressor of the law. This would be too absurd to be pretended. I will then ask him if a man is to be reputed righteous on account of many good works, while he is found guilty of any instance of transgression. This, likewise, my opponent will not presume to maintain in opposition to the law which pronounces a curse upon those who do not fulfill every one of its precepts. I will then further inquire if there is any work of man which does not deserve the charge of impurity or imperfection. Thus he will be compelled to concede that there is not an absolutely good work to be found in man that deserves the name of righteousness in the strict sense. Eternal life is called a gift in Romans 6.23, while eternal death is called wages. Again, the address of the judge in the last day to those who receive the reward of obedience is, Come ye blessed. The reward is also a blessing. This would not be the language of a debtor who is discharging strict indebtedness to his creditors. The redeemed also, when receiving their reward, disclaim absolute merit. When saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? b. The object in considering the works of men in the final judgment is to evince the genuineness of faith in Christ, and discriminate true from false believers, not to show that man's works merit pardon and eternal life. Those who have done good works are described as humble and surprised that they receive such an immense recompense for their poor service, while those who have not done good works are described as self-righteous and proud and surprised they are punished and not rewarded. Matthew 7.22, Many shall say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Matthew 25.44, then those on the left hand shall answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee. The parable of the labourers, all of whom received the same wages, though hired at different times, proves that the rewards of the last day are not regulated by the exact value of the obedience rendered. 
since the reward is the consequence of a promise and not of an original obligation on the part of God, God may do as he will with his own. He never pays less than he has promised, thereby becoming himself a debtor. The Lord in the parable did not, but he may pay more than is due, and does pay more. An error of the perfectionist at this point is to be noticed. It is confounding imputed sanctification with inherent sanctification. Imputed sanctification is mentioned in 1 Corinthians 1.30. Christ was, of God, made unto us sanctification. Inherent sanctification is inward holiness, as in 1 Corinthians 6.11, ye are sanctified. In the former sense, a believer's sanctification is instantaneous and perfect, but not in the latter. When God imputes Christ's act of obedience to the believer, Christ is made sanctification to him. It is a complete sanctification that is imputed, and his title to life founded upon it is perfect. But his inward sanctification or cleansing from indwelling sin is still imperfect. Sanctification as imputed is a part of justification, but sanctification as infused and inherent is the antithesis to justification. The perfectionist overlooks this distinction. 6. Justification is a means to an end. Men are justified in order that they may be sanctified, not sanctified in order that they may be justified. Redemption does not stop with justification. Romans 8.30 Whom he justified, them he also glorified. John 8.11 Neither do I condemn thee, i.e. I pardon thee. Go and sin no more. Pardon is in order to future resistance and victory over sin. The sense of forgiveness is accompanied with a hatred of sin and hunger after righteousness. If the latter be wanting, the former is spurious. An unpardoned man could not be sanctified because remorse and fear of retribution would prevent struggle with sin. David prays first for forgiveness in order that he may obey in future. Psalm 51, 7 and 13 Purge, atone, me with hyssop. Hide thy face from my sins, then will I teach transgressors thy ways. Sanctification the term sanctify, agiazin, is employed in scripture in two senses. A. To consecrate or set apart to a sacred service or use. John 10.36, whom the Father hath sanctified and sent. Matthew 23.17, the temple that sanctifieth the gold. B. To purify and make holy. 1 Corinthians 6.11, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified. Hebrews 13.12, John 17.17, 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. The latter is the sense in which it is taken when the doctrine of sanctification is discussed. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, question 35, defines as follows. Sanctification is the work of God's free grace, whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God, and are enabled more and more to die unto sin and live unto righteousness. Ephesians 1.4, God hath chosen us that we should be holy. 1 Corinthians 6.11, ye are washed, ye are sanctified by the Spirit of our God. 2 Thessalonians 2.13, God hath chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. 1. Sanctification results from the continuation of the agency of the Holy Spirit after the act of regeneration a. In strengthening and augmenting existing graces, faith, hope, charity, etc. b. In exciting them to exercise, through reading and hearing the word, the sacraments, prayer, providences, afflictions and chastisements. Hence it is often called renewing, Psalm 51.10, 2 Corinthians 4.16, Ephesians 4.23, Colossians 3.10, Romans 12.2, Titus 3.5. Renewing or renovation in this use of the term is not synonymous with regeneration. When St. Paul exhorts the Ephesians 4.23 to be renewed in the spirit of their mind, he is not exhorting them to regenerate themselves, but to sanctify themselves. So also with the exhortation to the house of Israel, make you a new heart, Ezekiel 18.31. 2. Sanctification includes the entire man. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless. Sanctification affects a. the higher rational and spiritual part of man's nature, the pnefma, because this has been corrupted by the fall. Titus 1.15, Romans 1.28, Ephesians 4.18. b. the inferior intelligence, the psuche. c. the body, soma. 
as apostasy began in the pnevma and affected the other parts of human nature so sanctification begins in the pnevma and passes throughout the soul and body a man can control his physical appetites in proportion as he has a vivid spiritual perception of god and divine things the intuition of the pnevma restrains the appetites of the psuche and soma if spiritual perception be dim the bodily appetite is strong that the higher nature denominated pnevma or nous is depraved and needs to be sanctified is proved by romans one twenty eight twelve two ephesians four seventeen two timothy three eight titus one fifteen mark one twenty three one thessalonians five twenty three three sanctification is gradual we are enabled more and more to die to sin it is the conflict with and victory over indwelling sin described in romans seven fourteen to eight twenty eight the eighth chapter of romans as well as the seventh speaks of the struggle and groaning of the still partially enslaved will even we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit groan within ourselves waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body for we are saved by hope likewise the spirit also helpeth our infirmities and maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered Romans eight twenty three twenty four and twenty six. Four, the means of sanctification are a internal, namely faith. Galatians five six, faith worketh by love. Hope, Romans five five, hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Joy, one Peter one eight and nine, in whom ye rejoice with joy unspeakable, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Peace. Philippians 4 7 the peace of God shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus the exercise of any one of these Christian graces increases the holiness of the believer b external the scriptures John seventeen seventeen sanctify them through thy truth 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 22 and 23 chapter 2 verse 2 desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby prayer John fourteen thirteen and fourteen whatsoever ye shall ask in my name I will do it Acts two forty two providential discipline John fifteen two every branch in me that beareth not fruit he purgeth Romans five three and four Hebrews twelve five to eleven the sacrament of the supper Acts two forty two they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers five the believer cooperates with God the Spirit in the use of the means of sanctification. Sanctification is both a grace and a duty. 1 Corinthians 16.13 Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. Ephesians 6.16 and 18 Take the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance. Philippians two twelve and 13. Work out your own salvation, for it is God which worketh in you. Hence sanctification is the subject of a command. Ephesians four twenty two and 23. Put off the old man, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Ezekiel eighteen thirty one. Make you a new heart and a new spirit. Regeneration, being the sole work of God, is a grace, but not a duty. It is nowhere enjoined upon man as a duty to regenerate himself. 6 sanctification though progressive is not complete in this life 1 john 1 8 and 10 if we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves philippians 3 12 to 14 brethren i count not myself to have apprehended but i press towards the mark romans 7 18 and 23 i know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing i see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind galatians 5 7 sanctification is completed at death the souls of believers at their death are made perfect in holiness shorter catechism 37 hebrews 12:23 the perfect jerusalem contains the spirits of just men made perfect 1 john 3:2 we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is 2 corinthians 5:8 absent from the body and present with the lord ephesians 5:27 Christ loved the church, that he might sanctify it, and present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle. 1 Corinthians 13.12 Now we see through a glass darkly, but when that which is perfect is come, face to face. Matthew 5.8 The pure in heart shall see God. Revelation 14.13 Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. 7. 
sanctification once begun is never wholly lost it fluctuates with the fidelity of the believer but he never falls back into the stupor and death of the unregenerate state larger catechism seventy nine they whom god hath sanctified by his spirit shall constantly persevere to the end and be saved john ten twenty eight and twenty nine my sheep shall never perish neither shall any pluck them out of my hand romans eleven twenty nine the gifts and calling of god are without repentance philippians one six he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of jesus christ one peter one five believers are kept by the power of god through faith unto salvation exhortations to diligence and warnings against carelessness and failure are consistent with the certain perseverance of the believer because a while the certainty is objective in god it may not be subjective in man god knows that a particular man will certainly persevere because he purposes that he shall and he will realize his purpose by the operation of his spirit within him but the man does not know this unless he has assurance of faith many believers do not have this highest degree of faith and hence are more or less subject to doubts and fears exhortations to diligence and warnings against apostasy suit such an experience as this but one who is assured of salvation by the witness of the holy spirit would not require to be warned against apostasy while in this state of assurance b exhortations to struggle with sin and warnings against its insidious and dangerous nature are one of the means employed by the holy spirit to secure perseverance the decree of election includes the means as well as the end now if success in the use of means is certain there is the strongest motive to employ them but if success is uncertain then there is little motive to use them st paul employs the certainty of success as a motive to struggle fight the good fight of faith lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art called one timothy six twelve it must be remembered that salvation is certain not because the person believes that he has once believed in the past but because he now consciously believes if from his present experience and daily life he has reason to think that he is truly a believing christian then he has reason to expect that he will continue to be one cromwell according to the anecdote committed an error in inferring his good estate because he believed that he was once a believer footnote the passage in hebrews six four to six is hypothetical as is proved by verse nine we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation though we thus speak a supposition which is not an actual or even a possible case is sometimes made for the sake of illustrating or enforcing truth in one corinthians thirteen one to three paul supposes the existence of christian faith without that of christian charity in galatians one eight he supposes that an angel from heaven may preach another gospel than the true one in matthew thirteen twenty one and twenty two the stony ground hearer is not a true believer in two peter two twenty and twenty one the dog who returns to its own vomit is a false professor his knowing the way of righteousness is superficial knowledge like that of the stony ground hearer End footnote that sanctification is never lost is proved also by its connection with justification justification naturally tends to sanctification galatians five six faith worketh by love trust in christ's blood of atonement spontaneously impels to the resistance of sin and if there be no struggle against sin it is clear proof that there is no true trust in christ's sacrifice justification supplies the only efficient motive to obedience hence the obedience of the believer is called new obedience because of the new motive from which it springs viz the atoning love of the redeemer it is also denominated the obedience of christ two corinthians ten five gratitude to christ and love of him for the forgiveness that comes through his death are the springs of this evangelical obedience and sanctification the strongest inducement for a christian to obey the divine law is the fact that he has been graciously pardoned for having broken the law he follows after sanctification because he has received justification he obeys the law not in order to be forgiven but because he has been forgiven two corinthians five four the love of christ constraineth us not to live unto ourselves but unto him which died for us and the love meant is christ's redeeming love two corinthians seven one having these promises of forgiveness let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit because god has blotted out all his past sin the believer has the most encouraging of all motives to resist all future sin had god not pardoned the past it would be futile to struggle in future in two peter one four it is said that the exceeding great and precious promises are given to us in order that by these we might be partakers of a divine nature having escaped the corruption of the world through lust 
sanctification does not justify, but justification sanctifies. And there being this close connection between the two, sanctification can no more be wholly lost than justification can be. The necessary connection between sanctification and justification is taught by both Paul and James, between whose views there is a verbal but not a logical contradiction. Paul, in Romans 4, 4-13, assumes that saving faith is living faith and produces works, but he says nothing particularly upon this latter point. First, because his object is to contrast faith and works, and secondly, because the opponent with whom he was disputing did not claim to be justified by faith of any kind, true or false, but by works altogether. James, on the other hand, not only assumes that saving faith is living faith and produces works, but speaks particularly and emphatically upon this latter point, first because he is not contrasting faith and works, and secondly because he was contending with hypocrites who claimed that what they called faith alone and faith only, and what James calls dead faith, is a faith that would save the soul. Hooker remarks that justification is spoken of by St. Paul in the narrow sense as exclusive of sanctification, but by St. James in the wide sense as inclusive of it. Paul means justification without its fruits, James means sanctification with its fruits. The former speaks of faith simply, the latter of working faith. Paul describes faith as the antithesis of works, James describes faith as producing works. Footnote. The seeming contradiction between Paul and James disappears if James is understood to put, by metonymy, the effect for the cause, the work of faith for faith itself. When he says that Abraham was justified by works, James 2.21, and Rachel was justified by works, James 2.25, he means that they were justified by a faith that produced works, or a working faith. Abraham's work proved that his faith was genuine, and therefore might well stand for and represent it. It was a work of faith, 1 Thessalonians 1.3. Shed, Sermons to the Spiritual Man, Sermon 19. The Means of Grace the means of grace are means of sanctification. They suppose the existence of the principle of divine life in the soul, the outward and ordinary means whereby Christ communicates to his church the benefits of his mediation are all his ordinances, especially the word, sacraments, and prayer, all of which are made effectual to the elect for their salvation. Larger Catechism 154 The means of grace are administered within the visible church and to its members. Footnote when the world of unregenerate men are said to have the means of grace, the means of conviction under common grace, not of sanctification under special grace, are intended. The Spirit of God maketh the reading, but especially the preaching of the word, an effectual means of enlightening, convincing, and humbling sinners, of driving them out of themselves and drawing them unto Christ. Larger Catechism 155. End footnote. Consequently, church membership is requisite for obtaining the benefits of the means of grace and sanctification. Some of these benefits cannot be enjoyed at all outside of the visible church, those namely connected with the administration of the sacraments and the fellowship and watch of Christians, and none of them can be enjoyed in their fullness by one who has not separated himself from the world by confessing Christ before men. Footnote Respecting the nature of the church, Calvin presents the Protestant view in two fundamental positions. A. That the church may exist without a visible form, because it is both invisible and visible. The former is composed of all who are really united to Christ, the latter of all who profess to be united to Christ. The former has no false members, the latter has, as the parables of the tares and the net show. B that the visible form of the church is not distinguished by external splendor, but by the pure preaching of God's word and the legitimate administration of the sacraments. The Romanist contends that the church exists only in a visible form, and that this form is in the see of Rome and her order of prelates alone. Rome makes the invisible and visible churches identical and coterminous. For a concise and able statement of the prelatical theory of the church, see Jeremy Taylor's Consecration Sermon. End footnote. 1. Confession of faith and church fellowship is a means of sanctification. This is one of the ordinances of Christ, all of which, according to the Westminster Statement, are means of grace. Christ commands his disciples to confess him before men. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Compare Matthew 16, 16-18. 16 
the use of this means of spiritual growth is often enjoined in the epistles romans ten nine and ten hebrews ten twenty five man is a social being and his religious like his secular welfare depends upon association with others like-minded confession of faith and church membership promote sanctification a by personal sympathy b by the watch and discipline of fellow christians those who cherish a hope that they are believers yet make no public acknowledgment of their faith omit an important means of grace and hinder their own sanctification moreover such a neglect of an explicit ordinance of christ casts doubt upon the reality of the supposed faith there would be more ground for hope were this doubt removed by the confession of faith two the word of god is a means of grace and sanctification in two aspects of it a as law the purpose of this is to point out the duty which god requires of man as a subject of his government the effect of the word in this form upon the believer is to produce self-knowledge and humility the believer by the law is made acquainted with indwelling sin meekness and lowliness of heart are the effect of the word in this aspect of it he is kept poor in spirit b as gospel the purpose of this is to disclose the fullness of christ to meet this spiritual poverty preaching should combine the two in just proportions in order to the sanctification of believers the efficacy of the word is from the holy spirit applying it the spirit does not operate upon the truth but upon the soul john eighteen forty three and forty seven why do ye not understand my speech even because ye cannot hear my word he that is of god heareth god's word ye therefore hear them not because ye are not of god one corinthians two fourteen the natural man cannot know the things of the spirit because they are spiritually discerned in using the word the divine spirit works directly upon the soul and produces two effects a the understanding is enlightened and enabled to perceive the truth spiritually b the will is renewed and inclined towards it the aversion of the heart to truth is overcome some lutheran divines represent the holy spirit as operating upon the truth so that the truth becomes an efficient by means of this superadded quality or power the reformed theologians regard the holy spirit as the sole efficient and the truth as only an instrument three the sacraments are means of grace and sanctification in the classical meaning sacramentum was the oath of allegiance taken by the soldier it was also the money pledged by contending parties in a litigated case it implied obligation of some kind the classical is not the biblical or the ecclesiastical signification the latin fathers employed sacramentum as the equivalent of mysterion the sacrament was a mystery the vulgate translates mysterion in ephesians one nine three twenty three five thirty two by sacramentum but as a mystery is exhibited or explained by a symbol the sacramentum was also a symbolum calvin institutes four fourteen two in the biblical or ecclesiastical use a sacrament is a sign or a symbol of a christian mystery of the mystery of regeneration in the case of baptism of the mystery of vicarious atonement in the case of the lord's supper these two sacraments exhibit and certify by sensible emblems to the believing recipient these two mysterious facts in redemption the westminster larger catechism question 162 so defines a sacrament is a holy ordinance instituted to signify seal and exhibit to believers the benefits of christ's mediation to strengthen their faith to oblige them to obedience to cherish their love and communion one with another the following are the fundamental positions in the reformed theory of the sacraments a they are means of grace dependent like the other means upon the accompanying operation of the holy spirit and consequent faith in the soul of the recipient says calvin all the energy of operation belongs to the spirit and the sacraments are mere instruments which without his agency are vain and useless but with it are fraught with surprising efficacy the grace which is exhibited in or by the sacraments is not conferred by any power in them neither doth the efficacy of a sacrament depend upon the piety or intention of him that doth administer it but upon the work of the spirit westminster confession twenty seven three matthew three eleven i indeed baptize you with water but he shall baptize you with the holy ghost 1 Corinthians 12.13, by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. 1 Corinthians 11.28, let a man examine himself, and so let him eat. Romans 2.28, neither is that circumcision which is outward. 1 Peter 3.21, the antitype whereunto, 
namely baptism, doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. b. In the sacrament of the supper, the bread and wine are both symbols and memorials of Christ's body. They both emblematize and remind of a particular fact, namely Christ's atoning death. This is founded on Luke 22.19. This is, i.e. represents, footnote, the substantive verb in this passage has the same signification as in Galatians 4.24, these women are the two covenants. In footnote, my body, this do in remembrance of me. The first clause describes the sacrament as symbolic, the second is mnemonic. Our Lord Jesus instituted the sacrament called the Lord's Supper for the perpetual remembrance of the sacrifice of himself in his death and a commemoration of the one offering of himself upon the cross. Westminster Confession 29, 1 and 2. C. The act of truly partaking of the Lord's Supper is mental and spiritual, not physical and carnal. The Westminster Confession teaches that the worthy receiver spiritually receives and feeds upon Christ crucified, and denies that he carnally and corporally receives or feeds upon him. It also denies that the body and blood of Christ are corporally or carnally in, with, or under the bread and wine, and asserts that they are really but spiritually present to the faith of believers, as the elements themselves are to their outward senses. The points in this statement of most importance are, a. The believer, in worthily partaking of the Lord's Supper, consciously and confidently relies upon Christ's atoning sacrifice for the remission of his sins. This is meant by the phrase, feed upon Christ crucified. The allusion is to Christ's words in John 6, 53-56. Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. The flesh and blood of Christ signify the expiatory death of Christ. To drink Christ's blood is to trust in Christ's atonement in a vital manner and with a vivid feeling of its expiatory efficacy. The Lord's Supper can have no meaning if his vicarious sacrifice is denied. b. The presence of Christ is not in the bread or the wine, but in the soul of the participant. Christ, says the Westminster Confession, is present to the faith of believers, and faith is mental and spiritual. The statement of Hooker upon this point is explicit and excellent. The real presence of Christ's most blessed body and blood is not to be sought for in the sacrament, but in the worthy receiver of the sacrament. I see not which way it should be gathered by the words of Christ, when and where the bread is his body or the cup is blood, but only in the very heart and soul of him which receiveth them. As for the sacraments, they really exhibit, but for aught we can gather out of that which is written of them, they are not really, nor do they really contain in themselves that grace which with them or by them it pleaseth God to bestow. Again he remarks, No sigh denieth but that the soul of man is the receptacle of Christ's presence, whereby the question is driven to a narrower issue, nor doth anything rest doubtful but this, whether, when the sacrament is administered, Christ be whole, holy, within man only, or else his body and blood be also externally seated in the very consecrated elements themselves, which opinion they that defend are driven either to consubstantiate and incorporate Christ with elements sacramental, or to transubstantiate and change their substance into his, and so the one to hold him really but invisibly, moulded up with the substance of those elements, the other to hide him under the only visible show of bread and wine, the substance whereof, as they imagine, is abolished and is succeeded in the same room. With this statement of Hooker, Calvin agrees. They are exceedingly deceived who cannot conceive of any presence of the flesh of Christ in the supper except it be attached to the bread. For on this principle they leave nothing to the secret operation of the Spirit which unites us to Christ. They suppose Christ not to be present unless he descends to us, as though we cannot equally enjoy his presence if he elevates us to himself. The only question between us, therefore, respects the manner of this presence, because they place Christ in the bread, and we think it unlawful for us to bring him down from heaven. Let the reader judge on which side the truth lies. Only let us hear no more of that calumny, that Christ is excluded from the sacrament unless he be concealed under the bread. For, as this is a heavenly mystery, there is no necessity to bring Christ down to the earth in order to be united to us. Footnote 
the presence of christ in the bread and wine themselves would be a local and extended presence because bread and wine are local and extended substances but the presence of christ to the faith of a believer is a presence in his soul which is an illocal and spiritual presence because the soul is an illocal and spiritual substance End footnote. this view of hooker and calvin respecting the solely spiritual presence of christ in the supper was that of the founders of the english church and entered into their form of worship in the office for the communion of the sick in the episcopal prayer book it is said if a man by reason of extremity of sickness or any other just impediment do not receive the sacrament of christ's body and blood the minister shall instruct him that if he do truly repent of his sins and steadfastly believe that jesus christ hath suffered death upon the cross for him and shed his blood for his redemption earnestly remembering the benefits he hath thereby and giving him hearty thanks therefore he doth eat and drink the body and blood of our saviour christ profitably to his soul's health although he do not receive the sacrament with his mouth the romish theory of the sacraments is that they convey both regenerating and sanctifying grace by their own nature and efficiency by the mere external muscular performance ex opere operato of the rite of baptism or of the supper the effect is produced in the soul bellamine defines the theory thus the sacraments convey grace by the virtue of the sacramental action itself instituted by god for this end and not through the merit of either the agent or the receiver the lutheran doctrine of the sacrament of the supper teaches a that its efficacy is conditioned upon faith in the recipient in this it agrees with the reformed doctrine b that its efficacy is due to an intrinsic virtue resulting from the presence of christ's glorified body in and with the bread and wine this co-presence of christ's glorified body in the emblems makes the sacrament efficacious to the believer in this the lutheran differs from the calvinistic doctrine the latter finds the efficacy of the sacrament in the supper solely in the operation of the holy spirit in the heart of the believer the sacraments become effectual means of salvation not by any power in themselves but only by the working of the holy ghost westminster larger catechism 161 the lutheran asserts that christ is spiritually present in the sacrament of the supper as to the manner but corporeally present as to the substance that is to say the substance of christ's spiritual and glorified body as it now exists in heaven not of his material and unglorified body as it once existed on earth is actually present in and with the sacramental emblems consequently the spiritual and glorified body of christ is present in the bread and wine wherever and whenever the sacrament is administered this requires the ubiquity of christ's glorified body whereby it can simultaneously be in heaven and on earth but the glorified body of christ like that of his people though a spiritual body has form and is extended in space the description of christ's body after his resurrection and at his ascension proves this but one and the same form cannot occupy two or more spaces at one and the same moment christ's glorified body can pass from space to space instantaneously but cannot fill two spaces at the same instant when christ's body passed through the doors being shut john twenty twenty six and stood in the midst of the disciples his body was no longer on the outside of the doors and could not be hooker defines the lutheran the romish and the reformed views of the supper as follows there are but three expositions made of the words this is my body the first this is in itself before participation really and truly the natural substance of my body by reason of the coexistence which my omnipotent body hath with the sanctified element of bread which is the lutheran interpretation the second this is in itself and before participation the true and natural substance of my body by force of that deity which with the words of consecration abolisheth the substance of bread and substituteth in the place thereof my body which is the popish construction the third this hallowed food through concurrence of divine power is in verity and truth unto faithful receivers instrumentally a cause of that mystical participation whereby as i make myself wholly theirs so i give them in hand an actual possession of all such saving grace as my sacrificed body can yield and their souls do presently need this is to them and in them my body according to this statement of hooker which agrees with that of the reformed symbols there are but three generic theories of the sacraments the reformed the lutheran and the romish some would find a fourth theory represented by zwingli this comes from a misapprehension of the views of the swiss reformer the difference between zwingli and calvin upon sacramentarian points has been exaggerated 
zwingli has been represented as denying that the sacrament of the supper is a means of grace and that christ is present in it the following positions in his ratio fide disprove this he asserts that the sacraments are one res sancte et venerade two testimonium re geste prebunt three vice rerum sunt quas significant since they represent what cannot in itself be directly perceived four res arduas significant having value not for what they are materially but for what they signify as a bridal ring is not worth merely the gold of which it is made five they enlighten and instruct through the analogy between the symbol and the thing symbolized six they bring aid and comfort to faith seven they take the place of an oath these positions accord entirely with those in the first helvetic confession which contains calvin's view of the sacraments and also with those presented in the articles of the agreement between the churches of zurich and geneva hagenbach asserts that zwingli taught that the sacrament is both a symbol and a means of strengthening faith sigvart and zeller in their monographs upon zwingli take the same view the writer of the article lord's supper in kitto's encyclopedia represents Zwingli as holding that the Lord's Supper, by presenting under sensible emblems the sufferings and death of Christ, and bringing them to vivid remembrance, deepens penitence, stimulates faith, calls out love, and in this way is a means of sanctification equally with hearing the word, or any other means of grace employed by the Holy Spirit. Zwingli asserted as strongly as Calvin the spiritual presence of Christ in the sacrament, denying with him the carnal and corporeal presence either in the form of transubstantiation or consubstantiation. Christ, he says, is spiritually present in the consciousness of the believer. In the recollection of his sufferings and death, and by faith in these, his body is spiritually eaten. We trust in the dying flesh and blood of Christ, and this faith is called the eating of the body and blood of Christ. Expositio fide compare expositio fide four sixty three and sixty four editor niemeyer the corporeal presence of christ he denied appealing to the authority of augustine as follows augustinus dixit christi corpus in aliquo coeli loco esse oportere propter visi corporis modum non est digitur christi corpus magis in pluribis locisquam nostra corpora Expositio Fide, 4.51. Editor Niemeyer. Zwingli regarded the sacrament of the supper as a means of grace and sanctification because of its didactic character, because, by evidently setting forth before the eyes Jesus Christ crucified, Galatians 3.1, it teaches in a vivid and special manner the great truth of Christ's atonement and redemption and confirms the soul of the believer in it. It is an object lesson. In this respect, the function of the sacrament is like that of the word, gospel truth is taught by both alike both alike are employed by the holy spirit in enlightening strengthening and comforting the mind of the believer this feature in zwingli's view is sometimes cited to prove a radical difference between him and calvin but calvin is even more explicit and positive on this point the office of the sacraments he says is precisely the same as that of the word of god which is to offer and present christ to us and in him the treasures of heavenly grace but they confer no advantage or profit without being received by faith it is necessary to guard against being drawn into error from reading the extravagant language used by the fathers with a view to exalt the dignity of the sacraments lest we should suppose there is some secret power annexed and attached to the sacraments so that they communicate the grace of the holy spirit just as wine is given in the cup whereas the only office assigned to them is to testify and confirm his benevolence towards us nor do they impart any benefit unless they are accompanied by the Holy Spirit, to open our minds and hearts, and render us capable of receiving this testimony. For the sacraments fulfill in us, on the part of God, the same office as messengers of joyful intelligence, or earnests for the confirmation of covenants, on the part of men. God nourishes our faith in a spiritual manner by the sacraments, which are instituted for the purpose of placing His promises before our eyes, for our contemplation, and of serving as pledges of them. For this reason Augustine calls a sacrament a visible word because it represents the promises of God portrayed as in a picture and places before our eyes an image of them. Connected with the preaching of the gospel, another assistance and support of our faith is afforded us in the sacraments. There is no true administration of the sacrament without the word, for whatever advantage accrues to us from the sacred supper requires the word. 
whether we are to be confirmed in the faith exercised in confession or excited to duty there is no need of preaching nothing more preposterous therefore can be done with respect to the supper than to convert it into a mute action as we have seen it done under the tyranny of the pope a person who supposes that the sacraments confer any more upon him than that which is offered by the word of god and which he receives by a true faith is greatly deceived hence also it may be concluded that confidence of salvation does not depend on the participation of the sacrament as though that constituted our justification which we know to be placed in jesus christ alone and is to be communicated to us no less by the preaching of the word than by the sealing of the sacraments and that it may be completely enjoyed without this participation this view of the nature of the sacrament of the supper as didactic is also confirmed by considering the nature and purpose of a symbol the purpose of a symbol is to teach a certain truth by a visible sign or token the ocean is a symbol of god's immensity and the sun of his glory the invisible things or truths relating to god are emblematized and impressed by the things that are made romans one twenty the heavens are a symbol of god because they declare the glory of god psalm nineteen one the cross is a symbol in all christendom of the sacrifice of christ it teaches emblematically the truth that the son of god died for man's sin the ark again is a symbol of the church and teaches that men are safe within the kingdom of god in the case of all these natural symbols there is no efficacy in the symbol as such but only in the truth taught by it the ocean the sun the cross the ark make no spiritual impression as mere water light and wood it is only the immensity and glory of god as taught by the symbols of the ocean and the sun that affect the mind it is only the mercy of god as suggested by the symbol of the cross and the ark that produces the spiritual effect the bread and wine of the lord's supper are specially and divinely appointed symbols differing in this respect from all natural symbols they are also seals as well as symbols differing in this respect also from natural symbols but as symbols they are didactic and teach that truth which is the heart of the christian religion namely that the broken and bleeding body of christ is the oblation for sin footnote the lord's supper took the place of the jewish passover christ our passover is sacrificed for us one corinthians five seven the passover was a divinely appointed symbol reminding of and setting forth the deliverance of the firstborn by the sprinkling of blood but the paschal lamb was also typical of the lamb of god so that the visible emblem in the instance both of the passover and the supper teaches the expiation of sin by christ's vicarious sacrifice End footnote. they are holy signs and seals of the covenant of grace immediately instituted by god to represent christ and his benefits and to confirm our interest in him westminster confession twenty eight one but in this instance too as in that of natural symbols it is the truth taught by the symbols and not the symbols themselves that strengthens the faith of the participant deepens his gratitude enlivens his hope and sanctifies his heart as mere bread and wine the symbols produce no spiritual effect in the soul of the believer when the holy spirit enlightens the mind of the participant to perceive the gospel truth which these emblems exhibit signify and seal then and only then do they become means of sanctification it is not because the glorified body of christ is conjoined with them as the lutheran asserts or because they are converted into the glorified body of christ as the romanist asserts that they are effectual it is because of the spiritual presence of christ in the soul of the participant and the spiritual perception of the truth signified and sealed by the emblem as calvin and hooker say that they are means of grace the sacrament of baptism is the sign and seal of regeneration it is emblematic and didactic of this doctrine baptism is not a means of regeneration as the lord's supper is of sanctification it does not confer the holy spirit as a regenerating spirit but is the authentic token that the holy spirit has been or will be conferred that regeneration has been or will be effected this is taught in romans four eleven abraham received the sign of circumcision a seal of the faith which he had being yet uncircumcised baptism is christian circumcision the circumcision of christ colossians two eleven and takes the place of the jewish circumcision so that what is true of the latter is of the former paul cornelius and the eunuch were regenerated before they were baptized as circumcision was not absolutely necessary to salvation neither is baptism this is shown by the omission of it in mark sixteen sixteen when damnation is spoken of baptism being the initiatory sacrament is administered only once while symbolical only of regeneration it yet has a connection with sanctification 
being a divinely appointed sign seal and pledge of the new birth it promotes the believer's growth in holiness by encouragement and stimulus it is like the official seal on a legal document the presence of the seal inspires confidence in the genuineness of the title deed the absence of the seal awakens doubts and fears nevertheless it is the title deed not the seal that conveys the title baptism is to be administered to believers and their children footnote proselyte baptism included the whole family males and females adults and infants it was associated also with the circumcision of the males some time before the advent the whole nation of the Edomians embraced judaism rather than be expelled from their country josephus says that helena queen of adiatum and her son became proselytes on this subject see maimonides wall history of baptism lightfoot hammond on baptism End footnote acts two thirty eight and thirty nine the promise of the gift of the holy ghost verse thirty eight is unto you and your children romans eleven sixteen if the root be holy so are the branches one corinthians seven fourteen the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband else were your children unclean but now are they holy matthew twenty eight nineteen go teach disciple all nations baptizing them if the command had been go teach all nations circumcising them no one would have denied that infants were included in the command infants are called disciples in acts fifteen ten why tempt ye god to put a yoke namely circumcision upon the neck of the disciples accordingly the westminster confession affirms that the infants of one or both believing parents are to be baptized the baptism of the infant of a believer supposes the actual or prospective operation of the regenerating spirit in order to the efficacy of the rite. Infant baptism does not confer the regenerating spirit, but is a sign that he either has been or will be conferred in accordance with the divine promise in the covenant of grace. The actual conferring of the Holy Spirit may be prior to baptism, or in the act itself, or subsequent to it hence baptism is the sign and seal of regeneration either in the past in the present or in the future the westminster confession teaches that the efficacy of baptism is not tied to that moment of time wherein it is administered in other words the regenerating grace of the spirit signified and sealed by the rite may be imparted when the infant is baptized or previously or at a future time the baptism is administered in this reference and with this expectation baptism is to be administered to be a sign and seal of regeneration and engrafting into christ and that even to infants larger catechism 177 under the old dispensation the circumcision of the flesh was a sign and seal of the circumcision of the heart deuteronomy 10 16 36 god says calvin did not favor infants with circumcision without making them partakers of all those things which were then signified by circumcision similarly under the new dispensation the baptism of the body of the infant is the sign and seal of the baptism of the soul by the holy ghost the infant of the believer receives the holy spirit as a regenerating spirit by virtue of the covenant between god and his people genesis seventeen seven i will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a god unto thee and to thy seed after thee acts two thirty nine the promise of the gift of the holy spirit verse thirty eight is unto you and your children the infant of the believer consequently obtains the regenerating grace by virtue of his birth and descent from a believer in covenant with god and not by virtue of his baptism god has promised the blessing of the holy spirit to those who are born of his people the infant of a believer by this promise is born into the church as the infant of a citizen is born into the state children born within the pale of the visible church and dedicated to god in baptism are under the inspection and government of the church directory for worship nine they are church members by reason of their birth from believing parents and it has been truly said that the question that confronts them at the period of discretion is not will you join the visible church but will you go out of it church membership by birth from believers is an appointment of god under both the old and the new economies in the jewish and the christian church baptism is the infallible sign of regeneration when the infant dies in infancy all baptized infants dying before the age of self-consciousness are regenerated without exception baptism is the probable sign of regeneration when the infant lives to years of discretion it is possible that the baptized child of believing parents may prove in the day of judgment not to have been regenerated but not probable 
the history of the church and daily observation show it to be the general fact that infant church members become adult church members yet exceptions are possible a baptized infant on reaching years of discretion may to human view appear not to have been regenerated as a baptized convert may the fact of unregeneracy however must be proved before it can be acted upon a citizen of the state must be presumed to be such until the contrary appears by his renunciation of citizenship and self-expatriation until he takes this course he must be regarded as a citizen so a baptized child in adult years may renounce his baptism and church membership become an infidel and join the synagogue of satan but until he does this he must be regarded as a member of the church of christ such instances are exceedingly rare both in church and state the possible exceptions to the general fact that baptism is the sign of regeneration are not more numerous in the case of baptized infants than of baptized converts says hodge it is not every baptized child who is saved nor are all those who are baptized in infancy made partakers of salvation but baptism signs seals and actually conveys its benefits to all its subjects whether infants or adults who keep the covenant of which it is a sign it does not follow that the benefits of redemption may not be conferred on infants at the time of their baptism that is in the hands of god what is to hinder the imputation to them of the righteousness of christ or their receiving the renewing of the holy ghost so that their whole nature may be developed in a state of reconciliation with god doubtless this often occurs but whether it does or not their baptism stands good it assures them of salvation if they do not renounce their baptismal covenant the reason why there is not an infallible connection between infant baptism and regeneration when the infant lives to years of discretion so that all baptized children of true believers are regenerated without a single exception is the fact that the covenant is not observed on the human side with absolute perfection should the believer keep the promise on his part with entire completeness god would be bound to fulfil the promise on his part but the believer's fulfilment of the terms of the covenant in respect to faith in god's promise to prayer to the nurture and education of the child though filial and spiritual is yet imperfect god is therefore not absolutely indebted to the believer by reason of the believer's action in respect to the regeneration of the child consequently he may exercise a sovereignty if he so please in the bestowment of regenerating grace even in the case of a believer's child we have seen that the regeneration of an unbaptized adult depending as it does upon election cannot be made infallibly certain by the use of common grace though it may be made highly probable by it in like manner the regeneration of a baptized child depending also upon election may be made highly probable by the imperfect faith and fidelity of the parents yet not infallibly and necessarily certain the mode of baptism which is by far the most common in the history of the christian church is sprinkling or pouring from the time of christ to the present a vastly greater number have been sprinkled than have been immersed at the present day sprinkling is the rule throughout christendom and immersion the exception the former mode is catholic the latter is denominational sprinkling was the common mode of baptism in the old testament and this fact furnishes the strongest presumption that it was the mode of christ and his apostles as the apostolic polity confessedly grew out of the jewish synagogue it is equally certain that the apostolic ceremonial and ritual grew out of the jewish polity and ritual are indissolubly associated baptizing under the old economy was an important rite and would certainly influence the mode under the new the old testament baptism therefore is of the utmost consequence in settling the dispute respecting the mode of baptism and its subjects the following particulars are to be noted one sacramental baptism by the levitical priest was always administered by sprinkling never by immersion a the whole congregation at sinai were baptized by sprinkling exodus twenty four six to eight hebrews nine nineteen and twenty b the levites when consecrating to office were baptized by sprinkling numbers eight seven thus shalt thou do unto them to cleanse them sprinkle water of purifying upon them c lepers and defiled persons when restored to the congregation were baptized by sprinkling leviticus fourteen four to seven forty nine to fifty three numbers nineteen eighteen and nineteen thirty one nineteen twenty two and twenty three luke five fourteen d gentiles when admitted to the jewish church were baptized by sprinkling numbers thirty one twelve and nineteen these baptisms could be performed only by a priest or by some clean person appointed to act for him 
numbers nineteen eighteen and nineteen a clean person shall sprinkle water upon the unclean the baptism in these instances was sacramental i e had reference to guilt and expiatory cleansing hence the blood of a sacrificial victim was sprinkled upon the congregation at sinai and upon the levites and restored lepers no individual could baptize himself with this sacramental and expiatory baptism it was a priestly act and required the priest or his appointed agent two baptism by jehovah in both the old economy and the new is by sprinkling or pouring the jehovah of the old testament is the christ of the new and is the great high priest he baptizes with the holy spirit matthew three eleven he shall baptize you with the holy spirit and with fire this baptism is never by immersion isaiah fifty two fifteen he shall sprinkle many nations ezekiel thirty six twenty five then will i sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean and new heart will i give you hebrews ten twenty two let us draw near to god having our hearts sprinkled erantis menu from an evil conscience hebrews twelve twenty four the blood of sprinkling rantis mu that speaketh better things than the blood of abel one peter one two elect unto sprinkling of the blood of jesus christ isaiah thirty two fifteen until the spirit be poured upon us from on high joel two twenty eight proverbs one twenty three i will pour out my spirit unto you three ceremonial baptisms or washings were administered by sprinkling or pouring not by immersion these baptisms had reference not to the guilt of sin but its pollution sometimes they were administered by the person himself and sometimes by the priest when a man ceremonially washed his hands this was called a baptism luke eleven thirty eight when the pharisee saw it he marvelled that he had not first washed evaptiste before dinner mark seven four when they come from the market except they wash baptize vaptisonte codex alexandrinus codex claromontanus codex augiensis receive text tischendorf are sprinkled rantisonte codex sinaiticus codex vaticanus codex ephraimi lachman hort they eat not and many other things there be which they have received to hold as the washings vaptismus of cups pots and brazen vessels and of tables the ceremonial baptism of the hands was performed by having a servant pour water upon them and the ceremonial baptism of cups pots vessels and tables was by sprinkling or pouring as in numbers nineteen eighteen a clean person shall sprinkle water upon the tent and upon all the vessels of the unclean person footnote whether the baptism of naaman two kings five ten and fourteen was sacramental or ceremonial is doubtful if it was sacramental like that of the restored leper under the levitical economy it was performed by a priest or his deputy and was administered by sprinkling this is the view of baird bible history of baptism page one hundred and fifty seven he explains the command go wash two kings five ten by acts twenty two sixteen ananias said to saul rise baptize thyself vaptise and wash away thy sins here the baptism is described as self-administered as it is in naaman's case though really administered by another if on the other hand naaman's baptism was ceremonial like the ceremonial washing of the blind man in the pool of siloam john nine seven it was by pouring in footnote now since sprinkling or pouring was the invariable mode of baptism under the old economy it is probable in the very highest degree that john the baptist employed this mode baptism was a priestly act as is implied in the inquiry why baptizest thou if thou be not the christ nor elijah nor that prophet john one twenty five john was a priest of the family of aaron luke one five and naturally administered the rite by sprinkling or pouring as the jewish priest had administered it from time immemorial there is not a scintilla of proof that he introduced immersion and this same mode would naturally be adopted by the apostles when our lord substituted baptism for circumcision and transferred the rite from the old dispensation to the new from the jewish to the christian church peter associates preaching peace by jesus christ with the baptism which john preached acts ten thirty six and thirty seven the principal supports of the mode by immersion are a the custom in the patristic church of immersing in the lava of the baptistry and b the classical meaning of vapto and baptizo 
concerning the first argument it is to be noticed first that the baptistry dates from a period when christianity had become powerful and able to erect churches with all the appointments of an imposing ritual the apostolic church could not do this the baptistry and lava are as late as the fourth century furthermore the first baptismal fonts were too small for immersing the fresco in the catacombs of st calixtus two hundred a d according to rossi represents the rite administered by pouring from the vessel upon the person standing upright the teachings of the apostles a d one sixty says that baptism may be performed by pouring secondly a more profuse application of water than that of sprinkling or pouring belongs to a period in the history of the church when baptism was held to be regeneration itself if water be efficacious when applied by the officiating minister then immersion would be deemed more efficacious than sprinkling immersion grew with the growth of the sacramentarian theory of baptism and the doctrine of baptismal regeneration respecting the classical meaning of vapto and baptizo it is to be observed that these words had no technical or ritual signification in classical greek they were never used to denote a pagan rite they were purifying rites in the greek and roman worship but they were not called baptisms the greeks denominated their purifying rite catharsis and the romans theirs lustratio sprinkling was the mode in both the nouns baptismos baptisma and baptistes are not in the classical vocabulary they were coined by jews and christians from baptizo in order to denote the rite of purification in the jewish and christian churches consequently it is the secondary technical use in the jewish and christian scriptures not the primary untechnical meaning in the greek classics which must be considered in determining the mode of baptism footnote in the later time of the roman empire when public baths were erected the bathing tub or labrum was called baptisterium the term was probably borrowed from the christian usage but the labrum was not large enough to immerse the whole body water was taken from it and poured upon the head of the person standing in it or beside it anthon's dictionary of antiquities article baths page one hundred and forty eight end footnote the classical meaning of vapto and vaptizo is to dip into water to sink under water to dye or tinge in a fluid the classical meaning would favor baptism by immersion as the classical meaning of sacramentum would prove that the christian sacrament is an oath but in hebraistic and new testament greek vapto and vaptizo are employed in a secondary ceremonial signification to denote a jewish and christian rite consequently their meaning in the septuagint and new testament must be determined by their ritual and historical use not by their classical the word pagans bagani etymologically and classically denoted persons living in the villages pagi outside of the large towns and cities classically pagans were villagers as christianity spread first among the inhabitants of the cities the villagers were the unevangelized and thus pagan came to mean heathen instead of villager similarly vapto and vaptizo which in heathenism denoted any unceremonial non-ritual immersion into water when adopted by judaism and christianity came to have the secondary signification of a ceremonial sprinkling or effusion of water and he who argues that baptism means immersion in the scriptures because in the classics the primary meaning of vapto and vaptizo is to immerse commits the same error with him who should argue that a pagan is a villager because this was the original signification of paganus or that the christian sacramentum is an oath and not a symbol because this is its meaning in livy and tacitus the word baptizo is employed in the septuagint to signify a ritual purification performed by applying water to a person or thing so as to wet it more or less but not all over and entirely footnote an example of the application of the term baptize to a wetting of the person that is not immersion is found in daniel four thirty three nebuchadnezzar's body was wet evaphe with the dew of heaven another is found in judith twelve seven judith washed herself evaptizeto in a fountain of water by the camp that this was not an immersion is highly certain because the fountain would be used for drinking and culinary purposes and though the washing was in the night yet in a camp there would be nearly as little privacy by night as by day End footnote. the passages that have been quoted prove indisputably that the mode in which the baptismal water of ritual purification was applied under the levitical law was sprinkling or pouring 
There was no immersion of the body in the sacramental baptism for guilt or in the ceremonial baptism for pollution, and the spiritual baptism of the Holy Ghost was pouring, not immersion. There is no good reason for supposing that the New Testament use of baptizo is different from that of the Septuagint. Historically, there is the highest probability that John the Baptist and Christ's apostles employed the old mode and did not invent a new one like immersion, so different from the mode in both Jewish and Gentile lustrations. Furthermore, the circumstances and customs of the Jews necessitated sprinkling or effusion. It is morally certain that such baptisms as those of Pentecost, Acts 2.41, of the eunuch, Acts 8.36, of Cornelius and his family, Acts 10.47, and of the jailer, Acts 16.33, were not administered by immersion. In the narrative of the baptism of the eunuch, it is said that the way that goeth down from Jerusalem to Gaza is desert, Acts 8.26. The whole region is sandy and dry, with only here and there a small spring of water. In the account of the baptism of Cornelius and all his house, Acts 10.2, the phraseology implies that the baptismal water was brought into the room. Can anyone forbid the water, to udor, that these should not be baptized, Acts 10.47? This phraseology would be unnatural if the water in question were in a river, pond, or reservoir, but natural if it were in a vessel. No one would forbid the Hudson or Connecticut River. It is improbable that within the precincts of the jail there was either a stream or reservoir of water sufficient for immersing in the dead of night the jailer and all his. The immersion of three thousand in Jerusalem on one day at Pentecost, Acts 2.41, would have required the use of the public reservoirs of the city, which the Jewish authorities would have been as little likely to have allowed as the Common Council of New York City would in a similar case. Christ certainly had reference to the Old Testament baptism and to John's baptism when he said to Nicodemus, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. John 3 5. Christian baptism in the name of the Trinity had not yet been instituted. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, and our Lord wished to rid him of all self righteousness by telling him that he must confess sin with publicans and sinners and submit to the old and common Jewish rite that was emblematic of forgiveness and cleansing. Though he was a ruler of the Jews and a master of Israel, he must take the same attitude with the multitude who were baptized in Jordan, confessing their sins. Matthew 3, 5. All the people that heard John and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John, but the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. Luke seven twenty nine and 30. This is our Lord's account of John's baptism, and of the state of mind in those who submitted to it, and those who rejected it. John's baptism was like that of Peter on the day of Pentecost, a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, Luke 3.3, 3, Acts 2.38, 19.4. And the remission in both cases alike was through Christ, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world, John 1.29. John directed his disciples to Christ exactly as the apostles did theirs. John, looking upon Jesus as he walked, saith, Behold the Lamb of God. John 1.36 Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him who should come after him, that is, on Jesus Christ. Acts 19.4 The apostles were baptized with John's baptism and were not rebaptized by Christ. Apollos knew only the baptism of John, Acts 18.25, and was not rebaptized. Footnote. There is an apparent exception to this in Acts 19.5. Bengal's explanation is that these persons had not known that they were bound by the baptism of repentance to faith in Jesus Christ. John's baptism had not been administered to them with an intelligent understanding on their part of the meaning of the rite. Had it been, they would not have been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Says Bengal, on Acts 19.5, the baptism which is mentioned in Matthew 3.6 and Matthew 28.19 was one, otherwise there would not have been the beginning of the gospel in John the Baptist, Mark 1.1-3, 1, 1 and the Lord's Supper in Matthew 26 would be older than baptism in Matthew 28. End footnote. Immersion has been supported by the equivocal rendering of the verb sunthapto, in Romans 6.4, Colossians 2.12. In Romans 6.4, the rendering is buried by baptism. In Colossians 2.12, buried in baptism. 
the english word bury is applicable either to burial in earth or in water but the greek word synapto is applicable only to burial in earth no one would render it by immerse the english word bury can suggest immersion but the greek cannot consequently when a person unacquainted with the original reads in the english version of a burial in baptism or by baptism a burial in water is the only idea that enters his mind an idea which the greek positively excludes for when a dead body is buried in a tomb as our lord was it comes into no contact with water and is carefully protected from it had synthapto been translated literally by entombed instead of buried this text never would have been quoted, as it so frequently has been, to prove that Christian baptism is immersion. Christ's entombment, or burial in Joseph's sepulchre, has not the slightest connection with his baptism at the Jordan, and throws no light upon the mode in which he was baptized, and consequently it throws no light upon the mode in which his disciples were. Matthew Henry, on Romans 6.4, remarks as follows, Why this burying in baptism should so much as allude to any custom of dipping under water in baptism, any more than our baptismal crucifixion and death should have any such reference, I confess I cannot see. It is plain that it is not the sign but the thing signified in baptism that the apostle here calls being buried with Christ, and the expression of burying alludes to Christ's burial in a tomb. As Christ was buried in a tomb, that he might rise again to a new and more heavenly life, so are we in baptism buried in a tomb that is cut off from the life of sin, that we may rise again to a new life of faith and love. End of Dogmatic Theology, Soteriology by William G. T. Shedd If you enjoyed this recording, please support our channel by subscribing, liking and sharing our content. We would also be happy to receive any comments or feedback below.